Polynesian Mythology by George Gray Preface Towards the close of the year 1845 I was suddenly and unexpectedly required by the British government to administer the affairs of New Zealand, and shortly afterwards received the appointment of Governor-in-Chief of those islands. When I arrived in them, I found Her Majesty's native subjects engaged in hostilities with the Queen's troops, against whom they had up to that time contended with considerable success. So much discontent also prevailed generally amongst the native population, that where disturbances had not yet taken place, there was too much reason to apprehend they would soon break out, as they shortly afterwards did. In several parts of the islands, I soon perceived that I could neither successfully govern, nor hope to conciliate, a numerous and turbulent people, with whose language, manners, customs, religion, and modes of thought I was quite unacquainted. In order to redress their grievances, and apply remedies which would neither wound their feelings nor militate against their prejudices, it was necessary that I should be able thoroughly to understand their complaints. And to win their confidence and regard it was also requisite that I should be able at all times and in all places patiently to listen to the tales of their wrongs or sufferings, and, even if I could not assist them, to give them a kind reply. Couched in such terms as should leave no doubt on their minds that I clearly understood and felt for them, and was really well disposed towards them. Although furnished with some very able interpreters, who gave me assistance of the most friendly nature, I soon found that even with their aid I could still only very imperfectly perform my duties. I could not at all times and in all places have an interpreter by my side. And thence often when waylaid by some suitor, who had perhaps travelled two or three hundred miles to lay before me the tale of his or her grievances, I was compelled to pass on without listening. And to witness with pain an expression of sorrow and keenly disappointed hope cloud over features which the moment before were bright with gladness, that the opportunity so anxiously looked for had at length been secured. Again, I found that any tale of sorrow or suffering, passing through the medium of an interpreter, fell much more coldly on my ear than what it would have done had the person interested addressed the tale direct to myself. And in like manner an answer delivered through the intervention of a third person appeared to leave a very different impression upon the suitor from what it would have had coming direct from the lips of the governor of the country. Moreover, this mode of communication through a third person was so cumbrous and slow that, in order to compensate for the loss of time thus occasioned, it became necessary for the interpreters to compress the substance of the representations made to me, as also of my own replies, into the fewest words possible. And, as this had in each instance to be done hurriedly and at the moment, there was reason to fear that much that was material to enable me fully to understand the question brought before me, or the suitor to comprehend my reply, might be unintentionally omitted. Lastly, I had on several occasions reasons to believe that a native hesitated to state facts or to express feelings and wishes to an interpreter, which he would most gladly have done to the governor, could he have addressed him direct. These reasons, and others of equal force, made me feel it to be my duty to make myself acquainted, with the least possible delay, with the language of the New Zealanders, as also with their manners, customs, and prejudices. But I soon found that this was a far more difficult matter than I had at first supposed. The language of the New Zealanders is a very difficult one to understand thoroughly, there was then no dictionary of it published, unless a vocabulary can be so called. There were no books published in the language which would enable me to study its construction, it varied altogether in form from any of the ancient or modern languages which I knew. And my thoughts and time were so occupied with the cares of the government of a country then pressed upon by many difficulties, and with a formidable rebellion raging in it, that I could find but very few hours to devote to the acquisition of an unwritten and difficult language. I, however, did my best, and cheerfully devoted all my spare moments to a task, the accomplishment of which was necessary to enable me to perform properly every duty to my country and to the people I was appointed to govern. Soon, however, a new and quite unexpected difficulty presented itself. On the side of the rebel party were engaged, either openly or covertly, some of the oldest, least civilized, and most influential chiefs in the islands. With them I had, either personally or by written communications, to discuss questions which involved peace or war, and on which the whole future of the islands and of the native race depended. 
so that it was in the highest degree essential that I should fully and entirely comprehend their thoughts and intentions, and that they should not in any way misunderstand the nature of the engagements into which I entered with them. To my surprise, however, I found that these chiefs, either in their speeches to me or in their letters, frequently quoted, in explanation of their views and intentions, fragments of ancient poems or proverbs, or made allusions which rested on an ancient system of mythology. And, although it was clear that the most important parts of their communications were embodied in these figurative forms, the interpreters were quite at fault, they could then rarely, if ever, translate the poems or explain the allusions. And there was no publication in existence which threw any light upon these subjects, or which gave the meaning of the great mass of the words which the natives upon such occasions made use of. So that I was compelled to content myself with a short general statement of what some other native believed that the writer of the letter intended to convey as his meaning by the fragment of the poem he had quoted or by the allusions he had made. I should add that even the great majority of the young Christian natives were quite as much at fault on these subjects as were the European interpreters. Clearly, however, I could not, as governor of the country, permit so close a veil to remain drawn between myself and the aged and influential chiefs whom it was my duty to attach to British interests and to the British race. Whose regard and confidence, as also that of their tribes, it was my desire to secure, and with whom it was necessary that I should hold the most unrestricted intercourse. Only one thing could under such circumstances be done, and that was to acquaint myself with the ancient language of the country, to collect its traditional poems and legends, to induce their priests to impart to me their mythology, and to study their proverbs. For more than eight years I devoted a great part of my available time to these pursuits. Indeed, I worked at this duty in my spare moments in every part of the country I traversed and during my many voyages from portion to portion of the islands. I was also always accompanied by natives, and still at every possible interval pursued my inquiries into these subjects. Once, when I had with great pains amassed a large mass of materials to aid me in my studies, the government house was destroyed by fire, and with it were burnt the materials I had so collected. And thus I was left to commence again my difficult and wearying task. The ultimate result, however, was, that I acquired a great amount of information on these subjects, and collected a large mass of materials, which was, however, from the manner in which they were acquired. In a very scattered state for different portions of the same poem or legend were often collected from different natives, in very distant parts of the country. Long intervals of time, also, frequently elapsed after I had obtained one part of a poem or legend, before I could find a native accurately acquainted with another portion of it. Consequently the fragments thus obtained were scattered through different notebooks, and, before they could be given to the public, required to be carefully arranged and rewritten, and what was still more difficult, whether viewed in reference to the real difficulty of fairly translating the ancient language in which they were composed, or my many public duties, it was necessary that they should be translated. Having, however, with much toil acquired information which I found so useful to myself, I felt unwilling that the result of my labours should be lost to those whose duty it may be hereafter to deal with the natives of New Zealand. And I therefore undertook a new task, which I have often, very often, been sorely tempted to abandon. But the same sense of duty which made me originally enter upon the study of the native language has enabled me to persevere up to the present period, when I have already published one large volume in the native language. Containing a very extensive collection of the ancient traditional poems, religious chants, and songs, of the Maori race. And I now present to the European reader a translation of the principal portions of their ancient mythology and of some of their most interesting legends. Another reason that has made me anxious to impart to the public the most material portions of the information I have thus attained is that, probably, to no other person but myself would many of their ancient rhythmical prayers and traditions have been imparted by their priests. And it is less likely that anyone could now acquire them, as I regret to say that most of their old chiefs and even some of the middle-aged ones who aided me in my researches, have already passed to the tomb. With regard to the style of the translation a few words are required, I fear in point of care and language it will not satisfy the critical reader, but I can truly say that I have had no leisure carefully to revise it. The translation is also faithful, 
and it is almost impossible closely and faithfully to translate a very difficult language without almost insensibly falling somewhat into the idiom and form of construction of that language, which, perhaps, from its unusualness may prove unpleasant to the European ear and mind, and this must be essentially the case in a work like the present, no considerable continuous portion of the original whereof was derived from one person, but which is compiled from the written or orally delivered narratives of many, each differing from the others in style, and some even materially from the rest in dialect. I have said that the translation is close and faithful, it is so to the full extent of my powers and from the little time I have had at my disposal. I have done no more than add in some places such few explanatory words as were necessary to enable a person unacquainted with the productions, customs, or religion of the country, to understand what the narrator meant. For the first time, I believe, a European reader will find it in his power to place himself in the position of one who listens to a heathen and savage high priest, explaining to him, in his own words and in his own energetic manner, the traditions in which he earnestly believes, and unfolding the religious opinions upon which the faith and hopes of his race rest. That their traditions are puerile is true, that the religious faith of the races who trust in them is absurd is a melancholy fact. But all my experience leads me to believe that the Saxon, Celtic, and Scandinavian systems of mythology, could we have become intimately acquainted with them, would be found in no respects to surpass that one which the European reader may now thoroughly understand. I believe that the ignorance which has prevailed regarding the mythological systems of barbarous or semi-barbarous races has too generally led to their being considered far grander and more reasonable than they really were. But the puerility of these traditions and barbarous mythological systems by no means diminishes their importance as regards their influence upon the human race. Those contained in the present volume have, with slight modifications, prevailed perhaps considerably more than two thousand years throughout the great mass of the islands of the Pacific Ocean. And, indeed, the religious system of ancient Mexico was, probably, to some extent connected with them. They have been believed in and obeyed by many millions of the human race. And it is still more melancholy to reflect that they were based upon a system of human sacrifices to the gods. So that, if we allow them to have existed for two thousand years, and that, in accordance with the rites which are based upon them, at least two thousand human victims were annually sacrificed throughout the whole extent of the numerous islands in which they prevailed, both of which suppositions are probably much within the truth. Then at least four millions of human beings have been offered in sacrifice to false gods. And to this number we should have to add a frightful list of children murdered under the system of infanticide, which the same traditions encouraged, as also a very large number of persons. Destroyed for having been believed guilty of the crime of sorcery or witchcraft. It must further be borne in mind that the native races who believed in these traditions or superstitions are in no way deficient in intellect, and in no respect incapable of receiving the truths of Christianity. On the contrary, they readily embrace its doctrines and submit to its rules. In our schools they stand a fair comparison with Europeans, and, when instructed in Christian truths, blush at their own former ignorance and superstitions, and look back with shame and loathing upon their previous state of wickedness and credulity. And yet for a great part of their lives have they, and for thousands of years before they were born have their forefathers, implicitly submitted themselves to those very superstitions, and followed those cruel and barbarous rites. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit CompleteAudiobooks.com for more quality content. Children of Heaven and Earth K.O.N.G.A. Tama A Rangy Tradition Relating to the Origin of the Human Race Men had but one pair of primitive ancestors, they sprang from the vast heaven that exists above us, and from the earth which lies beneath us. According to the traditions of our race, Rengi and Papa, or Heaven and Earth, were the source from which, in the beginning, all things originated. Darkness then rested upon the heaven and upon the earth, and they still both clave together, for they had not yet been rent apart. 
And the children they had begotten were ever thinking amongst themselves what might be the difference between darkness and light. They knew that beings had multiplied and increased, and yet light had never broken upon them, but it ever continued dark. Hence these sayings are found in our ancient religious services, there was darkness from the first division of time, unto the tenth, to the hundredth, to the thousandth, that is, for a vast space of time. And these divisions of times were considered as beings, and were each termed p, and on their account there was as yet no world with its bright light, but darkness only for the beings which existed. At last the beings who had been begotten by heaven and earth, worn out by the continued darkness, consulted amongst themselves, saying, Let us now determine what we should do with Rengi and Papa. Whether it would be better to slay them or to rend them apart. Then spoke to Matawenga, the fiercest of the children of heaven and earth, It is well, let us slay them. Then spake Tamehuta, the father of forests and of all things that inhabit them, or that are constructed from trees, nay, not so. It is better to rend them apart, and to let the heaven stand far above us, and the earth lie under our feet. Let the sky become as a stranger to us, but the earth remain close to us as our nursing mother. The brothers all consented to this proposal, with the exception of Tawirimati, the father of winds and storms, and he, fearing that his kingdom was about to be overthrown, grieved greatly at the thought of his parents being torn apart. Five of the brothers willingly consented to the separation of their parents, but one of them would not agree to it. Hence, also, these sayings of old are found in our prayers, darkness, darkness, light, light, the seeking, the searching, in chaos, in chaos. These signified the way in which the offspring of heaven and earth sought for some mode of dealing with their parents, so that human beings might increase and live. So, also, these sayings of old time. The multitude, the length, signified the multitude of the thoughts of the children of heaven and earth, and the length of time they considered whether they should slay their parents, that human beings might be called into existence. For it was in this manner that they talked and consulted amongst themselves. But at length their plans having been agreed on, lo, Rangomatain, the god and father of the cultivated food of man, rises up, that he may rend apart the heavens and the earth, he struggles, but he tends them not apart. Lo, next, Tangaroa, the god and father of fish and reptiles, rises up, that he may rend apart the heavens and the earth, he also struggles, but he rends them not apart. Lo, next, Homiadikatiki, the god and father of the food of man which springs without cultivation, rises up and struggles, but ineffectually. Lo, then, Tumatawenga, the god and father of fierce human beings, rises up and struggles, but he, too, fails in his efforts. Then, at last, slowly uprises Tamahuta, the god and father of forests, of birds, and of insects, and he struggles. With his parents, in vain he strives to rend them apart with his hands and arms. Lo, he pauses. His head is now firmly planted on his mother the earth, his feet he raises up and rests against his father the skies, he strains his back and limbs with mighty effort. Now are rent apart Rengi and Papa, and with cries and groans of woe they shriek aloud, Wherefore slay you thus your parents? Why commit you so dreadful a crime as to slay us, as to rend your parents apart? But Tamahuta pauses not, he regards not their shrieks and cries, far, far beneath him he presses down the earth, far, far above him he thrusts up the sky. Hence these sayings of olden time, it was the fierce thrusting of Tain which tore the heaven from the earth, so that they were rent apart, and darkness was made manifest, and so was the light. No sooner was heaven rent from earth than the multitude of human beings were discovered whom they had begotten, and who had hitherto lain concealed between the bodies of Rengi and Papa. Then, also, there arose in the breast of Tawirimati, the god and father of winds and storms, a fierce desire to wage war with his brothers, because they had rent apart their common parents. He from the first had refused to consent to his mother being torn from her lord and children, it was his brothers alone that wished for this separation, and desired that Papatuanuku, or the earth alone, should be left as a parent for them. The god of hurricanes and storms dreads also that the world should become too fair and beautiful, so he rises, follows his father to the realm above, and hurries to the sheltered hollows in the boundless skies. 
There he hides and clings, and nestling in this place of rest he consults long with his parent, and as the vast heaven listens to the suggestions of Tawirimati, thoughts and plans are formed in his breast. And Tawirimati also understands what he should do. Then by himself and the vast heaven were begotten his numerous brood, and they rapidly increased and grew. Tawirimati dispatches one of them to the westward, and one to the southward, and one to the eastward, and one to the northward. And he gives corresponding names to himself and to his progeny the mighty winds. He next sends forth fierce squalls, whirlwinds, dense clouds, massy clouds, dark clouds, gloomy thick clouds, fiery clouds, clouds which precede hurricanes, clouds of fiery black, clouds reflecting glowing red light. Clouds wildly drifting from all quarters and wildly bursting, clouds of thunderstorms, and clouds hurriedly flying. In the midst of these Tawirimati himself sweeps wildly on. Alas! Alas! Then rages the fierce hurricane. And whilst Tamahuta and his gigantic forests still stand, unconscious and unsuspecting, the blast of the breath of the mouth of Tawirimati smites them, the gigantic trees are snapped off right in the middle, alas! Alas! They are rent to atoms, dashed to the earth, with boughs and branches torn and scattered, and lying on the earth, trees and branches all alike left for the insect, for the grub, and for loathsome rottenness. From the forests and their inhabitants to Wirimati next swoops down upon the seas, and lashes in his wrath the ocean. Ah! Ah! Waves steep as cliffs arise, whose summits are so lofty that to look from them would make the beholder giddy. These soon eddy in whirlpools, and Tangaroa, the god of ocean, and father of all that dwell therein, flies affrighted through his seas. But before he fled, his children consulted together how they might secure their safety, for Tangaroa had begotten Punga, and he had begotten two children, Ika Tir, the father of fish, and Tuti Wihewi, or Tuti Wanawana, the father of reptiles. When Tangaroa fled for safety to the ocean, then Tutiwihewi and Ika Tir, and their children, disputed together as to what they should do to escape from the storms, and Tutiwihewi and his party cried aloud, Let us fly inland. But Ika Tir and his party cried aloud, Let us fly to the sea. Some would not obey one order, some would not obey the other, and they escaped in two parties, the party of Tutiwihewi, or the reptiles, hid themselves ashore. The party of Punga rushed to the sea. This is what, in our ancient religious services, is called the separation of Tawirimati. Hence these traditions have been handed down, Ika Tir, the father of things which inhabit water, cried aloud to Tutiwihewi, Ho, ho, let us all escape to the sea. But Tutiwihewi shouted in answer, Nay, nay, let us rather fly inland. Then Ika Tir warned him, saying, Fly inland, then, and the fate of you and your race will be, that when they catch you, before you are cooked, they will singe off your scales over a lighted wisp of dry fern. But Tutiwihewi answered him, saying, Seek safety, then, in the sea. And the future fate of your race will be, that when they serve out little baskets of cooked vegetable food to each person, you will be laid upon the top of the food to give a relish to it. Then without delay these two races of beings separated. The fish fled in confusion to the sea, the reptiles sought safety in the forests and scrubs. Tangaroa, enraged at some of his children deserting him, and, being sheltered by the god of the forests on dry land, has ever since waged war on his brother Tain, who, in return, has waged war against him. Hence Tain supplies the offspring of his brother Tumatawenga with canoes, with spears, and with fish hooks made from his trees, and with nets woven from his fibrous plants, that they may destroy the offspring of Tangaroa. Whilst Tangaroa, in return, swallows up the offspring of Tain, overwhelming canoes with the surges of his sea, swallowing up the lands, trees, and houses that are swept off by floods, and ever wastes away, with his lapping waves. The shores that confine him, that the giants of the forests may be washed down and swept out into his boundless ocean, that he may then swallow up the insects, the young birds. And the various animals which inhabit them all which things are recorded in the prayers which were offered to these gods. Tawirimati next rushed on to attack his brothers Rangamatane and Hamiata Katiki, 
the gods and progenitors of cultivated and uncultivated food, but Papa, to save these for her other children, caught them up, and hid them in a place of safety. And so well were these children of hers concealed by their mother earth, that Tawirimati sought for them in vain. Tawirimati having thus vanquished all his other brothers, next rushed against Tumatawenga, to try his strength against his. He exerted all his force against him, but he could neither shake him nor prevail against him. What did Tumatawenga care for his brother's wrath? He was the only one of the whole party of brothers who had planned the destruction of their parents, and had shown himself brave and fierce in war. His brothers had yielded at once before the tremendous assaults of Tawirimati and his progeny Tamahuta and his offspring had been broken and torn in pieces Tangaroa and his children had fled to the depths of the ocean or the recesses of the Shorongomatane and Hamiatakatiki had been hidden from him in the earth but Tumatawenga. Or man, still stood erect and unshaken upon the breast of his mother earth. And now at length the hearts of heaven and of the god of storms became tranquil, and their passions were assuaged. Tumatawenga, or fierce man, having thus successfully resisted his brother, the god of hurricanes and storms, next took thought how he could turn upon his brothers and slay them. Because they had not assisted him or fought bravely when Tawirimati had attacked them to avenge the separation of their parents, and because they had left him alone to show his prowess in the fight. As yet death had no power over man. It was not until the birth of the children of Terana and of Makiatu Tera, of Maui Taha, of Maui Roto, of Maui Pei, of Maui Waho, and of Maui de Katiki Odoranga, the demigod who tried to beguile Hainui Tiipa, that death had power over men. If that goddess had not been deceived by Maui de Katiki, men would not have died, but would in that case have lived forever, it was from his deceiving Hainui Tiipa that death obtained power over mankind, and penetrated to every part of the earth. Tumatawenga continued to reflect upon the cowardly manner in which his brothers had acted, in leaving him to show his courage alone, and he first sought some means of injuring Tamahuta. Because he had not come to aid him in his combat with Tawirimati, and partly because he was aware that Tain had had a numerous progeny, who were rapidly increasing, and might at last prove hostile to him, and injure him. So he began to collect leaves of the Wanake tree, and twisted them into nooses, and when his work was ended, he went to the forest to put up his snares, and hung them up ha. Ha. The children of Tain fell before him, none of them could any longer fly or move in safety. Then he next determined to take revenge on his brother Tangaroa, who had also deserted him in the combat. So he sought for his offspring, and found them leaping or swimming in the water, then he cut many leaves from the flax plant, and netted nets with the flax, and dragged these, and hauled the children of Tangaroa ashore. After that, he determined also to be revenged upon his brothers Rangomatain and Hamiatakatiki. He soon found them by their peculiar leaves, and he scraped into shape a wooden hoe, and plaited a basket, and dug in the earth and pulled up all kinds of plants with edible roots, and the plants which had been dug up withered in the sun. Thus Tumatawenga devoured all his brothers, and consumed the whole of them, in revenge for their having deserted him and left him to fight alone against Tawirimati and Rengi. When his brothers had all thus been overcome by two, he assumed several names, namely, Tukariri, Tukan Guha, Tukatawa, Tuwakahik Tangata, Tumatawaiti, and Tumatawenga. He assumed one name for each of his attributes displayed in the victories over his brothers. Four of his brothers were entirely deposed by him, and became his food. But one of them, Tawirimati, he could not vanquish or make common, by eating him for food, so he, the last born child of heaven and earth, was left as an enemy for man, and still, with a rage equal to that of man. This elder brother ever attacks him in storms and hurricanes, endeavoring to destroy him alike by sea and land. Now, the meanings of these names of the children of the heaven and earth are as follows. Tangaroa signifies fish of every kind, Rangomatane signifies the sweet potato, and all vegetables cultivated as food. Hamiatakatiki signifies fern root, and all kinds of food which grow wild, Tainmahuta signifies forests, the birds and insects which inhabit them, and all things fashioned from wood, Tawirimati signifies winds and storms. And Tumatawenga signifies man. Four of his brothers having, as before stated, 
been made common, or articles of food, by two Matawenga, he assigned for each of them fitting incantations, that they might be abundant, and that he might easily obtain them. Some incantations were proper to Tain Mahuta, they were called Tain. Some incantations were for Tangaroa, they were called Tangaroa. Some were for Rangomatain, they were called Rangomatain. Some were for Hamia de Katiki, they were called Hamia. The reason that he sought out these incantations was, that his brothers might be made common by him, and serve for his food. There were also incantations for Tawirimati to cause favorable winds, and prayers to the vast heaven for fair weather, as also for Mother Earth that she might produce all things abundantly. But it was the great God that taught these prayers to man. There were also many prayers and incantations composed for man, suited to the different times and circumstances of his life prayers at the baptism of an infant. Prayers for abundance of food, for wealth, prayers in illness, prayers to spirits, and for many other things. The bursting forth of the wrathful fury of Tawirimati against his brothers, was the cause of the disappearance of a great part of the dry land, during that contest a great part of Mother Earth was submerged. The names of those beings of ancient days who submerged so large a portion of the earth were terrible rain, long-continued rain, fierce hailstorms. And their progeny were, mist, heavy dew, and light dew, and these together submerged the greater part of the earth, so that only a small portion of dry land projected above the sea. From that time clear light increased upon the earth, and all the beings which were hidden between Rengi and Papa before they were separated, now multiplied upon the earth. The first beings begotten by Rengi and Papa were not like human beings. But Tumatawenga bore the likeness of a man, as did all his brothers, as also did a Pa, A O, a Kore, T E Kimihanga and Renuku, and thus it continued until the times of Ngainwi in his generation, and of Wairo T E Tupua in his generation. And of Tiki Dawido Ariki in his generation, and it has so continued to this day. The children of Tumatawenga were begotten on this earth, and they increased, and continued to multiply, until we reach at last the generation of Maui Taha, and of his brothers Maui Roto, Maui Waho, Maui Pei, and Maui de Katiki Odoranga. Up to this time the vast heaven has still ever remained separated from his spouse the earth. Yet their mutual love still continues the soft warm sighs of her loving bosom still ever rise up to him, ascending from the woody mountains and valleys and men can these mists. And the vast heaven, as he mourns through the long nights his separation from his beloved, drops frequent tears upon her bosom, and men seeing these, term them dewdrops. The Legend of Maui One day Maui asked his brothers to tell him the place where their father and mother dwelt, he begged earnestly that they would make this known to him in order that he might go and visit the place where the two old people dwelt. And they replied to him, We don't know, how can we tell whether they dwell up above the earth, or down under the earth, or at a distance from up? Then he answered them, Never mind, I think I'll find them out. And his brothers replied, Nonsense, how can you tell where they are you, the last born of all of us, when we your elders have no knowledge where they are concealed from us? After you first appeared to us, and made yourself known to us and to our mother as our brother, you know that our mother used to come and sleep with us every night, and as soon as the day broke she was gone, and, lo! There was nobody but ourselves sleeping in the house, and this took place night after night, and how can we tell then where she went or where she lives? But he answered, Very well, you stop here and listen, by and by you will hear news of me. For he had found something out after he was discovered by his mother, by his relations, and by his brothers. They discovered him one night whilst they were all dancing in the great house of assembly. Whilst his relations were all dancing there, they found out who he was in this manner. For little Maui, the infant, crept into the house, and went and sat behind one of his brothers, and hid himself, so when their mother counted her children that they might stand up ready for the dance, she said, One that's Maui Taha. 2. That's Maui Roto, 3. That's Maui Pei, 4. That's Maui Waho, and then she saw another, and cried out, Hello, where did this fifth come from? Then little Maui, the infant, answered, Ah, I'm your child too. Then the old woman counted them all over again, and said, Oh, no, there ought to be only four of you, now for the first time I've seen you. 
Then little Maui and his mother stood for a long time disputing about this in the very middle of the ranks of all the dancers. At last she got angry, and cried out, Come, you be off now, out of the house at once. You are no child of mine, you belong to someone else. Then little Maui spoke out quite boldly, and said, Very well, I'd better be off then, for I suppose, as you say it, I must be the child of some other person. But indeed I did think I was your child when I said so, because I knew I was born at the side of the sea, one and was thrown by you into the foam of the surf, after you had wrapped me up in a tuft of your hair, which you cut off for the purpose. Then the seaweed formed and fashioned me, as caught in its long tangles the ever-heaving surges of the sea rolled me, folded as I was in them, from side to side. At length the breezes and squalls which blew from the ocean drifted me on shore again, and the soft jellyfish of the long sandy beaches rolled themselves round me to protect me. Then again myriads of flies alighted on me to buzz about me and lay their eggs, that maggots might eat me, and flocks of birds collected round me to peck me to pieces, but at that moment appeared there also my great ancestor, Tamanui Kitiirengi. And he saw the flies and the birds collected in clusters and flocks above the jellyfish, and the old man ran, as fast as he could, and stripped off the encircling jellyfish, and behold within there lay a human being. Then he caught me up and carried me to his house, and he hung me up in the roof that I might feel the warm smoke and the heat of the fire, so I was saved alive by the kindness of that old man. At last I grew, and then I heard of the fame of the dancing of this great house of assembly. It was that which brought me here. But from the time I was in your womb, I have heard the names of these your firstborn children, as you have been calling them over until this very night, when I again heard you repeating them. In proof of this I will now recite your names to you, my brothers. You are Maui Taha, and you are Maui Roto, and you are Maui Pei, and you are Maui Waho, and as for me, I'm little Maui the baby, and here I am sitting before you. When his mother, Terana, heard all this, she cried out, You dear little child, you are indeed my last-born, the son of my old age, therefore I now tell you your name shall be Maui the Katiki Taranga, or Maui formed in the Tapnat of Taranga. And he was called by that name. After the disputing which took place on that occasion, his mother, Terana, called to her last-born, Come here, my child, and sleep with the mother who bore you, that I may kiss you, and that you may kiss me, and he ran to sleep with his mother. Then his elder brothers were jealous, and began to murmur about this to each other. Well, indeed, our mother never asks us to go and sleep with her, yet we are the children she saw actually born, and about whose birth there is no doubt. When we were little things she nursed us, laying us down gently on the large soft mat she had spread out for us then why does she not ask us now to sleep with her? When we were little things she was fond enough of us, but now we are grown older she never caresses us, or treats us kindly. But as for this little abortion, who can really tell whether he was nursed by the sea tangles or by whom, or whether he is not some other person's child, and here he is now sleeping with our mother. Who would ever have believed that a little abortion, thrown into the ocean, would have come back to the world again a living human being, and now this little rogue has the impudence to call himself a relation of ours. Then the two elder brothers said to the two younger ones, Never mind, let him be our dear brother. In the days of peace remember the proverb when you are on friendly terms, settle your disputes in a friendly way when you are at war, you must redress your injuries by violence. It is better for us, O, oh, brothers, to be kind to other people. These are the ways by which men gain influence in the world by laboring for abundance of food to feed others by collecting property to give to others, and by similar means by which you promote the good of others. So that peace spreads through the world. Let us take care that we are not like the children of Ringinui and of Papatuanuku, who turned over in their minds thoughts for slaying, their parents. Four of them consented, but Tawiri Mati had little desire for this, for he loved his parents but the rest of his brothers agreed to slay them. Afterwards when Tawiri, saw that the husband was separated far from his wife, then he thought what it was his duty to do, and he fought against his brothers. Then sprang the cause which led Tumatawenga to wage war against his brethren and his parents, and now at last this contest is carried on even between his own kindred, so that man fights against man. 
Therefore let us be careful not to foster divisions amongst ourselves, lest such wicked thoughts should finally turn us each against the other, and thus we should be like the children of Renginui and of Papatuanuku. Two younger brothers, when they heard this, answered, Yes, yes, O, oh, eldest brothers of ours, you are quite right, let our murmuring end here. It was now night. But early in the morning Terana rose up, and suddenly, in a moment of time, she was gone from the house where her children were. As soon as they woke up they looked all about to no purpose, as they could not see her. The elder brothers knew she had left them, and were accustomed to it, but the little child was exceedingly vexed, yet he thought, I cannot see her, tis true, but perhaps she has only gone to prepare some food for us. No no she was off, far, far away. Now at nightfall when their mother came back to them, her children were dancing and singing as usual. As soon as they had finished, she called to her last born, Come here, my child, let us sleep together. So they slept together, but as soon as day dawned, she disappeared, the little fellow now felt quite suspicious at such strange proceedings on the part of his mother every morning. But at last, upon another night, as he slept again with his mother, the rest of his brothers that night also sleeping with them, the little fellow crept out in the night and stole his mother's apron, her belt, and clothes, and hid them. Then he went and stopped up every crevice in the wooden window, and in the doorway, so that the light of the dawn might not shine into the house, and make his mother hurry to get up. But after he had done this, his little heart still felt very anxious and uneasy lest his mother should, in her impatience, rise in the darkness and defeat his plans. But the night dragged its slow length along without his mother moving. At last there came the faint light of early mom, so that at one end of a long house you could see the legs of the people sleeping at the other end of it, but his mother still slept on, then the sun rose up, and mounted far up above the horizon. Now at last his mother moved, and began to think to herself, what kind of night can this be, to last so long? And having thought thus, she dropped asleep again. Again she woke, and began to think to herself, but could not tell that it was broad daylight outside, as the window and every chink in the house were stopped closely up. At last up she jumped. And finding herself quite naked, began to look for her clothes, and apron, but could find neither, then she ran and pulled out the things with which the chinks in the windows and doors were stopped up, and whilst doing so, oh dear! Oh dear! There she saw the sun high up in the heavens, then she snatched up, as she ran off, the old cloud of a flax cloak, with which the door of the house had been stopped up, and carried it off as her only covering. Getting, at last, outside the house, she hurried away, and ran crying at the thought of having been so badly treated by her own children. As soon as his mother got outside the house, little Maui jumped up, and kneeling upon his hands and knees peeped after her though the doorway into the bright light. Whilst he was watching her, the old woman reached down to a tuft of rushes, and snatching it up from the ground, dropped into a hole underneath it, and clapping the tuft of rushes in the hole again, as if it were its covering, so disappeared. Then little Maui jumped on his feet, and, as hard as he could go, ran out of the house, pulled up the tuft of rushes, and peeping down, discovered a beautiful open cave running quite deep into the earth. He covered up the hole again and returned to the house, and waking up his brothers who were still sleeping, said, Come, come, my brothers, rouse up, you have slept long enough, come, get up, here we are again cajoled by our mother. Then his brothers made haste and got up, alas! Alas! The sun was quite high up in the heavens. The little Maui now asked his brothers again, Where do you think the place is where our father and mother dwell? And they answered, How should we know, we have never seen it, although we are Maui Taha, and Maui Roto, and Maui Pei, and Maui Waho, we have never seen the place, and do you think you can find that place which you are so anxious to see? What does it signify to you? Cannot you stop quietly with us? What do we care about our father, or about our mother? Did she feed us with food till we grew up to be men, not a bit of it? Why, without doubt, Rengi, or the heaven, is our father, who kindly sent his offspring down to us, how Fenua, or gentle breezes, to cool the earth and young plants, and how Maringaringi, or mists, to moisten them. And how Marotoroto, or fine weather, 
to make them grow, and Tuaranji, or rain, to water them. And Tamaranji, or dews, to nourish them, he gave these his offspring to cause our food to grow, and then Papatuanuku, or the earth, made her seeds to spring, and grow forth, and provide sustenance for her children in this long-continuing world. Little Maui then answered, What you say is truly quite correct. But such thoughts and sayings would better become me than you, for in the foaming bubbles of the sea I was nursed and fed, it would please me better if you would think over and remember the time when you were nursed at your mother's breast. It could not have been until after you had ceased to be nourished by her milk that you could have eaten the kinds of food you have mentioned, as for me, oh! My brothers, I have never partaken either of her milk or of her food. Yet I love her, for this single reason alone that I lay in her womb, and because I love her, I wish to know where is the place where she and my father dwell. His brothers felt quite surprised and pleased with their little brother when they heard him talk in this way, and when after a little time they had recovered from their amazement, they told him to try and find their father and mother. So he said he would go. It was a long time ago that he had finished his first labor, for when he first appeared to his relatives in their house of singing and dancing, he had on that occasion transformed himself into the likeness of all manner of birds. Of every bird in the world, and yet no single form that he then assumed had pleased his brothers. But now when he showed himself to them, transformed into the semblance of a pigeon, his brothers said, Ah! Now indeed, oh, brother, you do look very well indeed, very beautiful, very beautiful, much more beautiful than you looked in any of the other forms which you assumed, and then changed from, when you first discovered yourself to us. What made him now look so well in the shape he had assumed was the belt of his mother, and her apron, which he had stolen from her while she was asleep in the house. For the very thing which looked so white upon the breast of the pigeon was his mother's broad belt, and he also had on her little apron of burnished hair from the tail of a dog. And the fastening of her belt was what formed the beautiful black feathers on his throat. He had once changed himself into this form a long time ago, and now that he was going to look for his father and mother, and had quitted his brothers to transform himself into the likeness of a pigeon. He assumed exactly the same form as on the previous occasion, and when his brothers saw him thus again, they said, Oh, brother, oh, brother! You do really look well indeed, and when he sat upon the bough of a tree, oh, dear! He never moved, or jumped about from spray to spray, but sat quite still, cooing to himself, so that no one who had seen him could have helped thinking of the proverb, a stupid pigeon sits on one bough, and jumps not from spray to spray. Early the next morning, he said to his brothers, as was first stated, now do you remain here, and you will hear something of me after I am gone, it is my great love for my parents that leads me to search for them. Now listen to me, and then say whether or not my recent feats were not remarkable. For the feat of transforming oneself into birds can only be accomplished by a man who is skilled in magic, and yet here I, the youngest of you all, have assumed the form of all birds, and now, perhaps, after all. I shall quite lose my art and become old and weakened in the long journey to the place where I am going. His brothers answered him thus, that might be indeed, if you were going upon a warlike expedition, but, in truth, you are only going to look for those parents whom we all so long to see, and if they are found by you. We shall ever after all dwell happily, our present sorrow will be ended, and we shall continually pass backwards and forwards between our dwelling place and theirs, paying them happy visits. He answered them, It is certainly a very good cause which leads me to undertake this journey, and if, when reaching the place I am going to, I find everything agreeable and nice, then I shall, perhaps, be pleased with it, but if I find it a bad, disagreeable place, I shall be disgusted with it. They replied to him, What you say is exceedingly true, depart then upon your journey, with your great knowledge and skill in magic. Then their brother went into the wood, and came back to them again, looking just as if he were a real pigeon. His brothers were quite delighted, and they had no power left to do anything but admire him. Then off he flew, until he came to the cave which his mother had run down into, and he lifted up the tuft of rushes. Then down he went and disappeared in the cave, and shut up its mouth again so as to hide the entrance, away he flew very fast indeed, and twice he dipped his wing, because the cave was narrow. 
Soon he reached nearly to the bottom of the cave, and flew along it, and again, because the cave was so narrow, he dips first one wing and then the other, but the cave now widened, and he dashed straight on. At last he saw a party of people coming alone under a grove of trees, they were manipau trees, too, and flying on, he perched upon the top of one of these trees, under which the people had seated themselves. And when he saw his mother lying down on the grass by the side of her husband, he guessed at once who they were, and he thought, Ah! There sit my father and mother right under me. And he soon heard their names, as they were called to by their friends who were sitting with them. Then the pigeon hopped down, and perched on another spray a little lower, and it pecked off one of the berries of the tree and dropped it gently down, and bit the father with it on the forehead. And some of the party said, was it a bird which threw that down? But the father said, Oh no, it was only a berry that fell by chance. Then the pigeon again pecked off some of the berries from the tree, and threw them down with all its force, and struck both father and mother, so that he really hurt them. Then they cried out, and the whole party jumped up and looked into the tree, and as the pigeon began to coo, they soon found out from the noise, where it was sitting amongst the leaves and branches, and the whole of them. The chiefs and common people alike, caught up stones to pelt the pigeon with, but they threw for a very long time, without hitting it. At last the father tried to throw up at it, ah, he struck it, but Maui had himself contrived that he should be struck by the stone which his father threw, for, but by his own choice, no one could have bit him. He was struck exactly upon his left leg, and down he fell, and as he lay fluttering and struggling upon the ground, they all ran to catch him, but lo, the pigeon had turned into a man. Then all those who saw him were frightened at his fierce glaring eyes, which were red as if painted with red ochre, and they said, Oh, it is now no wonder that he so long sat still up in the tree. Had he been a bird he would have flown off long before, but he is a man, and some of them said, No, indeed, rather a god just look at his form and appearance, the like has never been seen before, since Rengi and Papatuanuku were torn apart. Then Terana said, I used to see one who looked like this person every night when I went to visit my children, but what I saw then excelled what I see now, just listen to me. Once as I was wandering upon the seashore, I prematurely gave birth to one of my children, and I cut off the long tresses of my hair, and bound him up in them, and threw him into the foam of the sea. And after that bee was found by his ancestor Tamanui Kitiiringi. And then she told his history nearly in the same words that Maui the infant had told it to herself and his brothers in their house, and having finished his history, Terana ended her discourse to her husband and his friends. Then his mother asked Maui, who was sitting near her, Where do you come from? From the westward. And he answered, No, from the northeast then. No, from the southeast then. No, from the south then. No. Was it the wind which blows upon me, which brought you here to me then, when she asked this, he opened his mouth and answered, Yes. And she cried out, Oh, this then is indeed my child, and she said, Are you Maui Taha? He answered, No. Then said she, Are you Maui de Katiki Odoranga? And he answered, Yes. And she cried aloud, This is, indeed, my child. By the winds and storms and wave-uplifting gales he was fashioned and became a human being, welcome, O oh my child, welcome. You shall climb the threshold of the house of your great ancestor Hainui Tiipa, and death shall thenceforth have no power over man. Then the lad was taken by his father to the water, to be baptized, and after the ceremony prayers were offered to make him sacred, and clean from all impurities. But when it was completed, his father Makiatu Tera felt greatly alarmed, because he remembered that he had, from mistake, hurriedly skipped over part of the prayers of the baptismal service, and of the services to purify Maui. He knew that the gods would be certain to punish this fault, by causing Maui to die, and his alarm and anxiety were therefore extreme. At nightfall they all went into his house. Maui, after these things, returned to his brothers to tell them that he had found his parents, and to explain to them where they dwelt. Shortly after Maui had thus returned to his brothers, he slew and carried off his first victim, who was the daughter of Maruti Weredu, afterwards, by enchantments, he destroyed the crops of Maruti Weredu, so that they all withered. 
He then again paid a visit to his parents, and remained for some time with them, and whilst he was there he remarked that some of their people daily carried away a present of food for some person. At length, surprised at this, he one day asked them, Who is that you are taking that present of food to? And the people who were going with it answered him, It is for your ancestress, for Morirangafenua. He asked again, Where does she dwell? They answered, Yonder. Thereupon he says, That will do, leave here the present of food, I will carry it to her myself. From that time the daily presents of food for his ancestress were carried by Maui himself, but he never took and gave them to her that she might eat them, but he quietly laid them by on one side, and this he did for many days. At last, Morirangafenua suspected that something wrong was going on, and the next time he came along the path carrying the present of food, the old chieftainess sniffed and sniffed until she thought she smelt something coming. And she was very much exasperated, and her stomach began to distend itself, that she might be ready to devour Maui as soon as he came there. Then she turned to the southward, and smelt and sniffed, but not a scent of anything reached her. Then she turned round from the south to the north, by the east, with her nose up in the air sniffing and smelling to every point as she turned slowly round, but she could not detect the slightest scent of a human being. And almost thought that she must have been mistaken. But she made one more trial, and sniffed the breeze towards the westward. Ah! Then the scent of a man came plainly to her, so she called aloud, I know from the smell wafted here to me by the breeze that somebody is close to me, and Maui murmured assent. Thus the old woman knew that B was a descendant of hers, and her stomach, which was quite large and distended immediately began to shrink, and contract itself again. If the smell of Maui had not been carried to her by the western breeze, undoubtedly she would have eaten him up. When the stomach of Moriranga Fenua had quietly sunk down to its usual size, her voice was again heard saying, Art thou Maui? And he answered, Even so. Then she asked him, Wherefore hast thou served thine old ancestress in this deceitful way? And Maui answered, I was anxious that thy jawbone, by which the great enchantments can be wrought, should be given to me. She answered, Take it, it has been reserved for thee. And Maui took it, and having done so returned to the place where he and his brothers dwelt. The young hero, Maui, had not been long at home with his brothers when he began to think, that it was too soon after the rising of the sun that it became night again, and that the sun again sank down below the horizon, every day, every day. In the same manner the days appeared too short to him. So at last, one day he said to his brothers, Let us now catch the sun in a noose, so that we may compel him to move more slowly, in order that mankind may have long days to labor in to procure subsistence for themselves. But they answered him, Why, no man could approach it on account of its warmth, and the fierceness of its heat, but the young hero said to them, Have you not seen the multitude of things I have already achieved? Did not you see me change myself into the likeness of every bird of the forest? You and I equally had the aspect and appearance of men, yet I by my enchantments changed suddenly from the appearance of a man and became a bird, and then, continuing to change my form, I resembled this bird or that bird, one after the other. Until I had by degrees transformed myself into every bird in the world, small or great. And did I not after all this again assume the form of a man? This he did soon after he was born, and it was after that he snared the sun. Therefore, as for that feat, oh, my brothers, the changing myself into birds, I accomplished it by enchantments, and I will by the same means accomplish also this other thing which I have in my mind. When his brothers heard this, they consented on his persuasions to aid him in the conquest of the sun. Then they began to spin and twist ropes to form a noose to catch the sun in, and in doing this they discovered the mode of plating flax into stout square-shaped ropes, tomaka, and the manner of plating flat ropes, paharahara. And of spinning round ropes, at last, they finished making all the ropes which they required. Then Ma took up his enchanted weapon, and he took his brothers with him, and they carried their provisions, ropes, and other things with them, in their hands. They travelled all night, and as soon as day broke, they halted in the desert, and hid themselves that they might not be seen by the sun, and at night they renewed their journey, and before dawn they halted, and hid themselves again. At length they got very far, very far, 
to the eastward, and came to the very edge of the place out of which the sun rises. Then they set to work and built on each side of this place a long high wall of clay, with huts of boughs of trees at each end to hide themselves in. When these were finished, they made the loops of the noose, and the brothers of Maui then lay in wait on one side of the place out of which the sun rises, and Maui himself lay in wait upon the other side. The young hero held in his hand his enchanted weapon, the jawbone of his ancestress of Moriranga Fenua, and said to his brothers, Mind now, keep yourselves hid, and do not go showing yourselves foolishly to the sun. If you do, you will frighten him, but wait patiently until his head and forelegs have got well into the snare, then I will shout out. Haul away as hard as you can on the ropes on both sides, and then I'll rush out and attack him, but do you keep your ropes tight for a good long time, while I attack him, until he is nearly dead, when we will let him go. But mind, now, my brothers, do not let him move you to pity with his shrieks and screams. At last the sun came rising up out of his place, like a fire spreading far and wide over the mountains and forests. He rises up, his head passes through the noose, and it takes in more and more of his body, until his forepaws pass through. Then were pulled tight the ropes, and the monster began to struggle and roll himself about, whilst the snare jerked backwards and forwards as he struggled. Ah! Was not he held fast in the ropes of his enemies? Then forth rushed that bold hero, Matakatiki Odoranga, with his enchanted weapon. Alas! The sun screams aloud, he roars, Maui strikes him fiercely with many blows. They hold him for a long time, at last they let him go, and then weak from wounds the sun crept along its course. Then was learnt by men the second name of the sun, for in its agony the sun screamed out, Why am I thus smitten by you? Oh, man! Do you know what you are doing? Why should you wish to kill Tamanui Tiare? Thus was learnt his second name. At last they let him go. Oh, then, Tamanui Tiare went very slowly and feebly on his course. Maui Taha and his brothers after this feat returned again to their own house, and dwelt there, and dwelt there, and dwelt there. And after a long time his brothers went out fishing, whilst Maui de Katiki Odoranga stopped idly at home doing nothing, although indeed he had to listen to the sulky grumblings of his wives and children. At his laziness in not catching fish for them. Then he called out to the women, Never mind, oh, mothers, yourselves and your children need not fear. Have not I accomplished all things, and as for this little feat, this trifling work of getting food for you, do you think I cannot do that? Certainly, if I go and get a fish for you, it will be one so large that when I bring it to land you will not be able to eat it all, and the sun will shine on it and make it putrid before it is consumed. Then Maui snooted his enchanted fish hook, which was pointed with part of the jawbone of Moriranga Fenua, and when he had finished this, he twisted a stout fishing line to his hook. His brothers in the meantime had arranged amongst themselves to make fast the lashings of the top side of their canoe, in order to go out for a good day's fishing. When all was made ready they launched their canoe, and as soon as it was afloat Maui jumped into it, and his brothers, who were afraid of his enchantments, cried out, Come, get out again, we will not let you go with us. Your magical arts will get us into some difficulty. So he was compelled to remain ashore whilst his brothers paddled off, and when they reached the fishing ground they lay upon their paddles and fished, and after a good day's sport returned ashore. As soon as it was dark night Maui went down to the shore, got into his brother's canoe, and hid himself under the bottom boards of it. The next forenoon his brothers came down to the shore to go fishing again, and they had their canoe launched, and paddled out to sea without ever seeing Ma, who lay hid in the hollow of the canoe under the bottom boards. When they got well out to sea Maui crept out of his hiding place, as soon as his brothers saw him, they said, we had better get back to the shore again as fast as we can, since this fellow is on board. But Maui, by his enchantments, stretched out the sea so that the shore instantly became very distant from them, and by the time they could turn themselves round to look for it, it was out of view. Maui now said to them, You had better let me go on with you, I shall at least be useful to bail the water out of our canoe. To this they consented, and they paddled on again and speedily arrived at the fishing ground where they used to fish upon former occasions. As soon as they got there his brother said, 
let us drop the anchor and fish here. And he answered, Oh no, don't, we had much better paddle a long distance farther out. Upon this they paddle on, and paddle as far as the farthest fishing ground, a long way out to sea, and then his brothers at last say, Come now, we must drop anchor and fish here. And he replies again, Oh, the fish here are very fine I suppose, but we had much better pull right out to sea, and drop anchor there. If we go out to the place where I wish the anchor to be let go, before you can get a hook to the bottom, a fish will come following it back to the top of the water. You won't have to stop there a longer time than you can wink your eye in, and our canoe will come back to shore full of fish. As soon as they hear this they paddle away they paddle away until they reach a very long distance off, and his brothers then say, we are now far enough. And he replies, no, no, let us go out of sight of land, and when we have quite lost sight of it, then let the anchor be dropped, but let it be very far off, quite out in the open sea. At last they reach the open sea, and his brothers begin to fish. Lo, lo, they had hardly let their hooks down to the bottom, when they each pulled up a fish into the canoe. Twice only they let down their lines, when behold the canoe was filled up with the number of fish they had caught. Then his brother said, Oh, brother, let us all return now. And he answered them, Stay a little. Let me also throw my hook into the sea. And his brothers replied, Where did you get a hook? And he answered, Oh, never mind, I have a hook of my own. And his brothers replied again, Make haste and throw it then. And as he pulled it out from under his garments, the light flashed from the beautiful mother-of-pearl shell in the hollow of the hook, and his brothers saw that the hook was carved and ornamented with tufts of hair pulled from the tail of a dog. And it looked exceedingly beautiful. Maui then asked his brothers to give him a little bait to bait his hook with, but they replied, We will not give you any of our bait. So he doubled his fist and struck his nose violently, and the blood gushed out, and he smeared his hook with his own blood for bait, and then be cast it into the sea, and it sank down, and sank down. Till it reached to the small carved figure on the roof of a house at the bottom of the sea, then passing by the figure, it descended along the outside carved rafters of the roof, and fell in at the doorway of the house. And the hook of Maui the Katiki Odoranga caught first in the sill of the doorway. Then, feeling something on his hook, he began to haul in his line. Ah, ah, there ascended on his hook the house of that old fellow Tonganui. It came up, up, and as it rose high, oh, dear! How his hook was strained with its great weight! And then there came gurgling up foam and bubbles from the earth, as of an island emerging from the water, and his brothers opened their mouths and cried aloud. Maui all this time continued to chant forth his incantations amidst the murmurings and wailings of his brothers, who were weeping and lamenting, and saying, See now, how he has brought us out into the open sea, that we may be upset in it. And devoured by the fish. Then he raised aloud his voice, and repeated the incantation called Hiki which makes heavy weights fight, in order that the fish he had caught might come up easily, and he chanted an incantation beginning thus. Wherefore, then, O. Oh, Tonganui. Dost thou hold fast so obstinately below there? When he had finished his incantation, there floated up, hanging to his line, the fish of Maui, a portion of the earth, of Papatuanuku. Alas! Alas! Their canoe lay aground. Maui then left his brothers with their canoe, and returned to the village, but before he went he said to them, After I am gone, be courageous and patient. Do not eat food until I return, and do not let our fish be cut up, but rather leave it until I have carried an offering to the gods from this great hall of fish, and until I have found a priest. That fitting prayers and sacrifices may be offered to the god, and the necessary rites be completed in order. We shall thus all be purified. I will then return, and we can cut up this fish in safety, and it shall be fairly portioned out to this one, and to that one, and to that other. And on my arrival you shall each have your due share of it, and return to your homes joyfully, and what we leave behind us will keep good, and that which we take away with us, returning, will be good too. Maui had hardly gone, after saying all this to them, than his brothers trampled under their feet the words they had heard him speak. They began at once to eat food, 
and to cut up the fish. When they did this, Maui had not yet arrived at the sacred place, in the presence of the god. Had he previously reached the sacred place, the heart of the deity would have been appeased with the offering of a portion of the fish which had been caught by his disciples. And all the male and female deities would have partaken of their portions of the sacrifice. Alas! Alas! Those foolish, thoughtless brothers of his cut up the fish, and behold the gods turned with wrath upon them, on account of the fish which they had thus cut up without having made a fitting sacrifice. Then indeed, the fish began to toss about his head from side to side, and to lash his tail, and the fins upon his back, and his lower jaw. Ah! Ah! Well done Tangaroa, it springs about on shore as briskly as if it was in the water. That is the reason that this island is now so rough and uneven that here stands a mountain and there lies a plain that here descends a valley that there rises a cliff. If the brothers of Maui had not acted so deceitfully, the huge fish would have lain flat and smooth, and would have remained as a model for the rest of the earth, for the present generation of men. This, which has just been recounted, is the second evil which took place after the separation of heaven from earth. Thus was dry land fished up by Maui after it had been hidden under the ocean by Rengi and Tawirimati. It was with an enchanted fish hook that he drew it up, which was pointed with a bit of the jawbone of his ancestress Moriranga Fenua. And in the district of Haritonga they still show the fish hook of Maui, which became a cape stretching far out into the sea, and now forms the southern extremity of Hawke's Bay. The hero now thought that he would extinguish and destroy the fires of his ancestress of Mahuaikea. So he got up in the night, and put out the fires left in the cooking houses of each family in the village. Then, quite early in the morning, he called aloud to the servants, I hunger, I hunger, quick, cook some food for me. One of the servants thereupon ran as fast as he could to make up the fire to cook some food, but the fire was out. And as he ran round from house to house in the village to get a light, he found every fire quite out he could nowhere get a light. When Maui's mother heard this, she called out to the servants, and said, Some of you repair to my great ancestress Mahuai Ka, tell her that fire has been lost upon earth, and ask her to give some to the world again. But the slaves were alarmed, and refused to obey the commands which their masters, the sacred old people gave them, and they persisted in refusing to go, notwithstanding the old people repeatedly ordered them to do so. At last, Maui said to his mother, Well, then I will fetch down fire for the world, but which is the path by which I must go? And his parents, who knew the country well, said to him, If you will go, follow that broad path that lies just before you there, and you will at last reach the dwelling of an ancestress of yours. And if she asks you who you are, you had better call out your name to her, then she will know you are a descendant of hers. But be cautious, and do not play any tricks with her, because we have heard that your deeds are greater than the deeds of men, and that you are fond of deceiving and injuring others, and perhaps you even now intend in many ways to deceive this old ancestress of yours, but pray be cautious not to do so. But Maui said, No, I only want to bring fire away for men, that is all, and I'll return again as soon as I can do that. Then he went, and reached the abode of the goddess of fire. And he was so filled with wonder at what he saw, that for a long time he could say nothing. At last he said, Oh, lady, would you rise up? Where is your fire kept? I have come to beg some from you. Then the aged lady rose right up, and said, O E. Who can this mortal be? And he answered, it's I, where do you come from? Said she, and he answered, I belong to this country. You are not from this country, said she. Your appearance is not like that of the inhabitants of this country. Do you come from the northeast? He replied, No, do you come from the southeast? He replied, No, are you from the south? He replied, No, are you from the westward? He answered, No, come you, then from the direction of the wind which blows right upon me. And he said, I do. Oh, then, cried she, you are my grandchild, what do you want here? He answered, I am come to beg fire from you. She replied, Welcome, welcome, here then is fire for you. Then the aged woman pulled out her nail, 
and as she pulled it out fire flowed from it, and she gave it to him. And when Maui saw she had drawn out her nail to produce fire for him, he thought it a most wonderful thing. Then he went a short distance off, and when not very far from her, he put the fire out, quite out. And returning to her again, said, The light you gave me has gone out, give me another. Then she caught hold of another nail, and pulled it out as a light for him, and he left her, and went a little on one side, and put that light out also. Then he went back to her again, and said, Oh, lady, give me, I pray you, another light for the last one has also gone out. And thus he went on and on, until she had pulled out all the nails of the fingers of one of her hands. And then she began with the other hand, until she had pulled all the fingernails out of that hand, too, and then she commenced upon the nails of her feet, and pulled them also out in the same manner, except the nail of one of her big toes. Then the aged woman said to herself at last, This fellow is surely playing tricks with me. Then out she pulled the one toe nail that she had left, and it, too, became fire, and as she dashed it down on the ground the whole place caught fire. And she cried out to Maui, There, you have it all now. And Maui ran off, and made a rush to escape, but the fire followed hard after him, close behind him. So he changed himself into a fleet-winged eagle, and flew with rapid flight, but the fire pursued, and almost caught him as he flew. Then the eagle dashed down into a pool of water. But when he got into the water he found that almost boiling too, the forests just then also caught fire, so that it could not alight anywhere, and the earth and the sea both caught fire too, and Maui was very near perishing in the flames. Then he called on his ancestors to Wirimati and Watatiri Matakataka, to send down an abundant supply of water, and he cried aloud, Oh, let water be given to me to quench this fire which pursues after me. And lo, then appeared squalls and gales, and Tawirimati sent heavy lasting rain, and the fire was quenched. And before Mahuika could reach her place of shelter, she almost perished in the rain, and her shrieks and screams became as loud as those of Maui had been, when he was scorched by the pursuing fire, thus Maui ended this proceeding. In this manner was extinguished the fire of Mahuika, the goddess of fire, but before it was all lost, she saved a few sparks which she threw, to protect them, into the Keikomeko, and a few other trees, where they are still cherished. Hence, men yet use portions of the wood of these trees for fire when they require a light. Then he returned to the village, and his mother and father said to him, You heard when we warned you before you went, nevertheless you played tricks with your ancestress, it served you right that you got into such trouble. And the young fellow answered his parents, Oh, what do I care for that, do you think that my perverse proceedings are put a stop to by this? Certainly not, I intend to go on in the same way for ever, ever, ever. And his father answered him, Yes, then, you may just please yourself about living or dying, if you will only attend to me you will save your life, if you do not attend to what I say, it will be worse for you, that is all. As soon as this conversation was ended, off the young fellow went to find some more companions for his other scrapes. Maui had a young sister named Hinori, who was exceedingly beautiful, she married Irawaru. One day Maui and his brother-in-law went down to the sea to fish, Maui caught not a single fish with his hook, which had no barb to it, but as long as they went on fishing Maui observed that Irawaru continued catching plenty of fish. So be thought to himself, well, how is this? How does that fellow catch so many whilst I cannot catch one? Just as he thought this, Irawaru had another bite, and up he pulled his line in haste, but it had got entangled with that of Maui, and Maui thinking he felt a fish pulling at his own line, drew it in quite delighted. But when he had hauled up a good deal of it, there were himself and his brother-in-law pulling in their lines in different directions, one drawing the line towards the bow of the canoe, the other towards the stem. Maui, who was already provoked at his own ill luck, and the good luck of his brother-in-law, now called out quite angrily, Come, let go my line, the fish is on my hook. But Irawaru answered, No, it is not, it is on mine. Maui again called out very angrily, Come, let go, I tell you it is on mine. Irawaru then slacked out his line, and let Maui pull in the fish. And as soon as he had hauled it into the canoe, Maui found that Irawaru was right, 
and that the fish was on his hook, when Irawaru saw this too, he called out, Come now, let go my line and hook. Maui answered him, Cannot you wait a minute, until I take the hook out of the fish? As soon as he got the hook out of the fish's mouth, he looked at it, and saw that it was barbed. Maui, who was already exceedingly wrath with his brother-in-law, on observing this, thought he had no chance with his barbless hook of catching as many fish as his brother-in-law, so he said, Don't you think we had better go on shore now? Irawaru answered, Very well, let us return to the land again. So they paddled back towards the land, and when they reached it, and were going to haul the canoe up onto the beach, Maui said to his brother-in-law, Do you get under the outrigger of the canoe, and lift it up with your back? So he got under it, and as soon as he had done so, Maui jumped on it, and pressed the whole weight of the canoe down upon him, and almost killed Irawaru. When he was on the point of death, Maui trampled on his body, and lengthened his backbone, and by his enchantments drew it out into the form of a tall, and he transformed Irawaru into a dog, and fed him with dung. 3. As soon as he had done this, Maui went back to his place of abode, just as if nothing unusual had taken place, and his young sister, who was watching for the return of her husband, as soon as she saw Maui coming, ran to him and asked him. Saying, Maui, where is your brother-in-law? Maui answered, I left him at the canoe. But his young sister said, why did not you both come home together, and Maui answered, he desired me to tell you that he wanted you to go down to the beach to help him carry up the fish. You had better go therefore, and if you do not see him, just call out, and if he does not answer you, why then call out to him in this way, moi moi moi. Upon learning this, Hinori hurried down to the beach as fast as she could, and not seeing her husband she went about calling out his name, but no answer was made to her, she then called out as Maui had told her, Amoi Amoi Amoi. Then Irawaru, who was running about in the bushes near there, in the form of a dog, at once recognized the voice of Hinori, and answered, Ao. 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 Howling like a dog, and he followed her back to the village, frisking along and wagging his tail with pleasure at seeing her. And from him sprang all dogs, so that he is regarded as their progenitor, and all Maoris still call their dogs to them by the words, Moi Moi Moi. Hinori, when she saw that her husband had been changed into a dog, was quite distracted with grief, and wept bitterly the whole way as she went back to the village, and as soon as ever she got into her house. She caught up an enchanted girdle which she had, and ran back to the sea with it, determined to destroy herself, by throwing herself into the ocean, so that the dragons and monsters of the deep might devour her. When she reached the seashore, she sat down upon the rocks at the ocean's very edge, and as she sat there she first lamented aloud her cruel fate, and repeated an incantation, and then threw herself into the sea. And the tide swept her off from the shore. Maui now felt it necessary to leave the village where Irawara had lived, so he returned to his parents, and when he had been with them for some time, his father said to him one day, Oh, my son. I have heard from your mother and others that you are very valiant, and that you have succeeded in all feats that you have undertaken in your own country, whether they were small or great. But now that you have arrived in your father's country, you will, perhaps, at last be overcome. Then Maui asked him, What do you mean, what things are there that I can be vanquished by? And his father answered him, by your great ancestress, by Hainuiti Ipa, who, if you look, you may see flashing, and as it were, opening and shutting there, where the horizon meets the sky. And Maui replied, Lay aside such idle thoughts, and let us both fearlessly seek whether men are to die or live forever. And his father said, My child, there has been an ill omen for us. When I was baptizing you, I omitted a portion of the fitting prayers, and that I know will be the cause of your perishing. Then Maui asked his father, What is my ancestress Hainuitiipa like? And he answered, What you see yonder shining so brightly red are her eyes, and her teeth are as sharp and hard as pieces of volcanic glass, her body is like that of a man, and as for the pupils of her eyes, they are jasper. And her hair is like tangles of long seaweed, and her mouth is like that of a barracuda. Then his son answered him, Do you think her strength is as great as that of Tamanui Tra, 
who consumes man, and the earth, and the very waters, by the fierceness of his heat? Was not the world formerly saved alive by the speed with which he travelled? If he had then, in the days of his full strength and power, gone as slowly as he does now, not a remnant of mankind would have been left living upon the earth, nor, indeed, would anything else have survived. But I laid hold of Tamanui Tra, and now he goes slowly for I smote him again and again, so that B is now feeble, and long in travelling his course, and he now gives but very little heat, having been weakened by the blows of my enchanted weapon. I then, too, split him open in many places, and from the wound so made, many rays now issue forth, and spread in all directions. So, also I found the sea much larger than the earth, but by the power of the last born of your children, part of the earth was drawn up again, and dry land came forth. And his father answered him, That is all very true, O, oh, my last born, and the strength of my old age, well, then, be bold, go and visit your great ancestress who flashes so fiercely there, where the edge of the horizon meets the sky. Hardly was this conversation concluded with his father, when the young hero went forth to look for companions to accompany him upon this enterprise, and so there came to him for companions, the small robin, and the large robin, and the thrush, and the yellow hammer, and every kind of little bird, and the fantail, and these all assembled together, and they all started with Maui in the evening, and arrived at the dwelling of Hainuitiipa, and found her fast asleep. Then Maui addressed them all, and said, My little friends, now if you see me creep into this old chieftainess, do not laugh at what you see. Nay, nay, do not I pray you, but when I have got altogether inside her, and just as I am coming out of her mouth, then you may shout with laughter if you please. And his little friends, who were frightened at what they saw, replied, Oh, sir, you will certainly be killed. And he answered them, If you burst out laughing at me as soon as I get inside her, you will wake her up, and she will certainly kill me at once, but if you do not laugh until I am quite inside her, and am on the point of coming out of her mouth, I shall live, and Hainuitiipa will die. And his little friends answered, Go on then, brave sir, but pray take good care of yourself. Then the young hero started off, and twisted the strings of his weapon tight round his wrist, and went into the house, and stripped off his clothes, and the skin on his hips looked mottled and beautiful as that of a mackerel, from the tattoo marks. Cut on it with the chisel of Watonga, and he entered the old chieftainess. The little birds now screwed up their tiny cheeks, trying to suppress their laughter, at last, the little Tiwakawaka could no longer keep it in, and laughed out loud, with its merry cheerful note. This woke the old woman up, she opened her eyes, started up, and killed Maui. Thus died this Maui we have spoken of, but before he died he had children, and sons were born to him. Some of his descendants yet live in Hawaii, some in Aotearoa, or in these islands, the greater part of his descendants remained in Hawaii, but a few of them came here to Aotearoa. According to the traditions of the Maori Four, this was the cause of the introduction of death into the world, Hainuitiipa being the goddess of death, if Maui had passed safely through her, then no more human beings would have died. But death itself would have been destroyed, and we express it by saying, the water wagtail laughing at Maui de Katiki Odoranga made Hainuitiipa squeeze him to death. And we have this proverb, men make heirs, but death carries them off. Thus end the deeds of the son of Makiatutera, and of Terana, and the deeds of the sons of Renginui, and of Papatuanuku. This is the narrative about the generations of the ancestors of the Maori, and therefore, we the people of that country, preserve closely these traditions of old times, as a thing to be taught to the generations that come after us. So we repeat them in our prayers, and whenever we relate the deeds of the ancestors from whom each family is descended, and upon other similar occasions. The Legend of Tawaki Now quitting the deeds of Maui, let those of Tawaki be recounted. He was the son of Hema and Yurutanga, and he had a younger brother named Karihi. Tawaki, having taken Hainpiripiri as a wife, went one day with his brothers-in-law to fish from a flat reef of rocks which ran far out into the sea. He had four brothers-in-law, two of these when tired of fishing returned towards their village, and he went with them, when they drew near the village, they attempted to murder him, and thinking they had slain him, buried him. 
They then went on their way to the village, and when they reached it, their young sister said to them, Why, where is your brother-in-law? And they replied, Oh, they're all fishing. So the young wife waited until the other two brothers came back, and when they reached the village they were questioned by their young sister, who asked, Where is your brother-in-law? And the two who had last arrived answered her, Why, the others all went home together long since. So the young wife suspected that they had killed her husband, and ran off at once to search for him. And she found where he had been buried, and on examining him ascertained that he had only been insensible, and was not quite dead. Then with great difficulty she got him upon her back, and carried him home to their house, and carefully washed his wounds, and staunched the bleeding. Tawaki, when he had a little recovered, said to her, Fetch some wood, and light a fire for me, and as his wife was going to do this, he said to her, If you see any tall tree growing near you, fell it and bring that with you for the fire. His wife went, and saw a tree growing such as her husband spoke of, so she felled it, and put it upon her shoulder, and brought it along with her, and when she reached the house, she put the whole tree upon the fire without chopping it into pieces. And it was this circumstance that led her to give the name of Wahiroa, long log of wood for the fire, to their first son, for Tawaki had told her to bring this log of wood home, and to call the child after it. That the duty of avenging his father's wrongs might often be recalled to his mind. As soon as Tawaki had recovered from his wounds, he left the place where his faithless brothers-in-law lived, and went away taking all his own warriors and their families with him. And built a fortified village upon the top of a very lofty mountain, where he could easily protect himself. And they dwelt there. Then he called aloud to the gods, his ancestors, for revenge, and they let the floods of heaven descend, and the earth was overwhelmed by the waters and all human beings perished. And the name given to that event was, the overwhelming of the Mataho, and the whole of the race perished. When this feat was accomplished, Tawaki and his younger brother next went to seek revenge for the death of their father. It was a different race who had carried off and slain the father of Tawaki. The name of that race was the Panaturi the country they inhabited was underneath the waters, but they had a large house on the dry land to which they resorted to sleep at night, the name of that large house was Manawatane. The Panaturi had slain the father of Tawaki and carried off his body, but his father's wife they had carried off alive and kept as a captive. Tawaki and his younger brother went upon their way to seek out that people and to revenge themselves upon them. At length they reached a place from whence they could see the house called Manawatane. At the time they arrived near the house there was no one there but their mother, who was sitting near the door. But the bones of their father were hung up inside the house under its high sloping roof the whole tribe of the Panaturi were at that time in their country under the waters, but at the approach of night they would return to their house. To Manawatane Whilst Tawaki and his younger brother Karihi were coming along still at a great distance from the house, Tawaki began to repeat an incantation, and the bones of his father, Hema, felt the influence of this. And rattled loudly together where they hung under the roof of the house, for gladness, when they heard Tawaki repeating his incantations as he came along, for they knew that the hour of revenge had now come. As the brothers drew nearer, their mother, Yurutonga, heard the voice of Tawaki, and she wept for gladness in front of her children, who came repeating incantations upon their way. And when they reached at length the house, they wept over their mother, over old Yuritanga. When they had ended weeping, their mother said to them, My children, hasten to return hence, or you will both certainly perish. The people who dwell here are a very fierce and savage race. Karihi said to her, How low will the sun have descended when those you speak of return home? And she replied, They will return here when the sun sinks beneath the ocean. Then Karihi asked her, What did they save you alive for? And she answered, They saved me alive that I might watch for the rising of the dawn. They make me ever sit watching here at the door of the house, hence this people have named me, Tata, or, Door, and they keep on throughout the night calling out to me, Ho, Tata, there. Is it dawn yet? And then I call out in answer, No, no, it is deep night it is lasting night it is still night, compose yourselves to sleep, sleep on. Karihi then said to his mother, Cannot we hide ourselves somewhere here? Their mother answered, You had better return, 
you cannot hide yourselves here, the scent of you will be perceived by them. But, said Karihi, we will hide ourselves away in the thick thatch of the house. Their mother, however, answered, Tis of no use, you cannot hide yourselves there. All this time Tawaki sat quite silent, but Karihi said, We will hide ourselves here, for we know incantations which will render us invisible to all. On hearing this, their mother consented to their remaining, and attempting to avenge their father's death. So they climbed up to the ridge pole of the house, upon the outside of the roof, and made holes in the thick layers of reeds which formed the thatch of the roof, and crept into them and covered themselves up. And their mother called to them, saying, When it draws near dawn, come down again and stop up every chink in the house, so that no single ray of light may shine in. At length the day closed, and the sun sank below the horizon, and the whole of that strange tribe left the water in a body, and ascended to the dry land. And, according to their custom from time immemorial, they sent one of their number in front of them, that he might carefully examine the road, and see that there were no hidden foes lying in wait for them either on the way or in their house. As soon as this scout arrived at the threshold of the house, he perceived the scent of Tawaki and Karihi, so be lifted up his nose and turned sniffing all round the inside of the house. As he turned about, he was on the point of discovering that strangers were hidden there, when the rest of the tribe, whom long security had made careless, came hurrying on and crowding into the house in thousands. So that from the denseness of the crowd the scent of the strange men was quite lost. The Panaturi then stowed themselves away in the house until it was entirely filled up with them, and by degrees they arranged themselves in convenient places, and at length all fell fast asleep. At midnight Tawaki and Karihi stole down from the roof of the house, and found that their mother had crept out of the door to meet them, so they sat at the doorway whispering together. Karihi then asked his mother, which is the best way for us to destroy these people who are sleeping here? And their mother answered, you had better let the sun kill them, its rays will destroy them. Having said this, Tata crept into the house again, presently an old man of the Panaturi called out to her, Ho, Tata, Tata, there, is it dawn yet? And she answered, No, no, it is deep night it is lasting night, tis still night. Sleep soundly, sleep on. When it was very near dawn, Tata whispered to her children, who were still sitting just outside the door of the house, see that every chink in the doorway and window is stopped, so that not a ray of light can penetrate here. Presently another old man of the Panaturi called out again, Ho, Tata there, is not it near dawn yet? And she answered, No, no, it is night, it is lasting night, tis still night, sleep soundly, sleep on. This was the second time that Tata had thus called out to them. At last dawn had broken at last the sun had shone brightly upon the earth, and rose high in the heavens, and the old man again called out, Ho, Tata there, is not it dawn yet? And she answered, Yes. And then she called out to her children, Be quick, pull out the things with which you have stopped up the window and the door. So they pulled them out, and the bright rays of the sun came streaming into the house, and the whole of the Panaturi perished before the light, they perished not by the hand of man, but withered before the sun's rays. 5. When the Panaturi had been all destroyed, Tawaki and Karihi carefully took down their father's bones from the roof of the house, and burnt them with fire, and together with the bodies of all those who were in the house, who had perished. Scorched by the bright rays of the sun. They then returned again to their own country, taking with them their mother, and carefully carrying the bones of their father. The fame of Tawaki's courage in thus destroying the race of Panaturi, and a report also of his manly beauty, chanced to reach the ears of a young maiden of the heavenly race who live above in the skies. So one night she descended from the heavens to visit Tawaki, and to judge for herself, whether these reports were true. She found him lying sound asleep, and after gazing on him for some time, she stole to his side and laid herself down by him. He, when disturbed by her, thought that it was only some female of this lower world, and slept again, but before dawn the young girl stole away again from his side, and ascended once more to the heavens. In the early morning Tawaki awoke and felt all over his sleeping place with both his hands, but in vain, he could nowhere find the young girl. 
From that time Tango Tango, six the girl of the heavenly race, stole every night to the side of Tawaki, and lo, in the morning she was gone, until she found that she had conceived a child, who was afterwards named Arahuda. Then full of love for Tawaki, she disclosed herself fully to him and lived constantly in this world with him, deserting, for his sake, her friends above. And he discovered that she who had so loved him belonged to the race whose home is in the heavens. Whilst thus living with him, this girl of the heavenly race, his second wife, said to him, Oh, Tawaki, if our baby so shortly now to be born, should prove a son, I will wash the little thing before it is baptized. But if it should be a little girl then you shall wash it. When the time came Tango Tango had a little girl, and before it was baptized Tawaki took it to a spring to wash it, and afterwards held it away from him as if it smelt badly, and said, Fa, how badly the little thing smells. Then Tango Tango, when she heard this said of her own dear little baby, began to sob and cry bitterly, and at last rose up from her place with her child, and began to take flight towards the sky. But she paused for one minute with one foot resting upon the carved figure at the end of the ridge pole of the house above the door. Then Tawaki rushed forward, and springing up tried to catch hold of his young wife, but missing her, he entreatingly besought her, Mother of my child, oh, return once more to me. But she in reply called down to him, No, no, I shall now never return to you again. Tawaki once more called up to her, At least, then, leave me some one remembrance of you. Then his young wife called down to him, These are my parting words of remembrance to you take care that you lay not hold with your hands of the loose root of the creeper, which dropping from aloft sways to and fro in the air. But rather lay fast hold on that which hanging down from on high has again struck its fibers into the earth. Then she floated up into the air, and vanished from his sight. Tawaki remained plunged in grief, for his heart was torn by regrets for his wife and his little girl. One moon had waned after her departure, when Tawaki, unable longer to endure such sufferings, called out to his younger brother, to Karihi, saying, Oh, brother, shall we go and search for my little girl? And Karihi consented, saying, Yes, let us go. So they departed, taking two slaves with them as companions for their journey. When they reached the pathway along which they intended to travel, Tawaki said to the two slaves who were accompanying himself and his brother, You being unclean or unconsecrated persons must be careful when we come to the place where the road passes the fortress of Tongamia. Not to look up at it for it is enchanted, and some evil will befall you if you do. They then went along the road, and when they came to the place mentioned by Tawaki, one of the slaves looked up at the fortress, and his eye was immediately torn out by the magical arts of Tongamia, and he perished. Tawaki and Karihi then went upon the road accompanied by only one slave. They at last reached the spot where the ends of the vines which hung down from heaven reached the earth, and they there found an old woman who was quite blind. She was appointed to take care of the vines, and she sat at the place where they touched the earth, and held the ends of one of them in her hands. This old lady was at the moment employed in counting some taro roots, which she was about to have cooked, and as she was blind she was not aware of the strangers who stole quietly and silently up to her. There were ten taro roots lying in a heap before her. She began to count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Just at this moment Tawaki quietly slipped away the tenth, the old lady felt everywhere for it, but she could not find it. She thought she must have made some mistake, and so began to count her taro over again very carefully. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Just then Tawaki had slipped away the ninth. She was now quite surprised, so she counted them over again quite slowly, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And as she could not find the two that were missing, she at last guessed that somebody was playing a trick upon her, so she pulled her weapon out, which she always sat upon to keep it safe, and standing up turned round. Feeling about her as she moved, to try if she could find Tawaki and Karihi. But they very gently stooped down to the ground and lay close there, so that her weapon passed over them, and she could not feel anybody, when she had thus swept her weapon all round her, she sat down and put it under her again. 
Karihi then struck her a blow upon the face, and she, quite frightened, threw up her bands to her face, pressing them on the place where she had been struck, and crying out, Oh! Who did that? Tawaki then touched both her eyes, and, lo, she was at once restored to sight, and saw quite plainly, and she knew her grandchildren and wept over them. When the old lady had finished weeping over them, she asked, Where are you going to? And Tawaki answered, I go to seek my little girl. She replied, But where is she? He answered, Above there, in the skies. Then she replied, But what made her go to the skies? And Tawaki answered, Her mother came from heaven. She was the daughter of Wadatiri Madakataka. The old lady then pointed to the vines and said to them, Up there, then, lies your road. But do not begin the ascent so late in the day, wait until tomorrow, for the morning, and then commence to climb up. He consented to follow this good advice, and called out to his slave, Cook some food for us. The slave began at once to cook food, and when it was dressed, they all partook of it and slept there that night. At the first peep of dawn Tawaki called out to his slave, Cook some food for us, that we may have strength to undergo the fatigues of this great journey. And when their meal was finished, Tawaki took his slave, and presented him to the old woman, as an acknowledgement for her great kindness to them. The old woman then called out to him, as he was starting, There lies the ascent before you, lay fast hold of the vine with your hands, and climb on. But when you get midway between heaven and earth, take care not to look down upon this lower world again, lest you become charmed and giddy, and fall down. Take care, also, that you do not by mistake lay hold of the vine which swings loose. But rather lay hold of the one which hanging down from above, has again firmly struck root into the earth. Just at that moment Karihi made a spring at the vines to catch them, and by mistake caught hold of the loose one, and away he swung to the very edge of the horizon, but a blast of wind blew forth from thence. And drove him back to the other side of the skies. On reaching that point, Another strong land wind swept him right up heavenwards, and down he was blown again by the currents of air from above, then just as he reached near the earth again, Tawaki called out, Now, my brother. Loose your hands, now is the time. And he did so, and, lo, he stood upon the earth once more, and the two brothers wept together over Karihi's narrow escape from destruction. And when they had ceased lamenting, Tawaki, who was alarmed lest any disaster should overtake his younger brother, said to him, It is my desire that you should return home, to take care of our families and our dependents. Thereupon Karihi at once returned to the village of their tribe, as his eldest brother directed him. Tawaki now began to climb the ascent to heaven, and the old blind woman called out to him as he went up, Hold fast, my child. Let your hands hold tight. And Tawaki made use of, and kept on repeating, a powerful incantation as he climbed up to the heavens, to preserve him from the dangers of that difficult and terrible road. At length he reached the heavens, and pulled himself up into them, and then by enchantments he disguised himself, and changed his handsome and noble appearance, and assumed the likeness of a very ugly old man. And he followed the road he had at first struck upon, and entered a dense forest into which it ran, and still followed it until he came to a place in the forest where his brothers-in-law, with a party of their people, were hewing canoes from the trunks of trees. And they saw him, and little thinking who he was, called out, Here's an old fellow will make a nice slave for us, but Tawaki went quietly on, and when he reached them he sat down with the people who were working at the canoes. It now drew near evening, and his brothers-in-law finished their work, and called out to him, Ho! Old fellow, there, you just carry these heavy axes home for us, will you? Seven he at once consented to do this, and they gave him the axes. The old man then said to them, You go on in front, do not mind, I am old and heavy laden, I cannot travel fast. So they started off, the old man following slowly behind. When his brothers-in-law and their people were all out of sight, he turned back to the canoe, and taking an axe just adds the canoe rapidly along from the bow to the stem, and lo, one side of the canoe was finished. Then he took the adze again, and ran it rapidly along the other side of the canoe, from the bow to the stem, and lo, that side also was beautifully finished. 
He then walked quietly along the road again, like an old man, carrying the axes with him, and went on for some time without seeing anything. But when B drew near the village, he found two women from the village in the forest gathering firewood, and as soon as they saw him, one of them observed to her companion, I say here is a curious looking old fellow, is he not? And her companion exclaimed, He shall be our slave, to which the first answered, Make him carry the firewood for us, then. So they took Tawaki, and laid a load of firewood upon his back, and made him carry that as well as the axes, so was this mighty chief treated as a slave, even by female slaves. When they all reached the village, the two women called out, We've caught an old man for a slave. Then Tango Tango exclaimed in reply, That's right bring him along with you, then, he'll do for all of us. Little did his wife Tango Tango think that the slave they were so insulting, and whom she was talking about in such a way, was her own husband Tawaki. When Tawaki saw Tango Tango sitting at a fireplace near the upper end of the house with their little girl, he went straight up to the place, and all the persons present tried to stop him, calling out, Ho! Ho! Take care what you are doing. Do not go there, you will become tapooed from sitting near Tango Tango. But the old man, without minding them, went rapidly straight on, and carried his load of firewood right up to the very fire of Tango Tango. Then they all said, There, the old fellow is Tapu, it is his own fault. But Tango Tango had not the least idea that this was Tawaki. And yet there were her husband and herself seated, the one upon the one side, the other upon the opposite side of the very same fire. They all stopped in the house until the sun rose next morning. Then at daybreak his brothers-in-law called out to him, Haloa. Old man, you bring the axes along, do you hear? So the old man took up the axes, and started with them, and they all went off together to the forest, to work at dubbing out their canoes. When they reached them, and the brothers-in-law saw the canoe which Tawaki had worked at, they looked at it with astonishment, saying, Why, the canoe is not at all as we left it, who can have been working at it? At last, when their wonder was somewhat abetted, they all sat down, and set to work again to dub out another canoe, and worked until evening, when they again called out to the old man as on the previous one, Haloa. Old fellow, come here, and carry the axes back to the village again. As before, he said, yes, and when they started he remained behind, and after the others were all out of sight he took an axe, and began again to add away at the canoe they had been working at. And having finished his work he returned again to the village, and once more walked straight up to the fire of Tango Tango, and remained there until the sun rose upon the following morning. When they were all going at early dawn to work at their canoes as usual, they again called out to Tawaki, Haloa. Old man, just bring these axes along with you. And the old man went patiently and silently along with them, carrying the axes on his shoulder. When they reached the canoe they were about to work at, the brothers-in-law were quite astonished on seeing it, and shouted out, Why, here again, this canoe, too, is not at all as it was when we left it, who can have been at work at it? Having wondered at this for some time, they at length sat down and set to again to dub out another canoe, and labored away until evening, when a thought came into their minds that they would hide themselves in the forest. And wait to see who it was came every evening to work at their canoe. And Tawaki overheard them arranging this plan. They therefore started as if they were going home, and when they had got a little way they turned off the path on one side, and hid themselves in the thick clumps of bushes, in a place from whence they could see the canoes. Then Tawaki, going a little way back into the forest, stripped off his old cloaks, and threw them on one side, and then repeating the necessary incantations he put off his disguise, and took again his own appearance. And made himself look noble and handsome, and commenced his work at the canoe. Then his brothers-in-law, when they saw him so employed, said one to another, Ah, that must be the old man whom we made a slave of who is working away at our canoe. But again they called to one another and said, Come here, come here, just watch, why he is not in the least like that old man. Then they said amongst themselves, This must be a demigod. And, without showing themselves to him, they ran off to the village, and as soon as they reached it they asked their sister Tango Tango to describe her husband for them. 
and she described his appearance as well as she could, representing him just like the man they had seen, and they said to her, Yes, that must be he, he is exactly like him you have described to us. Their sister replied, Then that chief must certainly be your brother-in-law. Just at this moment Tawaki reappeared at the village, having again disguised himself, and changed his appearance into that of an ugly old man. But Tango Tango immediately questioned him, saying, Now tell me, who are you? Tawaki made no reply, but walked on straight towards her. She asked him again, Tell me, are you Tawaki? He murmured, Humph. In assent, still walking on until he reached the side of his wife, and then he snatched up his little daughter, and, holding her fast in his arms, pressed her to his heart. The persons present all rushed out of the courtyard of the house to the neighboring courtyards, for the whole place was made tapibi tawaki. And murmurs of gratification and surprise arose from the people upon every side at the splendor of his appearance. For in the days when he had been amongst them as an old man his figure was very different from the resplendent aspect which he presented on this day. Then he retired to rest with his wife, and said to her, I came here that our little daughter might be made to undergo the ceremonies usual for the children of nobles, to secure them good fortune and happiness in this life. And Tango Tango consented. When in the morning the sun arose, they broke out an opening through the end of the house opposite to the door, that the little girl's rank might be seen by her being carried out that way instead of through the usual entrance to the house. And they repeated the prescribed prayers when she was carried through the wall out of the house. The prayers and incantations being finished, lightnings flashed from the armpits of Tawaki. Eight then they carried the little girl to the water, and plunged her into it, and repeated a baptismal incantation over her. Rupees ascent into heaven. We left Hinori floating out into the ocean nine, we now return to her adventures, for many months she floated through the sea, and was at last thrown up by the surf on the beach at a place named Wairarua. She was there found, lying as if dead, upon the sandy shore, by two brothers named Iwatamai and Ihuerwer. Her body was in many parts overgrown with seaweed and barnacles, from the length of time she had been in the water, but they could still see some traces of her beauty, and pitying the young girl, they lifted her up in their arms. And carried her home to their house, and laid her down carefully by the side of a fire, and scraped off very gently the seaweed and barnacles from her body, and thus by degrees restored her. When she had quite recovered, Iwatamai and Ihuerwer looked upon her with pleasure, and took her as a wife between them both, they then asked her to tell them who she was, and what was her name. This she did not disclose to them, but she changed her name, and called herself Ihungarupia, or the Stranded Log of Timber. After she had lived with these two brothers for a long time, Ihuerwer went to pay a visit to his superior chief, Tinaro, and to relate the adventures which had happened. And when Tinara heard all that had taken place, he went to bring away the young stranger as a wife for himself, and she was given up to him. But before she was so given to him, she had conceived a child by Iwatamai, and when she went to live with Tinara it was near the time when the child should be born. Tinara took her home with him to his residence on an island called Motutapu, he had two other wives living there they were the daughters of Mangamanga Iachua, and their names were Haritonga and Horatata. Now, when these two women saw the young stranger coming along in their husband's company, as if she was his wife, they could not endure it, and they abused Hinori on account of her conduct with their husband. At last they proceeded so far as to attempt to strike her, and to kill her, and they cursed her bitterly. When they treated her in this manner the heart of Hinori became gloomy with grief and mortification, so she began to utter incantations against them. And repeated one so powerful that hardly had she finished it when the two women fell flat on the ground with the soles of their feet projecting upwards, and lay quite dead upon the earth, and her husband was thus left free for her alone. All this time Hinori was lost to her friends and home, and her young brother Moemua, afterwards called Rupi, could do nothing but think of her. An excessive love for his sister, and sorrow at her departure, so harassed him, that he said he could no longer remain at rest, but that he must go and seek for his sister. So he departed upon this undertaking, and visited every place he could think of without missing one of them, yet could he nowhere find his sister. 
At last, Rupi thought that B would ascend to the heavens to consult his great ancestor Rahua, who dwelt there at a place named Te Putahainui Orahua, and in fulfillment of this design he began his ascent to the heavenly regions. Rupi continued his ascent, seeking everywhere hastily for Rahua. At last, he reached a place where people were dwelling, and when he saw them, he spoke to them, saying, Are the heavens above this inhabited? And the people dwelling there answered him, They are inhabited. And he again asked them, Can I reach those heavens? And they replied, You cannot reach them, the heavens above these are those the boundaries of which were fixed by Tain. But Rupi forced a way up through those heavens, and got above them, and found an inhabited place, and he asked the inhabitants of it, saying, Are the heavens above these inhabited? And the people answered him, They are inhabited. And he again asked, Do you think I can reach them? And they replied, No, you will not be able to reach them, those heavens were fixed there by Tain. Rupi, however, forced a way through those heavens too, and thus he continued to do until he reached the tenth heaven, and there he found the abode of Rahua. When Rahua saw a stranger approaching, he went forward and gave him the usual welcome, lamenting over him. Rahua made his lamentation without knowing who the stranger was, but Rupi in his lament made use of prayers by which he enabled Rahua to guess who he was. When they had each ended their lamentation, Rahua called to his servants, light a fire, and get everything ready for cooking food. The slaves soon made the fire burn up brightly, and brought hollow calabashes, all ready to have food placed in them, and laid them down before Rahua. All this time Rupi was wondering whence the food was to come from with which the calabashes, which the slaves had brought, were to be filled. But presently he observed that Rahua was slowly loosening the thick bands which enveloped his locks around and upon the top of his head. And when his long locks all floated loosely, he shook the dense masses of his hair, and forth from them came flying flocks of the toy birds, which had been nestling there, feeding upon lice. And as they flew forth, the slaves caught and killed them, and filled the calabashes with them, and took them to the fire, and put them on to cook, and when they were done, they carried them and laid them before Rupi as a present. And then placed them beside him that he might eat, and Rahua requested him to eat food, but Rupi answered him, Nay, but I cannot eat this food. I saw these birds loosened and take wing from thy locks, who would dare to eat birds that had fed upon lice in thy sacred head. For the reasons he thus stated, Rupi feared that man of ancient days, and the calabashes still stood near him untouched. At last Rupi ventured to ask Rahua, saying, O Rahua, has a confused murmur of voices from the world below reached you upon any subject regarding which I am interested? And Rahua answered him, Yes, such a murmuring of distant voices has reached me from the island of Motutapu in the world below these. When Rupi heard this, he immediately by his enchantments changed himself into a pigeon, and took flight downwards towards the island of Motutapu. On, on he flew, until he reached the island, and the dwelling of Tinaro, and then he alighted right upon the window sill of his house. Some of Tinaro's people saw him, and exclaimed, Ha! Ha, there's a bird, there's a bird! Whilst some called out, Make haste, spear him, spear him, and one threw a spear at him, but he turned it aside with his bill, and it passed on one side of him, and struck the piece of wood on which he was sitting, and the spear was broken. Then they saw that it was no use to try to spear the bird, so they made a noose, and endeavored to slip it gently over his head, but he turned his head on one side, and they found that they could not snare him. His young sister now suspected something, so she said to the people who were trying to kill or snare the bird, Leave the bird quiet for a minute until I look at it. And when she had looked well at it, she knew that it was her brother, so she asked him, saying, What is the cause which has made you thus come here? And the pigeon immediately began to open and shut its little bill, as if it was trying to speak. His young sister now called out to Tinaro, Oh, husband, here is your brother-in-law, and her husband said in reply, What is his name? And she answered, It is my brother Rupi. It happened that upon this very day, Hinori's little child was born, then Rupi repeated this form of greeting to his sister, the name of which is Toitotu. Hinori. Hinori is the sister. And Rupi is her brother. But how came he here? Came he by traveling on the earth? 
or came he through the air? Let your path be through the air. As soon as Rupi had ceased his lamentation of welcome to his sister, she commenced hers, and answered him, saying, Rupi is the brother. And Hina is his young sister. But how came he here? Came he by travelling on the earth? Or came he through the air? Let your path be now upwards through the air. To Rahua. Hardly had his young sister finished repeating this poem, before Rupi had caught her up with her newborn baby, in a moment they were gone. Thus the brother and sister departed together, with the infant, carrying with them the placenta to bury it with the usual rites. And they ascended up to Rahua, and as they passed through the air, the placenta was accidentally dropped, and falling into the sea, was devoured by a shark. And this circumstance was what caused the multitude of large eggs which are now found in the inside of the shark. At length the brother and sister arrived at the dwelling place of Rahua, which was called Te Pudahainui The old man was unable to keep his courtyard clean for himself, and his people neglected to do so from idleness. Thus it was left in a very filthy state. Rupi, who was displeased at seeing this, one day said to Rahua, Oh, Rahua, they leave this courtyard of yours in a very filthy state. And then he added, Your people are such a set of lazy rogues, that if every mess of dirt was a lizard, I doubt if they could even take the trouble to touch its tail to make it run away, and this saying passed into a proverb. At last, Rupi thought that he could clean and beautify, in some respects, Rahua's dwelling for him, so he made two wooden shovels for his work, one of which he called Tahitahia, and the other Rekrekia. And with them he quite cleansed and purified Rahua's courtyard. He then added a building to Rahua's dwelling, but fixing one of the beams of it badly, Rahua's son Kaitangada, was one day killed from hanging on to this beam, which giving way and springing back, he was thrown down and died. And his blood running about over part of the heaven stained them, and formed what we now call a ruddiness in the sky. When, therefore, a red and ruddy tinge is seen in the heavens, men say, Ah! Kaitangada stained the heavens with his blood. Rupi's first name was Maui Mua, it was after he was transformed into a bird that he took the name of Rupi.10. Case Theft of the Whale Soon after Tuhuruhuru was born, Tinara endeavored to find a skillful magician, who might perform the necessary enchantments and incantations to render the child a fortunate and successful warrior. And K was the name of the old magician, whom some of his friends brought to him for this purpose. In due time K arrived at the village where Tinara lived, and he performed the proper enchantments with fitting ceremonies over the infant. When all these things had been rightly concluded, Tinara gave a signal to a pet whale that he had tamed, to come on shore, this whale's name was Tutunui. When it knew that its master wanted it, it left the ocean in which it was sporting about, and came to the shore, and its master laid hold of it, and cut a slice of its flesh off to make a feast for the old magician, and he cooked it. And gave a portion of it to Kay, who found it very savory, and praised the dish very much. Shortly afterwards, Kay said it was necessary for him to return to his own village, which was named Te Tihio Manono. So Tinara ordered a canoe to be got ready for him to take him back, but Kay made excuses, and said he did not like to go back in the canoe, and remained where he was. This, however, was a mere trick upon his part, his real object being to get Tinara to permit him to go back upon the whale, upon Tutunui, for he now knew how savory the flesh of that fish was. At last Tinara lent Tutunui to the old magician to carry him home, but he gave him very particular directions, telling him, when you get so near the shore, that the fish touches the bottom, it will shake itself to let you know, and you must then. Without any delay, jump off it upon the right side. He then wished Kay farewell, and the old magician started, and away went the whale through the water with him. When they came close to the shore at Kay's village, and the whale felt the bottom, it shook itself as a sign to Kay to jump off and wade ashore, but it was of no use. The old magician stuck fast to the whale, and pressed it down against the bottom as hard as he could, in vain the fish continued to shake itself. Kay held on to it, and would not jump off, and in its struggles the blowholes of Tatunui got stopped up with sand, and it died. Kay and his people then managed to drag up the body of Tatunui on shore, intending to feast upon it. 
And this circumstance became afterwards the cause of a war against that tribe, who were called, the descendants of Papahoraqua. When they had dragged to Tunui on shore, they cut its body up and cooked it in ovens, covering the flesh up with the fragrant leaves of the Koromiko before they heaped earth upon the ovens. And the fat of Tutunui adhered to the leaves of the Koromiko, and they continue greasy to this day, so that if Koromiko boughs are put upon the fire and become greasy, the proverb says, there's some of the savoriness of Tutunui. Tinara continued anxiously to look for the return of Tutunui and when a long time had elapsed without its coming back again, he began to say to himself, well, I wonder where my whale can be stopping. But when Kay and his people had cooked the flesh of the whale, and the ovens were opened, a savory scent was wafted across the sea to Tinaro, and both he and his wife smelt it quite plainly. And then they knew very well that Kay had killed the pet which they had tamed for their little darling to Huruhuru, and that he had eaten it. Without any delay, Tinara's people dragged down to the sea a large canoe which belonged to one of his wives, and forty women forthwith embarked in it. None but women went, as this would be less likely to excite any suspicion in Kay that they had come with a hostile object. Amongst them were Hainaiti Iwaiwa, Rakatori, Rakatamia, Itiaitai, Rikarika, and Ruahauatangaroa, and other females of note, whose names have not been preserved. Just before the canoe started Tinara's youngest sister asked him, What are the marks by which we shall know Kay? And he answered her, Oh, you cannot mistake him, his teeth are uneven and all overlap one another. Well, away they paddled, and in due time they arrived at the village of the old magician Kay, and his tribe all collected to see the strangers. Towards night, when it grew dark, a fire was lighted in the house of Kay, and a crowd collected inside it, until it was filled, one side was quite occupied with the crowd of visitors, and the other side of the house with the people of Kay's tribe. The old magician himself sat at the foot of the main pillar which supported the roof of the house, and mats were laid down there for him to sleep on, but the strangers did not yet know which was Kay. For it did not accord with the Maori's rules of politeness to ask the names of the chiefs, it being supposed from their fame and greatness that they are known by everybody. In order to find out which was K, Tinara's people had arranged, that they would try by wit and fun to make everybody laugh, and when the people opened their mouths, to watch which of them had uneven teeth that lapped across one another. And thus discover which was K. In order, therefore, to make them laugh, Rakatori exhibited all her amusing tricks and games, she made them sing and play upon the flute, and upon the pewterino, and beat time with castanets of bone and wood whilst they sang. And they played at Mora, and the kind of ti in which many motions are made with the fingers and hands, and the kind of ti in which, whilst the players sing, they rapidly throw short sticks to one another, keeping time to the tune which they are singing. And she played upon an instrument like a Jew's harp for them, and made puppets dance, and made them all sing whilst they played with large whiz gigs, and after they had done all these things, the man they thought was Kay had never even once laughed. Then the party who had come from Tinaraz, all began to consult together, and to say what can we do to make that fellow laugh, and for a long time they thought of some plan by which they might take Kay in, and make him laugh. At last they thought of one, which was, that they should all sing a droll comic song, so suddenly they all began to sing together, at the same time making curious faces, and shaking their hands and arms in time to the tune. When they had ended their song, the old magician could not help laughing out quite heartily, and those who were watching him closely at once recognized him, for there they saw pieces of the flesh of Tutunui still sticking between his teeth. And his teeth were uneven and all overlapped one another. From this circumstance a proverb has been preserved among the Maoris to the present day for if any one on listening to a story told by another is amused at it and laughs, one of the bystanders says, Ah, there's Kay laughing. No sooner did the women who had come from Tinara see the flesh of Tutunui sticking in Kay's teeth than they made an excuse for letting the fire burn dimly in the house, saying, that they wanted to go to sleep their real object, however. Being to be able to perform their enchantments without being seen. But the old magician who suspected something, took two round pieces of mother-of-pearl shell, and stuck one in the socket of each eye, so that the strangers, observing the faint rays of light reflected from the surface of the mother-of-pearl, might think they saw the white of his eyes, 
and that he was still awake. The women from Tinaraz went on, however, with their enchantments, and by their magical arts threw every one in the house into an enchanted sleep, with the intention, when they had done this, of carrying off Kay by stealth. So soon as Kay and the people in the house were all deep in this enchanted sleep, the women ranged themselves in a long row, the whole way from the place where Kay was sleeping down to their canoe. They all stood in a straight line, with a little interval between each of them. And then two of them went to fetch Kay, and lifted the old magician gently up, rolled up in his cloaks, just as B had laid himself down to sleep, and placed him gently in the arms of those who stood near the door, who passed him on to two others. And thus they handed him on from one to another, until he at last reached the arms of the two women who were standing in the canoe ready to receive him. And they laid him down very gently in the canoe, fast asleep as he was, and thus the old magician K was carried off by Hainaiti Iwaiwa and Rakatori. When the women reached the village of Tinara in their canoe, they again took up K, and carried him very gently up to the house of Tinara, and laid him down fast asleep close to the central pillar, which supported the ridge pole of the house. So that the place where he slept in the house of Tinara was exactly like his sleeping place in his own house. The house of K was, however, a large circular house, without a ridge pole, but with rafters springing from the central pillar, running down like rays to low side posts in the circular wall. Whilst the house of Tinara was a long house, with a ridge pole running the entire length of the roof, and resting upon the pillar in its center. When Tinara heard that the old magician had been brought to his village, he caused orders to be given to his tribe that when B made his appearance in the morning, going to the house where K was. They should all call out loud, Here comes Tinara, here comes Tinara, as if he was coming as a visitor into the village of K, so that the old magician on hearing them might think that he was still at home. At broad daylight next morning, when Tinara's people saw him passing along through the village towards his house, they all shouted aloud, here come Tinaro, here comes Tinaro. And Kay, who heard the cries, started up from his enchanted sleep quite drowsy and confused, whilst Tinaro passed straight on, and sat down just outside the door of his house, so that he could look into it, and, looking in, he saw Kay. And saluted him, saying, Salutations to you, O Kay. And then he asked him, saying, How came you here? And the old magician replied, Nay, but rather how came you here? Tinaro replied, Just look, then, at the house, and see if you recognize it. But Kay, who was still stupefied by his sleep, looking round, saw he was lying in his own place at the foot of the pillar, and said, This is my house. Tinaro asked him, Where was the window placed in your house? Kay started and looked. The whole appearance of his house appeared to be changed, he at once guessed the truth, that the house he was in belonged to Tinaro. And the old magician, who saw that his hour had come, bowed down his head in silence to the earth, and they seized him, and dragged him out, and slew him, thus perished Kay. The news of his death at last reached his tribe the descendants of Papahoraqua, and they eventually attacked the fortress of Tinaro with a large army, and avenged the death of Kay by slaying Tinaro's son. The Murder of Tuakararo how he was murdered and avenged. Now about this time Tuhuruhuru, the son of Rupi's sister, grew up to man's estate, and he married Apakura, and she gave birth to a son whom they named Tuakararo. And afterwards to a daughter named Meradia. She had then several other children, then she gave birth to Wakatapatiki, afterwards her last child was born, and its name was Riamachua. When Meradia grew up, she was married to the son of a chief named Papahoraqua, the chief of the Atihapai tribe, and she accompanied her husband to his home. But Tuakararo remained at his own village, and after a time he longed to see his sister, and thought he would go and pay her a visit. So he went, and arrived at a very large house belonging to the tribe Papahoraqua, the name of which was Teuaruomanono, all the family and dependents of Papahoraqua lived in that house, and Tuakararo remained there with them. It happened that a young sister of his brother-in-law, whose name was Moria, took a great fancy to him, and showed that she liked him, although, at the very time, she was carrying on a courtship with another young man of the Adihapai tribe. Whilst Tuakararo was on this visit to his brother-in-law, 
some of the young men of the Atihapai tribe asked him one day to wrestle with them, and he, agreeing to this, stood up to wrestle. And the one who came forward as his competitor was the sweetheart of his brother-in-law's young sister. Tuakararo laid hold of the young man, and soon gave him a severe fall. That match being over they both stood up again, and Tuakararo, lifting him in his arms, gave him another severe fall. And all the young people of the Atihapai tribe burst out laughing at the youth, for having had two such heavy falls from Tuakararo, and he sat down upon the ground, looking very foolish. And feeling exceedingly sulky and provoked at being laughed at by everybody. Tuakararo, having also finished wrestling, sat down too, and began to put on his clothes again, and whilst he was in the act of putting his head through his cloak, the young man he had thrown in wrestling ran up. And just as his head appeared through the cloak threw a handful of sand in his eyes. Tuakararo, wild with pain, could see nothing, and began to rub his eyes, to get the dust out and to ease the anguish, the young man then struck him on the head, and killed him. The people of the Atihapai tribe then ran in upon him and cut his body up, and afterwards devoured it, and they took his bones, and hung them up in the roof, under the ridge pole of their house, Teyuaruomanono. Whilst they were hung up there the bones rattled together, and his sister heard them, and it seemed to her as if they made a sound like, Topororo, Topororo. And she listened again to the rattling of the bones, and again she heard the words, Topororo, Topororo. And the sister of Tuakararo looking up to the bones, said, You rattle in vain, O bones of him who was devoured by the Adihapai tribe, for who is there to lament over him or to avenge his death? At last the news of the sad event which had taken place reached the ears of his brother, Wakatapatiki, and of his other brothers, and when they bearded it they were grieved and pained at the fate of their brother. And at last Wakata Patiki adopted a firm resolution to go and avenge Tuakararo's death, and as the rest of his tribe agreed in this purpose, they began without delay to build canoes for its execution. They named some of their canoes the Wiratoa, the Tapatapahukari, the Taroai Taipakihai, the Hakarir, and the Mahuno Wadia, and to all the other canoes which they prepared for this purpose they also gave names. And when they had finished lashing on the top boards of their canoes, their mother Apakura, with all her female attendants, began to beat and prepare fern root for the warriors to carry with them as provisions for their voyage. And whilst the females were thus engaged in beating and preparing fern root for the war party who were about to start to revenge the death of Tuakararo, they kept on repeating a lament for the young man which might rouse the feelings of the warriors. Lo, the army of Wakatapatiki now embarked. They started in a thousand canoes, and floated out into the open sea, and proceeding upon their course, they landed at a certain place which lay in their route, and there the army of Wakata had a review. To show how well they could go through their maneuvers. They were formed into columns, and one column, with fierce shouts and yells, after a war dance, sprang upon the supposed enemy, and whilst they were thus engaged with their imaginary foe, a second column, with wild cries, advanced to their support. Then the first column of warriors retired to reform and thus column after column feigned to charge their foes. Then one body of the warriors rushed to an adjoining creek and tried to jump across it, but they could not. A band of men under Wakata's immediate command were sitting upon the ground watching the others, and when the first body gave up in despair all thoughts of overleaping the creek, this chosen band of Wakata rose from the ground, started forward, reached in good order the edge of the creek, and sprang easily across it the whole body of them to the other side. When the review was ended, Wakata made a speech to the warriors, saying, Warriors, all of you listen to me. We will not finish our voyage until the dark night, lest we should be seen by the people we are about to attack, and thus fail in surprising them. Just as it was dark, Wakata ordered his own chosen band of warriors to go and pull the plugs out of all the canoes but their own, and they, in obedience to his orders, went round and pulled all the plugs out of the canoes. And thus they did to the whole of them without missing a single canoe of the whole thousand. This having been done, Wakata called aloud to the whole force, Now my men, let us embark at once this very night. Then the warriors hurriedly arose in the darkness, and all was confusion and noise, and one canoe was launched, and then another, and another, until all were afloat on the sea. 
Then they all embarked, and the several crews sprang cheerfully into their own canoes. But lo, presently the canoes all began to sink, one after the other, and the crews were compelled again to seek the shore, and to busy themselves there in repairing them. In the meantime the chosen band of warriors of Wakata urged on their canoes, leaving the others behind, and when they drew near the place where the house called Te Uaruomanono was situated, they landed. Then the warriors silently surrounded the house in ranks throughout its whole circumference, and each of the eight doors of the house they guarded by a band of men, and Wakata laid hold of a man named Hayoi, whom they caught outside of the house. And he questioned him, saying, Where is my sister now? And Hayoi answered him, She is in the house. And he asked him again, In what part of the house does Papahoraqua sleep? Hayoi replied, At the foot of the large pillar which supports the ridge pole of the house. Wakata next asked, Has he any distinguishing mark by which we may know him? Hayoi answered, You may know him by one of his teeth being broken. Wakata asked him one question more, saying, In what part of the house does my sister sleep? And Hayoi answered him, She sleeps close to that door. Wakata Patiki asked him no further question, but took the fellow and cut out his tongue, and when he had done so he made him talk, and he still spoke quite distinctly, although a great part of his tongue was cut out. Wakata then took him again, and cut his tongue off quite close to the root, and he made him try to talk again, and nothing but an indistinct mumbling could be heard, so he then ordered the man into the house to send his sister out to him. Hayoi went as he was told to send Wakata's sister to him, for she was then in Te Uaruomanono, the house of her father-in-law, Papahoraqua. When he got inside, the whole mass of the Atihapai tribe who were sitting saw him come in, and some of them asked him where he had been to, and what he had gone for. But what was the use of their talking to him, since B could do nothing but mumble out indistinct words in reply, and those who were sitting near him wondered what could be the matter. But the sister of Wakata guessed in a moment that this was some device of her brother's, and at once went out of the house, and found Wakata, and she and her brother wept together, partly from joy at their meeting. Partly from sorrow in thinking of the melancholy death of their brother since they had last met. When they had done weeping, Wakata asked her, In what part of the house does Papahoraqua sleep? And she answered him, He sleeps at the foot of the large pillar which supports the ridge pole of the house. And then she added, But oh, my brother, a great part of the Atihapai tribe have seen you before, and they will know you. Her brother then asked her, What then do you think I had better do? His sister answered, You had better cut your hair quite short to disguise yourself. He consented to this being done, so his sister cut his hair quite close for him, and when she had done this she rubbed his face all over with charcoal, and then he and his sister went together into the house. The fire in the house had got quite low some time before, and when they entered, the people near where they went in, cried out, Make up the fire, make up the fire, here's a stranger, here's a stranger. So they blew up the fire and made it bum brightly, and many of them came to see Wakata Patiki, and when they had looked well at him, they broke out laughing, and said, What a black-looking fellow he is. Even Papa Horikwa burst out laughing at his appearance, and Wakata, when he saw him laugh, at once recognized him by his broken tooth. Wakata Patiki had taken a stout rope with him when he went into the house, and he held this ready coiled in his hand, with a noose at one end of it. And as soon as he recognized Papa Horikwa, he slyly dropped the noose over his head, and suddenly hauling it tight, it got fast round his neck, then, still holding the rope in his hand, and lengthening it by degrees as he went. Wakata and his sister rushed out of the house. And he still hauling with all his strength on the rope, climbed up on the roof, repeating a powerful incantation. Then each warrior sprang up into his place from the ground, on which they had been lying down to conceal themselves, and they set fire to the house in several places at once, and slaughtered all those who tried to escape. Thus they burnt Te Uaruomanono, and all those who were in it, and then the warriors returned, and carried with them joyful news to Apakura, the mother of Tuakararo. The Legend of Rada His Adventures with the Enchanted Tree and Revenge of His Father's Murder Before Tawaki ascended up into the heavens, a son named Wahiroa had been born to him by his first wife. As soon as Wahiroa grew to man's estate, 
he took Karah for a wife, and she bore him a son whom they called Rada. Wahieroa was slain treacherously by a chief named Matukata Kotako, but his son Rada was born some time before his death. It therefore became his duty to revenge the death of his father Wahieroa, and Rada having grown up, at last devised a plan for doing this, he therefore gave the necessary orders to his dependents. At the same time saying to them, I am about to go in search of the man who slew my father. He then started upon a journey for this purpose, and at length arrived at the entrance to the place of Matukuta Kotako. Be found there a man who was left in charge of it, sitting at the entrance to the courtyard, and he asked him, saying, Where is the man who killed my father? The man who was left in charge of the place answered him, He lives beneath in the earth there, and I am left here by him, to call to him and warn him when the new moon appears. At that season he rises and comes forth upon the earth, and devours men as his food. Radha then said to him, All that you say is true, but how can he know when the proper time comes for him to rise up from the earth? The man replied, I call aloud to him. Then said Radha, When will there be a new moon? And the man who was left to take care of the place answered him, In two nights hence. Do you now return to your own village, but on the morning of the second day from this time come here again to me? Radha, in compliance with these directions, returned to his own dwelling, and waited there until the time that had been appointed him, and on the morning of that day he again journeyed along the road he had previously travelled. And found the man sitting in the same place, and he asked him, saying, Do you know any spot where I can conceal myself, and he hid from the enemy with whom I am about to fight, from Matukutakotako? The man replied, Come with me until I show you the two fountains of clear water. They then went together until they came to the two fountains. The man then said to Radha, The spot that we stand on is the place where Matuka rises up from the earth, and yonder fountain is the one in which he combs and washes his disheveled hair. But this fountain is the one he uses to reflect his face in whilst he dresses it. You cannot kill him whilst he is at the fountain he uses to reflect his face in, because your shadow would be also reflected in it, and he would see it, but at the fountain in which he washes his hair, you may smite and slay him. Radha then asked the man, Will be make his appearance from the earth this evening? And the man answered, Yes. They had not waited long there, when evening arrived, and the moon became visible, and the man said to Radha, Do you now go and hide yourself near the brink of the fountain in which he washes his hair? And Radha went and hid himself near the edge of the fountain, and the man who had been left to watch for the purpose shouted aloud, Ho, ho, the new moon is visible a moon two days old. And Matukuta Kotako heard him, and seizing his two-handed wooden sword, he rose up from the earth there, and went straight to his two fountains. Then he laid down his two-handed wooden sword on the ground, at the edge of the fountain where he dressed his hair, and kneeling down on both knees beside it, he loosened the strings which bound up his long locks, and shook out his disheveled hair. And plunged down his head into the cool clear waters of the fountain. So Radha creeping out from where he lay hid, rapidly moved up, and stood behind him, and as Matukuta Kotako raised his head from the water, Radha, with one hand seized him by the hair, while with the other he smote and slew him. Thus he avenged the death of his father Wahieroa. Radha then asked the man whom he had found in charge of the place, Where shall I find the bones of Wahieroa my father? And the keeper of the place answered him, They are not here. A strange people who live at a distance came and carried them off. Upon bearing this Radha returned to his own village, and there reflected over many designs by which B might recover the bones of his father. At length he thought of an excellent plan for this purpose, so he went into the forest and having found a very tall tree, quite straight throughout its entire length, he felled it and cut off its noble branching top. Intending to fashion the trunk into a canoe. And all the insects which inhabit trees, and the spirits of the forests, were very angry at this, and as soon as Radha had returned to the village at evening, when his day's work was ended, they all came and took the tree, and raised it up again. And the innumerable multitude of insects, birds, and spirits, who are called the offspring of Hakaturi, worked away at replacing each little chip and shaving in its proper place, and sang aloud their incantations as they worked. This was what they sang with a confused noise of various voices. Fly together, 
chips and shavings. Stick ye fast together. Hold ye fast together. Stand upright again, O tree. Early the next morning back came Radha, intending to work at hewing the trunk of his tree into a canoe. When he got to the place where he had left the trunk lying on the ground, at first he could not find it, and if that fine tall straight tree, which he saw standing whole and sound in the forest, was the same he thought he had cut down. There it was now erect again. However he stepped up to it, and manfully hewing away at it again, he felled it to the ground once more, and off he cut its fine branching top again, and began to hollow out the hold of the canoe. And to slope off its prow and the stem into their proper gracefully curved forms. And in the evening, when it became too dark to work, he returned to his village. As soon as he was gone, back came the innumerable multitudes of insects, birds, and spirits, who are called the offspring of Hakaturi, and they raised up the tree upon its stump once more, and with a confused noise of various voices. They sang incantations as they worked, and when they had ended these, the tree again stood sound as ever in its former place in the forest. The morning dawned, and Radha returned once more to work at his canoe. When he reached the place, was not he amazed to see the tree standing up in the forest, untouched, just as he had at first found it? But he, nothing daunted, hews away at it again, and down it topples crashing to the earth. As soon as he saw the tree upon the ground, Radha went off as if going home, and then turned back and hid himself in the underwood, in a spot whence he could peep out and see what took place. He had not been hidden long, when he heard the innumerable multitude of the children of Tain approaching Dai spot, singing their incantations as they came along, at last they arrived close to the place where the tree was lying upon the ground. Lo, a rush upon them is made by Radha. Ha, he has seized some of them, he shouts out to them, saying, Ha, ha, it is you, is it, then, who have been exercising your magical arts upon my tree? Then the children of Tain all cried aloud in reply, Who gave you authority to fell the forest god to the ground? You had no right to do so. When Radha heard them say this, he was quite overcome with shame at what he had done. The offspring of Tain again all called out aloud to him, Return, O Radha, to thy village, we will make a canoe for you. Radha, without delay, obeyed their orders, and as soon as he had gone they all fell to work. They were so numerous, and understood each what to do so well, that they no sooner began to add out a canoe than it was completed. When they had done this, Radha and his tribe lost no time in hauling it from the forest to the water, and the name they gave to that canoe was Rewaru. When the canoe was afloat upon the sea, 140 warriors embarked on board it, and without delay they paddled off to seek their foes, one night, just at nightfall, they reached the fortress of their enemies who were named Panaturi. When they arrived there, Radha alone landed, leaving the canoe afloat and all his warriors on board. As B stole along the shore, he saw that a fire was burning on the sacred place, where the Panaturi consulted their gods and offered sacrifices to them. Radha, without stopping, crept directly towards the fire, and bid himself behind some thick bushes of the Harakik. Eleven he then saw that there were some priests upon the other side of the same bushes, serving at the sacred place, and, to assist themselves in their magical arts, they were making use of the bones of Wahiroa. Knocking them together to beat time while they were repeating a powerful incantation, known only to themselves, the name of which was Titikura. Radha listened attentively to this incantation, until he learnt it by heart, and when he was quite sure that he knew it, he rushed suddenly upon the priests. They, surprised and ignorant of the numbers of their enemy, or whence they came, made little resistance, and were in a moment smitten and slain. The bones of his father Wahiroa were then eagerly snatched up by him. He hastened with them back to the canoe, embarked on board it, and his warriors at once paddled away, striving to reach his fortified village. In the morning some of the Panaturi repaired to their sacred place, and found their priests lying dead there, just as they were slain by Radha. So, without delay, they pursued him. A thousand warriors of their tribe followed after Radha. At length this army reached the fortress of Radha, and an engagement at once took place, in which the tribe of Radha was worsted, and sixty of its warriors slammed. 
At this moment Radha bethought him of the spell he had learned from the priests, and, immediately repeating the potent incantation, Titikura, his slain warriors were by its power once more restored to life. Then they rushed again to the combat, and the Panaturi were slaughtered by Radha and his tribe, a thousand of them the whole thousand were slam. Tehrada's task of avenging his father's death being thus ended, his tribe hauled up his large canoe on the shore, and roofed it over with thatch to protect it from the sun and weather. Radha now took Tongaradawiri as one of his wives, and she bore him a son whom he named Tuakararo, when this son came to man's estate, he took Apakura as one of his wives, and from her sprang a son named Wakato. He was not born in the manner that mortals are, but came into being in this way, one day Apakura went down upon the sea coast, and took off a little apron which she wore in front as a covering, and threw it into the ocean. And a god named Rangodakawiyu took it and shaped it, and gave it form and being, and Wakata sprang into life, and his ancestor Rangodakawiyu taught him magic and the use of enchantments of every kind. When Wakata was a little lad, his favorite amusement was flying kites. Mortals then often observed kites flying in the air, and could see nothing else, for Wakata was running about at the bottom of the waters, still holding the end of the string of the kite in his bands. One day he stole up out of the water by degrees, and at length came upon the shore, when the whole of his body was quite plainly seen by some people who were near, and they ran as fast as they could to catch him. When Wakata observed them all running to seize him, he slipped back again into the water, and continued flying his kite as before. But the people who had seen him were surprised at this strange sight, and being determined to catch him the next time he came out, they sat down upon the bank to wait for him. At last Wakata came up out of the water again, and stepped on shore once more, then the people who were watching for him, all ran at full speed to catch him. When Wakata saw them coming after him again, he cried out, You had better go and bring Apakura here, she is the only person who can catch me and hold me fast. When they heard this, one of them ran to fetch Apakura, and she came with him at once, and as soon as she saw little Wakata, she called out to him, Here I am, I am Apakura. Wakata then stopped running, and Apakura caught hold of him with her hands, and she questioned him, saying, Whom do you belong to? And Wakata answered her, I am your child. You one day threw the little apron which covered you on the sands of the sea, and the god Rangodakawiyu, my ancestor, formed me from it, and I grew up a human being, and he named me Wakata. From that time Wakata left the water and continued to live on shore. His principal amusement, as long as he was a lad, was still flying kites. But he understood magic well, and nothing was concealed from him, and when he grew up to be a man he became a renowned hero. This second legend of the destruction by Wakata Patiki of the house called Te Tihio Manono, or Te Uaruomanono, is added because it differs consistently from the other, and is often alluded to in ancient poems. Tinara determined to attempt to avenge the death of his descendant to Huruhuru, and he thought that the best person to do this was Wakata, whom he knew to be very skillful in war, and in enchantments. So he directed his wife Hainaiti Iwaiwa to find Wakata, and she went in search. When she reached a village near where she expected to find him, she asked some people whom she saw, where Wakata was, and they answered her, he is on the top of yonder hill flying a kite. She at once proceeded on her way until she came to the hill, and seeing a man there, she asked him, can you tell me where I can find Wakato? And he replied, you must have passed him as you came here. Then she returned to the village where she had seen the people, and said to them, why, the man upon the hill says that Wakata is here. But they told her that the man who had spoken to her must have been Wakata himself, and that she had better return to him, and told her marks by which she might know him. She therefore returned, and he, after some time, when she showed him that she knew certain marks about his person, admitted that he was Wakata. And he then asked her what had made her come to him, and she replied, Tinara sent me to you to ask you to come and assist in revenging the death of my son. The warriors are all collecting at the village of Tinara, but they fear to go to attack this enemy, for it is the bravest of all the enemies of Tinara. Wakata then asked her, Have you yet given a feast to the warriors? And she said, Not yet. He then spoke to her, saying, 
return at once and when you reach your village, give a great feast to the warriors. Give them abundance of potted birds from the forest, but let all the oil in which the birds were preserved be kept for me. As for yourself, do not go to the feast, but, decking your head with a morning dress of feathers, remain seated close in the house of mourning. Then Hainaiti Iwaiwa at once returned to Tinaro, to do as she had been directed. Shortly after his visitor had left him, Wakata called aloud to his people, saying, Let the sideboards be at once fresh lashed onto our canoe, to the canoe of our ancestor of Rada. His men were so anxious to fulfill their chief's orders, that almost as soon as he had spoken they were at work, and had finished the canoe that very day, and dragged it down to the sea. When night fell, six of his warriors embarked in it, and Wakata made the seventh, they then paddled off, following a direct course, until they reached the village of Tinara where they found Hainaiti Iwaiwa seated in her house of mourning. Wakata then asked her, Have the warriors all left yet? And she replied, They will not do it, they are afraid. Wakata then said to her, Farewell, then, do you remain here until you hear further from me. Wakata and his men having re-embarked in their canoe, made a straight course for the place where was situated the great house called Te Tihio Manono, and they let their anchor drop, and floated there. When the next morning broke, and some of the people of the village coming out of the house, and beyond their defences, saw the canoe floating at the anchorage, they gave the alarm, crying out, A war party! A war party! Then the warriors came rushing forth to the fray in crowds, and arranged themselves in bands. Then stood forth one of their champions whose name was Mangohiratapina, and he defied Wakata, who was standing up in his canoe, calling out, Were you fool enough, then, to come here of your own accord? And Wakata answered him, by shouting out, Which of the arts of war do you consider yourself famous for? And Mangohiratapina shouted out in answer, I am a most skillful diver. Dive here, then, if you dare, shouted out Wakata in reply. Then the champion of the enemy gave a plunge into the water, and dived under it. Just as he got right under the canoe, one of Wakata's men poured the oil which Hainaiti Iwaiwa had given them into the sea, and its waters immediately became quite transparent, so that they saw the warrior come floating up under the canoe. And Wakata transfixed him with a wooden spade. So that champion perished. Then forward stepped another champion named Pitakataka, and he defied Wakata, shouting out, Ah! You only killed Mangohiratapina because he chanced to put himself in a wrong position. Wakata shouted out in reply, Which of the arts of war are you skilled in, then? And he answered, Oh! I leap so skillfully that I seem to fly in the air. Then leap here, if you dare, answered Wakata and the champion of his enemies took a run and made a spring high into the air, but Wakata laid a noose on the canoe, and as the warrior alighted in it, he drew it tight, and caught him as a bird in a springe, and thus slew that warrior also. And thus, one after the other, he slew ten of the most famous warriors of his enemies. One whom he had seized, he saved alive, but he cut out his tongue, and then said to him, Now, off with you to the shore again, and tell them their bow I have overcome you all. Having done this, Wakato retired a little distance back from the place, so that his canoe could not be seen by his enemies. In the afternoon Wakata landed on the coast, and before eating anything, offered the prescribed sacrifice of the hair and a part of the skin of the head of one of his victims to the gods, and when the religious rites were finished, he ate food. And having done this, he directed the people he had with him to return, saying, return at once, and when you reach the residence of Hainaiti Iwaiwa, speak to her, saying, Wakata told us to come, and tell you, that he could not return with us. And he further said, if heavy rain falls in large drops, it is a sign that I have been killed. But if a light, misty rain falls, and the whole horizon is lighted up with flames, then you may know that I have conquered, and that I have burnt Te Tihio Manono. He also said that, he wished you to sit upon the roof of your house watching until you saw Te Tihio Manono burnt. Wakata's people at once returned to Hainaiti Iwaiwa to deliver the message he had given them. Just before nightfall, Wakata drew near the great house, called Te Tihio Manono, and as the people of Witna Kanako, a great chief, 
were collecting firewood at the edge of a forest, he stealthily dropped in amongst them. Pretending to be collecting firewood too. And as they were going home with their loads of firewood upon their backs, he managed to push on in front of them. And got into the house first with a long rope in his hand, one end of this he pushed between one of the side posts which supported the roof, and the plank walls of the house, and did the same with every post of the house. Until the rope had gone quite round it, and then he made one end of it fast to the last post, and held the other end in his band. By this time the people who lived in the house all came crowding in to pass the night in it, and soon filled it up, the house was so large, and there were so many of them, that they had to light ten fires in it. When their fires had burnt up brightly, some of them called out to Mango Pear, the man whom Wakata bad saved alive, and whose tongue he had cut out, well, now, tell us what kind of looking fellow that was who cut your tongue out. And Mango Pear answered, There is no one I can compare him to, he was not like a man in the proportion of his frame. One of them then called out, Was he at all like me? But Mango Pear answered, There is nobody I can compare him to. Then another called out, Was he at all like me? And another, Was he like me? Until, at length, Mango Pear cried out, Have I not already told you, that there is not one of you whom I can compare to him? Wakata himself then exclaimed, Was he at all like me? And Mango Pear, who had not before seen him in the crowd, looked attentively at him for a minute, and then cried out, I say, look here all of you at this fellow, he is not unlike the man, he looks very like him, perhaps it is he himself. But Wakata coolly asked him again, was the man really something like me? And Mango Pear replied, yes, he was like you, I really think it was you, and Wakata shouted aloud, you are right, it was I. As soon as they heard this, all of them in a moment sprang to their feet. But, at the same instant, Wakata laid hold of the end of the rope which he had passed round the posts of the house, and, rushing out, pulled it with all his strength, and straightway the house fell down, crushing all within it. So that the whole tribe perished, and Wakata, who had escaped to the outside of the house, set it on fire, and Hainaiti Iwaiwa, who was sitting upon the roof of her own house watching for the event, saw the whole of one part of the heavens red with its flames, and she knew that her enemies were destroyed. Wakata, having thus avenged the death of Tuhuruhuru the son of Tinara, returned to his own village. The Legend of Toitewatahi and Tamate Kapua The dissensions which led to the migrations from Hawaii. Our ancestors formerly separated some of them were left in Hawaii, and some came here in canoes. Tuamata and Wenuku paddled in their canoes here to Aotea, again, at that time some of them were separated from each other that is to say, Wenaku and Homaitavidi. For in the time of Homaitavidi there had been a great war, and thence there were many battles fought in Hawaii. But this war had commenced long before that time, in the days of Wakataihu, of Tawaki, and of Tuhuruhuru, when they carried off Kei alive from his place as a payment for Tutunui. And the war continued until the time of the disputes that arose on account of the body of warriors of Manaya. Again after that came the troubles that arose from the act of desecration that was committed by the dog of Homaitavidi and of his sons in eating the matter that had sloughed from an ulcer of Wenaku's. Upon this occasion, when Toiti Watahi and Wenaku saw the dog, named Patakatavidi, do this, they killed it, and the sons of Homaitavidi missing the dog, went everywhere searching for it, and could not find it. They went from village to village, until at last they came to the village of Toiti Watahi, and as they went they kept calling his dog. At last the dog howled in the belly of Toy Owl. Then Tama Ti Kapua and Wakaturia called their dog again, and again it howled Owl. Then Toy held his mouth shut as close as ever he could, but the dog still kept on howling in his inside. Thence Toy said as follows, and his words passed into a proverb, Oh, hush, hush. I thought I had hid you in the big belly of Toy, and there you are, you cursed thing, still howling away. When Tamati Kapua and his brother had thus arrived there, he asked, Why did you not kill the dog and bring it back to me, that my heart might have felt satisfied, and that we might have remained good friends? Now, I'll tell you what it is, O oh my relations, you shall by and by hear more of this. Then as soon as the two brothers got home, 
they began immediately to make stilts for Tomatii Kapua, and as soon as these were finished, they started that night and went to the village of Toi and Wenuku. And arrived at the fine paporo tree of Wenuku, covered with branches and leaves, and they remained eating the fruit of it for a good long time, and then went home again. This they continued doing every night, until at last Wenuku and his people found that the fruit of his paporo tree was nearly all gone, and they all wondered what had become of the fruit of the paporo tree, and they looked for traces. And there were some the traces of the stilts of Tama. At night they kept watch on the tree, whilst one party was coming to steal, the other was lying in wait to catch them. This latter had not waited very long when Tama and his brother came, and whilst they were busy eating, those who were lying in wait rushed upon them, and caught both of them. They seized Wakaturia at the very foot of the tree. Tama made his escape, but they gave chase, and caught him on the seashore. As soon as they had him firmly, those who were holding on cried out, Some of you chop down his stilts with an axe, so that the fellow may fall into the water. And all those who had hold of him cried out, Yes, yes, let him fall into the sea. Then Tama called down to them, If you fell me in the water, I shall not be hurt, but if you cut me down on shore, the fall will kill me. And when those who were behind, and were just running up, heard this, they thought well of it, so they chopped him down on shore, and down he came with a heavy fall, but in a moment he was on his feet, and off he went. Like a bird escaped from a snare, and so got safe away. Then all the village began to assemble to see Wakaturia put to death, and when they were collected, some of them said, let him be put to death at once, and others said, oh, don't do that. You had much better hang him up in the roof of Wenuku's house, that he may be stifled by the smoke, and die in that way. And the thought pleased them all, so they hung him up in the roof of the house, and kindled a fire, and commenced dancing, and when that ceased they began singing, but their dancing and singing was not at all good, but indeed shockingly bad. And this they did every night, until at last a report of their proceedings reached the ears of his brother Tama, and of their father. And Tama heard, there's your brother hanging up in the roof of Wenuku's great house, and he is almost stifled by the smoke. So he thought he would go and see him, and ascertain whether he still lived in spite of the smoke. He went in the night, and arrived at the house, and gently climbed right upon the top of the roof, and making a little hole in the thatch, immediately over the spot where his brother hung, asked him in a whisper, Are you dead? But he whispered up to him, No, I'm still alive. And his brother asked again in a whisper, How do these people dance and sing, do they do it well? And the other replied, No, nothing can be worse. The very bystanders do nothing but find fault with the way in which they dance and sing. Then Tama said to him, Would not it be a good thing for you to say to them, I never knew anything so bad as the dancing and singing of those people. And if they reply, Oh, perhaps you can dance and sing better than we do, do you answer, that I can. Then if they take you down, and say, Now, let us see your dancing, you can answer, Oh I am quite filthy from the soot. You had better in the first place give me a little oil, and let me dress my hair, and give me some feathers to ornament my head with. And, if they agree to all this, when your hair is dressed, perhaps they will say, There, that will do, now dance and sing for us. Then do you answer them, Oh, I am still looking quite dirty, first lend me the red apron of Wenuku, that I may wear it as my own, and his carved two-handed sword as my weapon, and then I shall really look fit to dance. And if they give you all these things, then dance and sing for them. Then I your brother will go and seat myself just outside the doorway of the house, and when you rush out, I'll bolt the house door and window, and when they try to pursue and catch you, the door and window will be bolted fast. And we too can escape without danger. Then he finished talking to him. Then Wakaturia called down to Wenuku, and to all his people, who were assembled in the house, Oh, all you people who are dancing and singing there, listen to me. Then they all said, Silence, silence, make no more noise there, and listen to what the fellow is saying who is hanging up there, we thought he had been stifled by the smoke, but no such thing, there he is, alive still. So they all kept quiet. Then those who were in the house called up to him, Haloa, you fellow hanging up in the roof there, what are you saying, let's hear you. 
And he answered, I mean to say that you don't know any good dances or songs, at least that I have heard. Then the people in the house answered, Are you and your tribe famous for your dancing and singing then? And he answered, Their songs and dances are beautiful, and they asked, Do you yourself know how to dance and sing? Then Wenuku said, Let him down then, and he was let down, and the people all called out to him, Now dance away. And he did everything exactly as Tamati'i Kapua had recommended him. Then Wakaturia called out to them, Make a very bright fire, so that there may be no smoke, and you may see well, and they made a bright clear fire. Then he stood up to dance, and as he rose from his seat on the ground, he looked bright and beautiful as the morning star appearing in the horizon. And as he flourished his sword his eyes flashed and glittered like the mother-of-pearl eyes in the head carved on the handle of his two-handed sword, and he danced down one side of the house, and reached the door. Then he turned and danced up the other side of the house, and reached the end opposite the door, and there he stood. Then he said quietly to them, I am dying with heat, just slide back the door, and let it stand open a little, that I may feel the cool air, and they slid the door back and left it open. Then the lookers-on said, Come, you've rested enough. The fresh air from outside must have made you cool enough, stand up, and dance. Then Wakaturiya rose up again to dance, and as he rose up, Tamati'i Kapua stepped up to the door of the house, and sat down there, with two sticks in his hand, all ready to bolt up the sliding door and window. Then Wakaturiya, as is the custom in the dance, turned round to his right hand, stuck out his tongue, and made hideous faces on that side, again he turned round to the left hand, and made hideous faces on that side. His eyes glared, and his sword and red apron looked splendid. Then he sprung about, and appeared hardly to stand for a moment at the end of the house near the door, before he had sprung back to the other end, and standing just a moment there, he made a spring from the inside of the house. And immediately he was beyond the door. Up sprang Tamati'i Kapua, and instantly bolted the door, back ran Wakaturia. He helped his brother to bolt up the window, and there they heard those inside cursing and swearing, and chattering like a hole full of young parrots, whilst away ran Tama and his brother. A stranger who was presently passing by the house, pulled the bolts out of the door and window for them, and the crowd who had been shut into the house came pouring out of it. The next morning Toy and Wenuku felt vexed indeed, for the escape of those they had taken as a payment for the fruit of their luxuriant paporo tree, and said, if we had had the sense to kill them at once. They would never have escaped in this way. In the days which are coming, that fellow will return, seeking revenge for our having hung him up in the roof of the house. And before long Wenaku and Toiti Watahi went to make war on Tamati'i Kapua and his people, and some fell on both sides. And at length a breach in the fortifications of the town of Homaitaviti and of his sons was entered by a storming party of Wenaku's force, and some of the fences and obstructions were carried. And the people of Homaitaviti cried out, Oh, ho, oh, oh, here are the enemy pressing their way in, and Homaitaviti shouted in reply, That's right, let them in, let them in, till they reach the very threshold of the house of Homaitaviti. Thrice his men called out this to Ho, and thrice did he answer them in the same manner. At last up rose Ho with his sons, then the struggle took place. Those of the enemy that were not slain were allowed to escape back out of the town, but many of the slain were left there, and their bodies were cut up, baked, and devoured. Then, indeed, a great crime was committed by Ho, and his family, and his warriors, in eating the bodies of those men, for they were their near relations, being descended from Tamatea Kairiki. Thence cowardice and fear seized upon the tribe of Ho, formerly they were all very brave indeed, but at last Ho, and all his tribe became cowardly, and fit for nothing, and Ho, and Wakaturia both died, but Tamati'i Kapua and his children. And some of his relations, still lived, and he determined to make peace, that some remnant of his tribe might be saved. And the peace was long preserved. The Legend of Pautaini and Waiapu The Discovery of New Zealand Now pay attention to the cause of the contention which arose between Pautaini and Waiapu, which led them to emigrate to New Zealand. For a long time they both rested in the same place, and Hintuahoanga, to whom the stone Waiapu 12 belonged, 
became excessively enraged with Nahu, and with his prized stone pout Aini 13. At last she drove Nahu out and forced him to leave the place, and Nahu departed and went to a strange land, taking his jasper. When Hintua Hoanga saw that he was departing with his precious stone, she followed after them, and Nahu arrived at Tuwa with his stone, and Hintua Hoanga arrived and landed there at the same time with him, and began to drive him away again. Then Nahu went to seek a place where his jasper might remain in peace, and be found in the sea this island Aotearoa, the northern island of New Zealand, and he thought he would land there. Then he thought again, lest he and his enemy should be too close to one another, and should quarrel again, that it would be better for him to go farther off with his jasper, a very long way off. So he carried it off with him, and they coasted along, and at length arrived at Arahura, on the west coast of the middle island, and he made that an everlasting resting place for his jasper. Then he broke off a portion of his jasper, and took it with him and returned, and as be coasted along lie at length reached Wera, believed to be upon the east coast of the northern island, and he visited Wangaparea and Taranga. And from thence he returned direct to Hawaii, and reported that he had discovered a new country which produced the moa and jasper in abundance. He now manufactured sharp axes from his jasper, two axes were made from it, Totoru and Hau Hau Tiirengi. He manufactured some portions of one piece of it into images for neck ornaments, and some portions into ear ornaments. The name of one of these ear ornaments was Kaukamachua, which was recently in the possession of Te Huhu, and was only lost in 1846, when he was killed with so many of his tribe by a landslip. The axe Totoru was only lately lost by Purahokura and his brother Riritai, who were descended from Tamae Chuteroa. When Nahu, returning, arrived again in Hawaii, he found them all engaged in war, and when they heard his description of the beauty of this country of Aodia, some of them determined to come here. Construction of canoes to emigrate to New Zealand. They then fell the Tatera tree in Rarotonga, which lies on the other side of Hawaii, that they might build the Arawa from it. The tree was felled, and thus the canoe was hewn out from it and finished. The names of the men who built this canoe were, Rada, Wahiaroe, Nahu, Parada, and some other skillful men, who helped to hew out the Arawa and to finish it. A chief of the name of Hotuaroe, hearing that the Arawa was built, and wishing to accompany them, came to Tamati Kapua and asked him to lend him his workmen to hew out some canoes for him too. And they went and built and finished Tainui and some other canoes. The workmen above mentioned are those who built the canoes in which our forefathers crossed the ocean to this island, to Aotearoa. The names of the canoes were as follows, the Arawa was first completed, then Tainui, then Matachua, and Takitumu, and Karahaupa, and Tokamaru, and Mataweawa. These are the names of the canoes in which our forefathers departed from Hawaii, and crossed to this island. When they had lashed the topsides on to the Tainui, Rada slew the son of Maniah, and bid his body in the chips and shavings of the canoes. The names of the axes with which they hewed out these canoes were Hauhau Tiirangi, and Totoru. Totoru was the axe with which they cut off the head of Wenaku. All these axes were made from the block of jasper brought back by Nahu to Hawaii, which was called, the Fish of Nahu. He had previously come to these islands from Hawaii, when he was driven out from thence by Hintua Hoanga, whose fish or stone was obsidian. From that cause Nahu came to these islands. The canoes which afterwards arrived here came in consequence of his discovery. The Voyage to New Zealand when the canoes were built and ready for sea, they air dragged afloat, the separate lading of each canoe as collected and put on board, with all the crews. Tamati Ikapua then remembered that he had no skillful priest on board his canoe, and he thought the best thing he could do was to outweet Ngatororangi, the chief who had command of the Tainui. So just as his canoe shoved off, he called out to Natoro, I say, Natoro, just come on board my canoe, and perform the necessary religious rites for me. Then the priest Natoro came on board, and Tamati Kapua said to him, You had better also call your wife, Kiroa on board, that she may make the canoe clean or common. With an offering of seaweed to be laid in the canoe instead of an offering of fish, for you know the second fish caught in a canoe, or seaweed, or some substitute, 
ought to be offered for the females, the first for the males. Then my canoe will be quite common, for all the ceremonies will have been observed, which should be followed with canoes made by priests. Natoro assented to all this, and called his wife, and they both go into Tama's canoe. The very moment they were on board, Tama called out to the men on board his canoe, heave up the anchors and make sail, and he carried off with him Natoro and his wife, that he might have a priest and wise man on board his canoe. Then they up with the foresail, the mainsail, and the mizzen, and away shot the canoe. Up then came Natoro from below, and said, Shorten sail, that we may go more slowly, lest I miss my own canoe. And Tama replied, Oh, no, no. Wait a little, and your canoe will follow after us. For a short time it kept near them, but soon dropped more and more astern, and when darkness overtook them, on they sailed, each canoe proceeding on its own course. Two thefts were upon this occasion perpetrated by Tamatii Kapua, he carried off the wife of Rueo, and Natoro and his wife, on board the Arawa. He made a fool of Rueo too, for he said to him, Oh, Rua, you, like a good fellow, just run back to the village and fetch me my axe to Toru, I pushed it in under the sill of the window of my house. And Rua was foolish enough to run back to the house. Then off went Tama with the canoe, and when Rua came back again, the canoe was so far off that its sails did not look much bigger than little flies. So he fell to weeping for all his goods on board the canoe, and for his wife Wakatirengi, whom Tamatii Kapua had carried off as a wife for himself. Tamatii Kapua committed these two great thefts when he sailed for these islands. Hence this proverb, a descendant of Tamatii Kapua will steal anything he can. When evening came on, Rua threw himself into the water, as a preparation for his incantations to recover his wife, and he then changed the stars of evening into the stars of morning, and those of the morning into the stars of the evening. And this was accomplished. In the meantime the Arawa scudded away far out on the ocean, and Natoro thought to himself. What a rate this canoe goes at what a vast space we have already traversed. I know what I'll do, I'll climb up upon the roof of the house which is built on the platform joining the two canoes, and try to get a glimpse of the land in the horizon, and ascertain whether we are near it, or very far off. But in the first place he felt some suspicions about his wife, lest Tamatii Kapua should steal her too, for he had found out what a treacherous person he was. So he took a string and tied one end of it to his wife's hair, and kept the other end of the string in his hand, and then he climbed up on the roof. He had hardly got on the top of the roof when Tama laid hold of his wife, and he cunningly untied the end of the string which Natoro had fastened to her hair, and made it fast to one of the beams of the canoe. And Natoro feeling it tight thought his wife had not moved, and that it was still fast to her. At last Natoro came down again, and Tamatii Kapua heard the noise of his steps as he was coming, but he had not time to get the string tied fast to the hair of Kiaroa's head again, but he jumped as fast as he could into his own berth. Which was next to that of Natoro, and Natoro, to his surprise, found one end of the string tied fast to the beam of the canoe. Then he knew that his wife had been disturbed by Tama, and he asked her, saying, Oh, wife, has not someone disturbed you? Then his wife replied to him, Cannot you tell that from the string being fastened to the beam of the canoe? And then he asked her, Who was it? And she said, Who was it, indeed? Could it be anyone else but Tamati Kapua? Then her husband said to her, You are a noble woman indeed thus to confess this, you have gladdened my heart by this confession. I thought after Tama had carried us both off in this way, that he would have acted generously, and not loosely in this manner, but, since he has dealt in this way, I will now have my revenge on him. Then that priest again went forth upon the roof of the house and stood there, and he called aloud to the heavens, in the same way that Rua did, and he changed the stars of the evening into those of morning. And he raised the winds that they should blow upon the prow of the canoe, and drive it astern, and the crew of the canoe were at their wit's end, and quite forgot their skill as seamen, and the canoe drew straight into the whirlpool. Called the throat of Teparata 14 and dashed right into that whirlpool. The canoe became engulfed by the whirlpool, and its prow disappeared in it. 
In a moment the waters reached the first bailing place in the bows, in another second they reached the second bailing place in the center, and the canoe now appeared to be going down into the whirlpool head foremost. Then up started Hay, but before he could rise they had already sunk far into the whirlpool. Next the rush of waters was heard by Ihenga, who slept forward, and he shouted out, Oh, Natoro, oh, we are settling down head first. The pillow of your wife Kiaroa has already fallen from under her head. Natoro sat astern listening, the same cries of distress reached him a second time. Then up sprang Tamati Kapua, and he in despair shouted out, Oh, Natoro, Natoro, aloft there. Do you hear? The canoe is gone down so much by the bow, that Kiaroa's pillow has rolled from under her head. The priest heard them, but neither moved nor answered until he heard the goods rolling from the decks and splashing into the water. The crew meanwhile held on to the canoe with their hands with great difficulty, some of them having already fallen into the sea. When these things all took place, the heart of Natoro was moved with pity, for he heard, too, the shrieks and cries of the men, and the weeping of the women and children. Then up stood that mighty man again, and by his incantations changed the aspect of the heavens, so that the storm ceased, and he repeated another incantation to draw the canoe back out of the whirlpool, that is, to lift it up again. Lo, the canoe rose up from the whirlpool, floating rightly, but, although the canoe itself thus floated out of the whirlpool, a great part of its lading had been thrown out into the water, a few things only were saved, and remained in the canoe. A great part of their provisions were lost as the canoe was sinking into the whirlpool. Thence comes the native proverb, if they can give a stranger but little food, or only make a present of a small basket of food, oh, it is the half-filled basket of Wakatirangi, for she only managed to save a very small part of her provisions. Then they sailed on, and landed at Wangapareoa, in Aotea here. As they drew near to land, they saw with surprise some Pohutakoa trees of the sea coast, covered with beautiful red flowers, and the still water reflected back the redness of the trees. Then one of the chiefs of the canoe cried out to his messmates, See there, red ornaments for the head are much more plentiful in this country than in Hawaii, so I'll throw my red head ornaments into the water. And, so saying, he threw them into the sea. The name of that man was Taninahai, the name of the red head ornament he threw into the sea was Taiwakia. The moment they got on shore they ran to gather the Pohutakoa flowers, but no sooner did they touch them than the flowers fell to pieces, then they found out that these red head ornaments were nothing but flowers. All the chiefs on board the Arawa were then troubled that they should have been so foolish as to throw away their red ornaments into the sea. Very shortly afterwards the ornaments of Taninahai were found by Mahina on the beach of Mahidi. As soon as Taninahai heard they had been picked up, he ran to Mahina to get them again, but Mahina would not give them up to him. Thence this proverb for anything which has been lost and is found by another person, I will not give it up, tis the red head ornament which Mahina found. As soon as the party landed at Wangapareoa, they planted sweet potatoes, that they might grow there, and they are still to be found growing on the cliffs at that place. Then the crew, wearied from the voyage, wandered idly along the shore, and there they found the fresh carcass of a sperm whale stranded upon the beach. The Tainui had already arrived in the same neighborhood, although they did not at first see that canoe nor the people who had come in it. When, however, they met, they began to dispute as to who had landed first and first found the dead whale, and as to which canoe it consequently belonged. So, to settle the question, they agreed to examine the sacred place which each party had set up to return thanks into the gods for their safe arrival, that they might see which had been longest built. And, doing so, they found that the posts of the sacred place put up by the Arawa were quite green, whilst the posts of the sacred place set up by the Tainui had evidently been carefully dried over the fire before they had been fixed in the ground. The people who had come in the Tainui also showed part of a rope which they had made fast to its jawbone. When these things were seen, it was admitted that the whale belonged to the people who came in the Tainui, and it was surrendered to them. And the people in the Arawa, determining to separate from those in the Tainui, selected some of their crew to explore the country in a northwest direction, following the coastline. The canoe then coasted along, the land party following it along the shore, this was made up of 140 men, 
whose chief was Taiku, and these gave to a place the name of Te Ranga of Taiku. The Tainui left Wanap Pareoa 15 shortly after the Arawa, and, proceeding nearly in the same direction as the Arawa, made the Gulf of Haraki, and then coasted along to Rakaumangamanga, or Cape Brett. And to the island with an arched passage through it, called Motokakako, which lies off the Cape. Thence they ran along the coast to Wiwia, and to Te Akanapanapa, and to Mori Fenua, or the country near the North Cape. Finding that the land ended there, they returned again along the coast until they reached the Tamaki, and landed there, and afterwards proceeded up the creek to Taoma, or the portage. Where they were surprised to see flocks of seagulls and oyster catchers passing over from the westward. So they went off to explore the country in that direction, and to their great surprise found a large sheet of water lying immediately behind them, so they determined to drag their canoes over the portage at a place they named Otahu. And to launch them again on the vast sheet of salt water which they had found. The first canoe which they hauled across was the Tokamara that they got across without difficulty. They next began to drag the Tainui over the isthmus, they hauled away at it in vain, they could not stir it. For one of the wives of Hotuaroe, named Maramakiko Hura, who was unwilling that the tired crews should proceed further on this new expedition, had by her enchantments fixed it so firmly to the earth that no human strength could stir it. So they hauled, they hauled, they excited themselves with cries and cheers, but they hauled in vain, they cried aloud in vain, they could not move it. When their strength was quite exhausted by these efforts, then another of the wives of Hotuaroe, more learned in magic and incantations than Maramakiko Hura, grieved at seeing the exhaustion and distress of her people, rose up. And chanted forth an incantation far more powerful than that of Maramakiko Hura. Then at once the canoe glided easily over the carefully laid skids, and it soon floated securely upon the harbor of Manuka. The willing crews urged on the canoes with their paddles. They soon discovered the mouth of the harbor upon the west coast, and passed out through it into the open sea. They coasted along the western coast to the southwards, and discovering the small port of Kawea, they entered it, and, hauling up their canoe, fixed themselves there for the time, whilst the Arawa was left at Makitu. We now return to the Arawa. We left the people of it at Toranga. That canoe next floated at Motiti, 16 they named that place after a spot in Hawaii, because there was no firewood there. Next Tia, to commemorate his name, called the place now known by the name of Ranjuru, Takapuotapuiakeinuiatia. Then He stood up and called out, I name that place Takapuo Waitahanuiahe, the name of that place is now Otua. Then stood up Tamati Kapua, and pointing to the place now called the heads of Makitu, he called out, I name that place Te Kuria Tango Tichio Tamati Kapua. Next Khan called a place after his name, Motiti Nuiakahu. Rueo, who had already arrived at Makitu, started up. He was the first to arrive there in his canoe Pukitia Wainui for he had been left behind by the Arawa, and his wife Wakatiringi had been carried off by Tamati Kapua. And after the Arawa had left he had sailed in his own canoe for these islands, and landed at Makitu, and his canoe reached land the first. Well, he started up, cast his line into the sea, with the hooks attached to it, and they got fast in one of the beams of the Arawa, and it was pulled ashore by him, whilst the crew were asleep. And the hundred and forty men who had accompanied him stood upon the beach of Makitu, with skids already laid, and the Arawa was by them dragged upon the shore in the night, and left there. And Rueo seated himself under the side of the Arawa, and played upon his flute, and the music woke his wife, and she said, Dear me, that's Rua. And when she looked, there he was sitting under the side of the canoe. And they passed the night together. At last Rua, said, O mother of my children, go back now to your new husband, and presently I'll play upon the flute and puterino, so that both you and Tamati Kapua may hear. Then do you say to Tamati Kapua, O. Oh. La, I had a dream in the night that I heard Rua playing a tune upon his flute, and that will make him so jealous that B will give you a blow, and then you can run away from him again, as if you were in a rage and hurt, and you can come to me. Then Wakadirengi returned, and lay down by Tamati Kapua, and she did everything exactly as Rua had told her, and Tama began to beat her, 
and she ran away from him. Early in the morning Rua performed incantations, by which he kept all the people in the canoe in a profound sleep, and whilst they still slept from his enchantments, the sun rose, and mounted high up in the heavens. In the forenoon, Rua gave the canoe a heavy blow with his club, they all started up. It was almost noon, and when they looked down over the edge of their canoe, there were the hundred and forty men of Rua, sitting under them, all beautifully dressed with feathers, as if they had been living on the Gannet Island. In the channel of Kerwa, where feathers are so abundant. And when the crew of the Arawa heard this, they all rushed upon deck, and saw Rua standing in the midst of his one hundred and forty warriors. Then Rua shouted out as he stood, Come here, Tamati'i Kapua. Let us two fight the battle, you and I alone. If you are stronger than I am, well and good, let it be so, if I am stronger than you are, I'll dash you to the earth. Up sprang then the hero Tamati'i Kapua. He held a carved two-handed sword, a sword the handle of which was decked with red feathers. Rua held a similar weapon. Tama first struck a fierce blow at Rua. Rua parried it, and it glanced harmlessly off. Then Rua threw away his sword, and seized both the arms of Tamati'i Kapua, he held his arms and his sword, and dashed him to the earth. Tama half rose, and was again dashed down, once more he almost rose, and was thrown again. Still Tama fiercely struggled to rise and renew the fight. For the fourth time he almost rose up, then Rua, overcome with rage, took a heap of vermin, this he had prepared for the purpose, to cover Tama, with insult and shame, and rubbed them on Tamati'i Kapua's head and ear. And they adhered so fast that Tama tried in vain to get them out. Then Rua said, There, I've beaten you, now keep the woman, as a payment for the insults I've heaped upon you, and for having been beaten by me. But Tama did not hear a word he said. He was almost driven mad with pain and itching, and could do nothing but stand scratching and rubbing his head, whilst Rua departed with his hundred and forty men to seek some other dwelling place for themselves. If they had turned against Tama and his people to fight against them, they would have slain them all. These men were giants Tamati'i Kapua was nine feet high, Rua was eleven feet high, there have been no men since that time so tall as those heroes. The only man of these later times who was as tall as these was Tuhorangi, he was nine feet high. He was six feet up to the armpits. This generation have seen his bones, they used to be always set up by the priests in the sacred places when they were made high places for the sacred sacrifices of the natives, at the times the potatoes and sweet potatoes were dug up. And when the fishing season commenced, and when they attacked an enemy. Then might be seen the people collecting, in their best garments, and with their ornaments, on the days when the priests exposed two Horangi's bones to their view. At the time that the island Mokoya, in the lake of Rotorua, was stormed and taken by the Napuhi, they probably carried those bones off, for they have not since been seen. After the dispute between Tamati'i Kapua and Rua took place, Tama and his party dwelt at Makitu, and their descendants after a little time spread to other places. The Tororangi went, however, about the country, and where be found dry valleys, stamped on the earth, and brought forth springs of water. B also visited the mountains, and placed Pachapiri, or fairies, there, and then returned to Makitu and dwelt there. After this a dispute arose between Tamati'i Kapua and Kahumata Momo, and in consequence of that disturbance, Tama and Natoro removed to Toranga, and found Taiku living there, and collecting food for them, by fishing. And that place was called by them Teranga Taiku. Seventeen it lies beyond Motuhoa, then they departed from Toranga, and stopped at Kadi Kadi, where they ate food. Tama's men devoured the food very fast, whilst he kept on only nibbling his, therefore they applied this circumstance as a name for the place, and called it, Kadi Kadi o Tamati'i Kapua, the nibbling of Tamati'i Kapua. They then halted at Wakahau, so called because they here ordered food to be cooked, which they did not stop to eat, but went right on with Natoro, and this circumstance gave its name to the place. And they went on from place to place till they arrived at Widianga, which they so called from their crossing the river there, and they continued going from one place to another till they came to Tanjiaro, and Natoro. 
stuck up a stone and left it there, and they dwelt in Moha and Horaki. They occupied those places as a permanent residence, and Tamati'i Kapua died, and was buried there. When he was dying, he ordered his children to return to Makidu, to visit his relations, and they assented, and went back. If the children of Tamati'i Kapua had remained at Horaki, that place would not have been left to them as a possession. Tamati'i Kapua, when dying, told his children where the precious eardrop Kaukamachua was, which he had hidden under the window of his house, and his children returned with Natoro to Makitu, and dwelt there. And as soon as Natoro arrived, he went to the waters to bathe himself, as he had come there in a state of tapu, upon account of his having buried Tamati'i Kapua, and having bathed, he then became free from the tapu and clean. Natoro then took the daughter of Ihenga to wife, and he went and searched for the precious eardrop Kaukamachua, and found it, as Tamati'i Kapua had told him. After this the wife of Kahumata Momo conceived a child. At this time Ihenga, taking some dogs with him to catch Kiwi 18 with, went to Paratanji by way of Hakamite, and a kiwi was chased by one of his dogs, and caught in a lake, and the dog ate some of the fish and shellfish in the lake. After diving in the water to get them, and returned to its master carrying the captured kiwi in its mouth, and on reaching its master, it dropped the kiwi, and vomited up the raw fish and shellfish which it had eaten. When Ihenga saw his dog wet all over, and the fish it had vomited up, he knew there was a lake there, and was extremely glad, and returned joyfully to Makitu. And there he had the usual religious ceremonies which follow the birth of a child performed over his wife and the child she had given birth to. And when this had been done, he went to explore the country which he bad previously visited with his dog. To his great surprise he discovered a lake, it was Lake Rotoiti, he left a mark there to show that he claimed it as his own. He went farther and discovered Lake Rotorua, he saw that its waters were running, he left there also a mark to show that he claimed the lake as his own. As he went along the side of the lake, he found a man occupying the ground. Then he thought to himself that he would endeavor to gain possession of it by craft, so he looked out for a spot fit for a sacred place, where men could offer up their prayers, and for another spot fit for a sacred place. Where nets could be hung up, and he found fit spots. Then he took suitable stones to surround the sacred place with, and old pieces of seaweed, looking as if they had years ago been employed as offerings, and he went into the middle of the shrubbery, thick with boughs of the Taha shrub of the Koromuka, and of the Karamu. There he struck up the posts of the sacred place in the midst of the shrubs, and tied bunches of flax leaves on the posts, and having done this he went to visit the village of the people who lived there. They saw someone approaching and cried out, A stranger, a stranger, is coming here. As soon as Ahenga heard these cries, he sat down upon the ground, and then, without waiting for the people of the place to begin the speeches, he jumped up, and commenced to speak thus, What theft is this, what theft is this of the people here? That they are taking away my land. For he saw that they had their storehouses full of prepared fern roots and of dried fish, and shellfish, and their heaps of fishing nets, so as he spoke, he appeared to swell with rage. And his throat appeared to grow large from passion as he talked, Who authorized you to come here, and take possession of my place? Be off, be off, be off. Leave alone the place of the man who speaks to you, to whom it has belonged for a very long time, for a very long time indeed. Then Marupunganui, the son of Tuarotorua, the man to whom the place really belonged, said to Ihenga, It is not your place, it belongs to me. If it belongs to you, where is your village, where is your sacred place, where is your net, where are your cultivations and gardens? Ihenga answered him, Come here and see them. So they went together, and ascended a hill, and Ihenga said, See there, there is my net hanging up against the rocks. But it was no such thing, it was only a mark like a net hanging up, caused by part of a cliff having slipped away. And there are the posts of the pine round my village, but there was really nothing but some old stumps of trees, look there too at my sacred place a little beyond yours. And now come with me, and see my sacred place, if you are quite sure you see my village, and my fishing net come along. So they went together, and there he saw the sacred place standing in the shrubbery, until at last he believed Ihenga, 
and the place was all given up to Ihenga, and he took possession of it and lived there. And the descendants of Tuarotorua departed from that place, and a portion of them, under the chiefs Kawarero and Madaho, occupied the island of Mokoya, in Lake Rotorua. At this time Natoro again went to stamp on the earth, and to bring forth springs in places where there was no water, and came out on the great central plains which surround Lake Taupo. Where a piece of large cloak made of kie kie leaves was stripped off by the bushes, and the strips took root, and became large trees, nearly as large as the Kahikadia, they are called Penanga, and many of them are growing there still. Whenever he ascended a hill, he left marks there, to show that he claimed it, the marks he left were fairies. Some of the generation now living have seen these spirits, they are malicious spirits. If you take embers from an oven in which food has been cooked, and use them for a fire in a house, these spirits become offended. Although there be many people sleeping in that house, not one of them could escape, the fairies would, whilst they slept, press the whole of them to death. Natoro went straight on and rested at Taupo, and he beheld that the summit of Mount Tongariro was covered with snow, and he was seized with a longing to ascend it, and he climbed up. Saying to his companions who remained below at their encampment, Remember now, do not you, who I am going to leave behind, taste food from the time I leave you until I return, when we will all feast together. Then he began to ascend the mountain, but he had not quite got to the summit when those he had left behind began to eat food, and he therefore found the greatest difficulty in reaching the summit of the mountain. And the hero nearly perished in the attempt. At last he gathered strength, and thought he could save himself, if he prayed aloud to the gods of Hawaii to send fire to him, and to produce a volcano upon the mountain. And his prayer was answered, and fire was given to him, and the mountain became a volcano, and it came by the way of Wakari, or White Island, of Mount Ohora, of Okakuru, of Rotoehu, of Rotoiti, of Rotorua, of Tarawera, of Pearoe, of Orakaikarako, and of Taupo. It came right underneath the earth, spouting up at all the above-mentioned places, and ascended right up Tongariro, to him who was sitting upon the top of the mountain, and thence the hero was revived again, and descended, and returned to Makitu. And dwelt there. The Arawa had been laid up by its crew at Makitu, where they landed, and the people who had arrived with the party in the Arawa spread themselves over the country, examining it, some penetrating to Rotorua, some to Taupo, some to Huanganui. Some to Rudahuna, and no one was left at Makitu but Hei and his son, and Tia and his son, and the usual place of residence of Ngatororangi was on the island of Motidi. The people who came with the Tainui were still in Kawia, where they had landed. One of their chiefs, named Ramadi, heard that the Arawa was laid up at Makitu, so he started with all his own immediate dependents, and reaching Toranga, halted there, and in the evening again pressed on towards Makitu and reached the bank of the river, opposite that on which the Arawa was lying, thatched over with reeds and dried branches and leaves. Then he slung a dart, the point of which was bound round with combustible materials, over to the other side of the river. The point of the dart was lighted, and it stuck right in the dry thatch of the roof over the Arawa, and the shed of dry stuff taking fire, the canoe was entirely destroyed. On the night that the Arawa was burnt by Romedy, there was not a person left at Makitu, they were all scattered in the forests, at Tapuika, and at Waitaha, and Ngatororangi was at that moment at his residence on the island of Motidi. The pa, or fortified village at Makitu, was left quite empty, without a soul in it. The canoe was lying alone, with none to watch it. They had all gone to collect food of different kinds it happened to be a season in which food was very abundant, and from that cause the people were all scattered in small parties about the country, fishing, fowling, and collecting food. As soon as the next morning dawned, Romedy could see that the fortified village of Makidu was empty, and not a person left in it, so he and his armed followers at once passed over the river and entered the village, which they found entirely deserted. At night, as the arrow burnt, the people, who were scattered about in the various parts of the country, saw the fire, for the bright glare of the gleaming flames was reflected in the sky, lighting up the heavens. And they all thought that it was the village at Makitu that had been burnt. But those persons who were near Waitaha and close to the seashore near where the Arawa was, at once said, 
That must be the Arawa which is burning, it must have been accidentally set on fire by some of our friends who have come to visit us. The next day they went to see what had taken place, and when they reached the place where the Arawa had been lying, they found it had been burnt by an enemy, and that nothing but the ashes of it were left them. Then a messenger started to all the places where the people were scattered about, to warn them of what had taken place, and they then first heard the bad news. The children of Ho, as they discussed in their house of assembly the burning of the Arawa, remembered the proverb of their father, which he spake to them as they were on the point of leaving Hawaii, and when be bid them farewell. He then said to them, O my children, O Mako, O Tia, O Hei, hearken to these my words, there was but one great chief in Hawaii, and that was Wakatoihu. Now do you, my dear children, depart in peace, and when you reach the place you are going to, do not follow after the deeds of Tu, the god of war. If you do you will perish, as if swept off by the winds, but rather follow quiet and useful occupations, then you will die tranquilly a natural death. Depart, and dwell in peace with all, leave war and strife behind you here. Depart, and dwell in peace. It is war and its evils which are driving you from hence, dwell in peace where you are going, conduct yourselves like men, let there be no quarreling amongst you, but build up a great people. These were the last words which Homaitavidi addressed to his children, and they ever kept these sayings of their father firmly fixed in their hearts. Depart in peace to explore new homes for yourselves. Wenaku perhaps gave no such parting words of advice to his children, when they left him for this country, because they brought war and its evils with them from the other side of the ocean to New Zealand. But, of course, when Ramadi burnt the Arawa, the descendants of Homaitavidi could not help continually considering what they ought to do, whether they should declare war upon account of the destruction of their canoe, or whether they should let this act pass by without notice. They kept these thoughts always close in mind, and impatient feelings kept ever rising up in their hearts. They could not help saying to one another, it was upon account of war and its consequences, that we deserted our own country, that we left our fathers, our homes, and our people, and war and evil are following after us here. Yet we cannot remain patient under such an injury, every feeling urges us to revenge this wrong. At last they made an end of deliberation, and unanimously agreed that they would declare war, to obtain compensation for the evil act of Ramadi in burning the Arawa. And then commenced the great war which was waged between those who arrived in the Arawa and those who arrived in the Tainui. The Curse of Manaya Ko Manaya, Keo Kiwe When the Tainui and the Arawa sailed away from Hawaii with Ngatororangi on board, he left behind him his younger sister, Kiwe, who was married to a powerful chief named Manaya. Some time after the canoes had left, a great meeting of all the people of his tribe was held by Manaya, to remove a tapu, and when the religious part of the ceremony was ended, the women cooked food for the strangers. When their ovens were opened, the food in the oven of Kiwe, the wife of Manaya, and sister of Ngatororangi, was found to be much underdone, and Manaya was very angry with his wife, and gave her a severe beating, and cursed. Saying, Accursed be your head. Are the logs of firewood as sacred as the bones of your brother, that you were so sparing of them as not to put into the fire in which the stones were heated enough to make them red hot? Will you dare to do the like again? If you do I'll serve the flesh of your brother in the same way, it shall frizzle on the red-hot stones of Waikarora. And his poor wife was quite overcome with shame, and burst out crying, and went on sobbing and weeping all the time she was taking the underdone food out of the oven, and when she had put it in baskets, and earned them up to her husband. And laid them before him, she ate nothing herself, but went on one side and cried bitterly, and then retired and hid herself in the house. And just before night closed in on them, she cast her garments on one side, and girded herself with a new sash made from the young shoots of the toto, and stood on the threshold, and spread out her gods, Kahukura, Itupua, and Rongamai. And she and her daughter, and her sister Hongaroa, stood before them, and the appearance of the gods was most propitious. And when her incantations were ended, she said to her daughter, My child, your journey will be a most fortunate one. The gods were then by her bound up in cloths, and she hung them up again, and returned into the house. She then said to her daughter, Now depart, 
and when you reach your uncle Natoro, and your other relations, tell them that they have been cursed by Manaya. Because the food in my oven was not cooked upon the occasion of a great assembly for taking off a tapu, and that he then said, Are the logs in the forest as sacred as the bones of your brother, that you are afraid to use them in cooking? Or are the stones of the desert the kidneys of Natoroorangi, that you don't heat them, by and by I'll frizzle the flesh of your brother on red-hot stones taken from Waikorora. Now, my child, depart to your uncle and relations. Be quick, this is the season of the wind of Pungaware, which will soon waft them here. The women then took by stealth the gods of the people, that is to say, Maru, and Te Ihotirangi, and Rangamai, and Etupua, and Hongaroa, and they had no canoe for their journey, but these gods served them as a canoe to cross the sea. For the first canoes which had left Hawaii for New Zealand carried no gods for human beings with them. They only carried the gods of the sweet potatoes and of fish, they left behind them the gods for mortals, but they brought away with them prayers, incantations, and a knowledge of enchantments, for these things were kept secret in their minds. Being learnt by heart, one from another. Then the girl and her companions took with them Kahukura, and Atupua, and Rangamai, and Marty, and the other gods, and started on their journey. Altogether there were five women, and they journeyed and journeyed towards New Zealand, and, borne up by the gods, they traversed the vast ocean till at last they landed on the burning island of Wakari, and when daylight appeared. They floated again on the waters, and finally landed on the northern island of New Zealand, at Tahioyu, and went by an inland route, and stopped to eat food at a place whence they had a good view over the plains. And after the rest of the party had done eating, Hongaroa still went on, and two of her companions teased her, saying, Haloa. Hongaroa, what a long time you continue eating, and those plains have ever since been called Kaingaroa, or Kaingaroa Hongaroa, the long meal of Hongaroa. Hongaroa, who was much provoked with the two women who thus teased her, smote them on the face, whereupon they fled from her, and Hongaroa pursued them a long way, but she pursued in vain, they would not come back to her. So by her enchantments she changed them into tea trees, which stand on the plains whilst travellers approach them. But which move from place to place when they attempt to get close, and the natives believe that the trees are there at the present day. Then the other three women continued their journey, and they at length reached the summit of a hill, and sat down there to rest themselves, and whilst they were resting, Hongaroa thought of her mother, and love for her overcame her. And she wept aloud and that place has ever since been called Te Tanjihanga, or the place of weeping. After they had rested for some time, they continued their journey, until they reached the open summit of another high hill, which they named Pio Pio, and from thence they saw the beautiful lake of Rotorua lying at their feet. And they descended towards it, and came down upon the geyser, which spouts up its jets of boiling water at the foot of the mountain, and they reached the lake itself, and wound round it along its sandy shores. Then leaving the lake behind them, they struck off towards Makitu, and at last reached that place also, coming out of the forests upon the sea coast, close to the village of Tohoro, and when they saw the people there. They called out to them, Whereabout is the residence of Ngatoroarangi? And the people answered them, He lives near the large elevated storehouse which you see erected on the hill there. And the niece of Ngatoroarangi, saw the fence which surrounded his place, and she walked straight on towards the wicket of the fortification. She would not however pass in through it like a common person, but climbed the posts, and clambered into the fortress over its wooden defences, and having got inside, went straight on to the house of Natoroarangi, entered it. And going right up to the spot which was sacred, from his sitting on it, she seated herself down there. When Natoroarangi's people saw this, one of them ran off with all speed to tell his master, who was then at work with some of his servants on his farm, and having found him he said, There is a stranger just arrived at your residence. Who carries a travelling bag as if she had come from a long journey, and she would not come in at the gate of the fortress, but climbed right over the wooden defences, and has quietly laid her travelling bag upon the very roof of your sacred house. And has walked up and seated herself in the very seat that your sacred person generally occupies. When the servant had ended his story, Natoro at once guessed who this stranger from a distance must be, and said, It is my niece, and he then asked, Where is Te Kahu? And they told him, 
he is at work in his plantation of sweet potatoes. And he bid them fetch him at once, and to be quick about it. And when he arrived they all went together to the place where his niece was, and when he reached her, he at once led her before the altar, and she gave them the gods which she had brought with her from Hawaii. Then she said to them, Come now, and let us be cleansed by diving in running water, and let the ceremony of Wangai Horo be performed over us, for you have been cursed by Manahua and his tribe. When they heard this they cried aloud, and tore off their clothes, and ran to a running stream and plunged into it, and dashed water over themselves, and the priests chanted the proper incantations, and performed all the prescribed ceremonies. And when these were finished they left the stream, and went towards the village again, and the priests chanted incantations for cleansing the courtyard of the fortress from the defilement of the curse of Maniah. But the incantations for this purpose have not been handed down to the present generation. The priests next dug a long pit, termed the pit of wrath, into which by their enchantments they might bring the spirits of their enemies, and hang them and destroy them there. And when they had dug the pit, muttering the necessary incantations, they took large shells in their hands to scrape the spirits of their enemies into the pit with, whilst they muttered enchantments. And when they had done this, they scraped the earth into the pit again to cover them up, and beat down the earth with their hands, and crossed the pit with enchanted cloths, and wove baskets of flax leaves. To hold the spirits of the foes which they had thus destroyed, and each of these acts they accompanied with proper spells. The religious ceremonies being all ended, they sat down, and Gatororangi wept over his niece, and then they spread food before the travellers. And when they had finished their meal they all collected in the house of Ngatororangi, and the old man began to question the strangers, saying, What has brought you here? Then Kiwe's daughter said, A curse which Maniah uttered against you. For when they had finished making his sacred place for him, and the females were cooking food for the strangers who attended the ceremony, the food in Kiwe's oven was not well cooked, and Maniah cursed her and you. Saying, is firewood as sacred as the bones of your brethren, that you fear to burn it in an oven? I'll yet make the flesh of your brothers hiss upon red-hot stones brought from Waikarora, and heated to warm the oven in which they shall be cooked. That curse is the curse that brought me here, for my mother told me to hasten to you. When Gatororangi heard this, he was very wroth, and he in his turn cursed Maniah, saying, Thus shall it be done unto you your flesh shall be cooked with stones brought from Makitu. Then he told all his relations and people to search early the next morning for a large Tadera tree, from which they might build a canoe, as they had no canoe since Ramadi had burnt the Arawa. Then the people all arose very early the next morning, and with them were the chosen band of 140 warriors, and they went out to search for a large Tadera tree, and Kiwe's daughter went with them. And she found a great Tadera tree fallen down, and nearly buried in the earth. So they dug it out, and they framed a large canoe from it, which they named the Tadera tree, dug from the earth. And they hauled it down to the shore, and, launching it, embarked, and paddled out to sea, and the favorable wind of Pungaware was blowing strong, and it blew so for seven days and nights, and wafted them across the ocean. And at the end of that time they had again reached the shores of Hawaii. The name of the place at which they landed in Hawaii was Terai Fenua, they landed at night time, and drew their canoe up above high water mark, and laid it in the thickets, that none might see that strangers had arrived. Ngatororangi then went at once to a fortified village named Waitari Kapapa, and when he arrived there he walked carelessly up to the house of Kiwe, and peeping in at the door, said that she was wanted outside for a minute. And she, knowing his voice, came out to him immediately, and Ngatororangi questioned her saying, Have you anything to say to me? that I ought to know. And she replied, The whole tribe of Maniah are continually occupied in praying to their gods, at the sacred place, they pray to them to bring you and your tribe here, dead, perhaps their incantations may now have brought you here. Then Natoro asked her, In what part of the heavens is the sun when they go to the sacred place? And she answered, They go there early in the morning. Then Gatororangi asked her again, Where are they all in the evening? And she replied, In the evening they collect in numbers in their villages for the night, in the morning they disperse about. Then, just as Ngatororangi was going, he said to her, 
at the dawn of morning climb up on the roof of your house that you may have a good view, and watch what takes place. Having thus spoken, he returned to the main body of his party. Then Natoro related to them all that his sister had told him, and when they had heard this, Tangaroa, one of his chiefs, said, My counsel is, that we storm their fortress this night. But then stood up Ranjitu, another chief, and said, Nay, but rather let us attack it in the morning. Now arose Natoro, and he spake aloud to them and said, I agree with neither of you. We must go to the sacred place, and strike our noses until they bleed and we are covered with blood, and then we must he on the ground like dead bodies, every man with his weapon hid under him. And their priests will imagine that their enchantments have brought us here and slam us. So shall we surprise them. On hearing these words from their leader they all arose, and following him in a body to the courtyard of the sacred place. They found that the foolish priests had felt so sure of compelling their spirits by enchantments to bring Natoro and his tribe there, and to slay them for them, that they bad even prepared ovens to cook their bodies in. And these were all lying open ready for the victims. And by the sides of the ovens they had laid in mounds the green leaves, all prepared to place upon the victims before the earth was heaped in to cover them up, and the firewood and the stones were also lying ready to be heated. Then the one hundred and forty men went and laid themselves down in the ovens dug out of the earth, as though they had been dead bodies, and they turned themselves about, and beat themselves upon their noses and their faces until they bled. So that their bodies became all covered with blood, like the corpses of men slain in battle. And then they lay still in the ovens, the weapons they had with them were short clubs of various kinds, such as clubs of jasper and of basalt, and of the bones of whales. And the priests whom they had with them having found out the sacred place of the people of that country, entered it, and hid themselves there. Thus they continued to lie in the ovens until the sun arose next morning, and until the priests of their enemies, according to their custom each day at dawn, came to spread leaves and other offerings to the gods in the sacred place, and there. To their surprise, these priests found the warriors of Ngatoro Arangi all lying heaped up in the ovens. Then the priests raised joyful shouts, crying, At last our prayers have been answered by the gods, here, here are the bodies of the host of Natoro and of Tama lying heaped up in the cooking places. This has been done by our god he carried them off, and brought them here. The multitude of people in the village hearing these cries, ran out to see the wonder, and when they saw the bodies of the 140 lying there, with the blood and clots dried on them, they began to cry out one. I'll have this shoulder. Another, and I'll have this thigh, and a third, that head is mine, for the blood shed from striking their noses during the previous night was now quite clotted on their bodies. And the priests of those who were lying in the ovens having hidden themselves in the bushes of the shrubbery round the sacred place, could not be seen by the priests of the town of Maniah when they entered the sacred place. To perform the fitting rites to the gods. So these latter cried aloud, as they offered thanksgivings to the gods for having granted their prayers, and for having fulfilled their wishes. But just as their ceremonies were finished, the priests of the war party of Ngatoro Arangi rushing out of their hiding places upon the other priests, slew them, so that the priests were first slain, as offerings to the gods. Then arose the one hundred and forty men from the ovens, and rushed upon their enemies, all were slain, not one escaped but Maniah, and he fled to the town, but they at once attacked and carried the town by assault, and then the slaughter ceased. And the first battle at the sacred place was called Ihumoto Matokia, or the Battle of Bruised Noses, and the name of the town which was taken was Waitari Kapapa, but Maniah again escaped from the assault on the town. They entered the breaches in the town as easily as if they had been walking in at the door of a house left open to receive them, whence this proverb has been handed down to us, as soon as ever you have defeated your enemy, storm their town. The priests now turned over the bodies of the first slain, termed the holy fish, as offerings set apart for the gods, and said suitable prayers, and when these ceremonies were ended the conquerors cooked the bodies of their enemies. And devoured the whole of them. But soon afterwards the warriors of the other towns of Maniah which had not been assaulted, were approaching as a forlorn hope to attack their enemies. In the meanwhile Ngatoro Orangi and his warriors, unaware of this, had retired towards their canoe, whilst the host of warriors whom Maniah had again assembled were following upon their traces. 
They soon came to a stream which they had to pass, and fording that they left it behind them, and gained their canoe, but by the time they were there their pursuers had reached the stream they had just left. Ngatororangi now felt thirsty, and remembered that they had no water for the crew of the canoe, so he said, There is no water here for us. And Ranjitu hearing the voice of his commander, answered cheerfully, No, there is none here, but there is plenty in the stream we have just crossed. So they gave the great calabash of the canoe to Ranjitu, and he returned towards the stream, but before he got there the host of Maniah had reached it, and had occupied its banks. Ranjitu, who did not see them, as soon as he got to the edge of the stream, dipped his calabash to fill it, and as it did not sink easily, being empty and very light, he stooped down and put his hand upon it to press it under the water. And whilst he was holding it with one hand to press it down, one of the enemy, stealing on him, made a blow at him with his weapon. Ranjitu saw nothing, but merely heard the whiz of the weapon as it was sweeping down through the air upon his head, and quick as thought be jerks the calabash out of the water. And holds it as a shield in the direction in which he heard the blow coming down upon him. The weapon is parried off from one side of his head, but the calabash is shattered to pieces, and nothing but the mouth of the vessel which he was holding is left in his hand. Then off he darts, fast as he can fly, and reaches before the enemy Ngatoro Irangi and his 140 warriors, as soon as he is thus sure of support, in a moment he turns upon his foes. Ha, ha! He slays the first of the enemy, and carries off his victim. Then lo! Tangaroa has risen up, he is soon amongst the enemy, he slays and carries off the second man. Next, Tamati'i Kapua kills and carries off his man, thus is it with each warrior. The enemy then breaks and flees, and a great slaughter is made of the host of Maniah, yet he himself again escapes with his life. The name given to this battle was Turai Fenuakarao. Having thus avenged themselves of their enemies, they again returned to these islands and settled at Makitu, and cultivated farms there. Maniah, on his part, was not idle, for shortly after they had left his place of residence, he, with his tribe, set to work at refitting their canoes. Ngatororangi, in the meantime, occupied the island of Motidi, off Toranga, in the Bay of Plenty. There he built a fortified village, which he named Matarihua, and a large house ornamented with carved work, which he named Taimaihayorongo. And he made a large underground store for his sweet potatoes, which he named Temari Hope, and he and his old wife generally lived nearly alone in their village on Motidi, whilst the great body of their people dwelt on the mainland at Makitu. Whilst the old couple were in this way living on Motidi, suddenly one evening Manaya, with a large fleet of canoes and a whole host of warriors, appeared off the coast of the island, and they pulled straight up to the landing place. Opposite to the house of Ngatororangi, and lay on their paddles there, whilst Manaya hailed him, calling out, Ho! Brother-in-law, come out here if you dare, let us fight before the daylight is gone. Ngatororangi no sooner heard the voice of Manaya, then he came boldly out of the house, although he was almost alone, and there be saw the whole host of Maniah lying on their paddles at the anchorage off his landing place. But he at once hailed them, shouting out, Well done, O brother-in-law, just anchor where you are for the night, it is already getting dark, and we shall not be able to see to meet the edge of one weapon with the other. The warriors could not, therefore, parry one another's blows, tomorrow morning we will fight as much as you like. Maniah no sooner heard this proposal, than he assented to it, saying, You are right, it has already grown dark. And Natoro answered him, You had better bring to your canoes in the anchorage outside there. Maniah therefore told his army to anchor their canoes, and to lose no time in cooking their food on board. And the priest Ngatororangi remained in his fortress. All the early part of the night Ngatororangi remained in the sacred place, performing enchantments and repeating incantations, and his wife was with him muttering her incantations. And having finished them, they both returned to their house, and there they continued to perform religious rites, calling to their aid the storms of heaven. Whilst the host of Maniah did nothing but amuse themselves, singing hakas and songs, and diverting themselves thoughtlessly as war parties do, little did they think that they were so soon to perish. No, they flattered themselves that they would destroy Ngatoro Irangi, having now caught him almost alone. 
So soon as the depth of night fell upon the world, whilst Natoro and his aged wife were still in the house, and the old woman was sitting at the window watching for what might take place. She heard the host of Manaya insulting herself and her husband, by singing taunting war songs. Then the ancient priest Natoro, who was sitting at the upper end of the house, rises up, unloosens and throws off his garments, and repeats his incantations, and calls upon the winds, and upon the storms, and upon the thunder and lightning. That they may all arise and destroy the host of Manaya. And the god Tawirimati hearkened unto the priest, and he permitted the winds to issue forth, together with hurricanes, and gales, and storms, and thunders and lightnings. And the priest and his wife hearkened anxiously that they might hear the first bursting forth of the winds, and thunders and lightnings, and of the rain and hail. Then, when it was the middle space between the commencement of night and the commencement of the day, burst forth the winds, and the rain, and the lightning, and the thunder, and into the harbour poured all the mountainous waves of the sea. And there lay the host of Manaya overcome with sleep, and snoring loudly. But when the ancient priest and his wife heard the rushing of the winds and the roaring of the waves, they closed their house up securely, and lay composedly down to rest, and as they lay they could hear a confused noise, and cries of terror. And a wild and tumultuous uproar from a mighty host, but before very long, all the loud confusion became hushed, and nothing was to be heard but the heavy rolling of the surges upon the beach. Nor did the storm itself last very long it had soon ceased. When the next morning broke, the aged wife of Natoro went out of her house, and looked to see what had become of the host of Manaya, and as she cast her eyes along the shore, there she saw them lying dead, cast up on the beach. The name Gatororangi gave to this slaughter was Maikakudia, the name given to the storm which slew them all was Teaputahayapawa. He gave the name of Maikakudia to the slaughter, because the fish having eaten the bodies of Manaya's warriors, only their bones, and the nails of their hands and feet, but hardly any part of their corpses, could be found. Of the vast host of Manaya that perished, not one escaped, the body of Manaya himself they recognized by some tattoo marks upon one of his arms. Natoro now lighted a signal fire as a sign to his relations and warriors at Makidu that he wanted them to cross over to the island. And when his chosen band of 140 warriors saw the signal, they launched their canoe and pulled across to join their chief, and on reaching the island, they found that the host of Manaya had all perished. Thus was avenged the curse of Mutahenga and of Manaya. However, it would have been far better if the canoe Arawa had not been burnt by Ramadi, then Natoro and his warriors would have had two canoes to return into Hawaii to revenge their wrongs and the whole race of Manaya would have been utterly destroyed. It would also have been far better if Natoro and his people had remained at Makitu, and Bad never gone to Moha, then the Arawa would not have been burnt. For from the burning of that canoe by Ramadi sprang the war, the events of which have now been recounted. The Legend of Hatapedu and His Brothers When Tamati'i Kapua went with his followers to Mohau, the hill near Cape Colville, and Ihenga and his followers went to Rotorua, then Hanui, Haroe, and Hatapedu went also to Wakamaru, to Maroa. To Tuata, to Tutuka, to Turapaki, to Hahungaroa, to Hurekia, and to Horohoro, the districts which lie between Lakes Taupo and Rotorua, and between Rotorua and the head of the Waikato River, to snare birds for themselves. And followed their sport for many a day, until they had hunted for several months. But their little brother Hatapedu was all this time thinking to himself that they never gave him any of the rare dainties or nice things that they got, so that they might all feast together, but at each meal he received nothing but lean tough birds. So when the poor little fellow went and sat down by the side of the fire to his food, he every day used to keep on crying and eating, crying and eating, during his meals. At last, saucy, mischievous thoughts rose up in his young heart. So one day, Whilst his brothers were out snaring birds, and he, on this as on every other day, was left at their resting place to take care of the things, the little rogue crept into the storehouse, where the birds, preserved in their own fat, were kept in calabashes, and he stole some, and set resolutely to work to eat them, with some tender fern root, nicely beaten and dressed, for a relish. So that to look at him you could not help thinking of the proverb, Bravo, that throat of yours can swallow anything. 
he finished all the calabashes of preserved birds, and then attacked those that were kept in casks, and when he had quite filled himself he crept out of the storehouse again. And there he went trampling over the pathway that led to their resting place, running about this side, and that side, and all round it, that his brothers might be induced to think a war party had come, and had eaten up the food in their absence. Then he came back, and ran a spear into himself in two or three places, where he could not do himself much harm, and gave himself a good bruise or two upon his bead, and laid down on the ground near their hut. When his brothers came back they found him lying there in appearance very badly wounded, they next ran to the storehouse, and found their preserved birds all gone, so they asked him who had done all this, and he replied, A war party. Then they went to the pathways and saw the footmarks, and said, It is too true. They melted some fat, and poured warm oil on his wounds, and he revived. And they all ate as they used to do in former days, the brothers enjoying all the good things, whilst Hattapeta kept eating and crying, and he went and sat on the smoky side of the fire, so that his cruel brothers might laugh at him, saying, Oh! Never mind him. Those are not real tears, they are only his eyes watering from the smoke. Next day Hattapeta stopped at home, and off went his brothers to snare birds, and he began to steal the preserved birds again, and thus he did every day, every day, and of course at last his brothers suspected him. And one day they laid in wait for him, when he not foreseeing this, again crouched into the storehouse and began eating, ha, 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 we've caught you now then. Your thievish tricks are found out, are they, you little rogue? His brothers killed him at once, and buried him in the large heap of feathers they had pulled out from the snared birds. After this they went back to Rotorua, and when they arrived their parents asked them, Where is Hadapedu? What's become of your little brother? And they answered, We don't know, we have not seen him. And their parents said, You've killed him. And they replied, We have not, and they disputed and disputed together, and at last their parents said, it is too true that you must have killed him, for he went away with you, and he is missing now when you return to us. At length Hattapeta's father and mother thought they would send a spirit to search for him, so they sent one, and the spirit went. Its form was that of a flag, and its name was Tamimokiti Irangi, or he that buzzes in the skies, and it departed and arrived at the place where Hattapeta was buried, and found him and performed enchantments, and Hattapeta came to life again and went upon his way, and met a woman who was spearing birds for herself, and her spear was nothing but her own lips, and Hattapedu had a real wooden spear. The woman speared at a bird with her lips, but Hattapedu had at the same moment thrown his spear at the same bird, and it stuck into her lips, and when he saw this he ran off with all his speed, but he was soon caught by the woman. Not being able to go so fast as she could, for her feet bore her along, and wings were upon her arms, like those of a bird, and she brought him to her house, and they slept there. Hattapedu found that this woman never ate anything but raw food, and she gave the birds to Hattapedu to eat without their being in any way dressed, but he only pretended to eat them, lifting them up to his mouth, and letting them fall slyly. At dawn the woman prepared to go and spear birds, but Hattapedu always remained at home, and when she had departed, he began to cook food for himself and to look at all the things in the cave of rocks that the woman lived in at her two-handed wooden sword, at her beautiful cloak made of red feathers torn from under the wing of the kaka, at her red cloak of thick dog's fur, at her ornamented cloak woven from flax. And he kept thinking how he could run off with them all, and then he looked at the various tame lizards she had, and at her tame little birds, and at all her many curiosities, and thus he went on day after day. Until at last one day he said to her, Now, you'd better go a long distance today. To the first mountain range, to the second range, the tenth range, the hundredth range, the thousandth mountain range, and when you get there, then begin to catch birds for us too. To this she consented, and went. He remained behind roasting birds for himself, and thinking, I wonder how far she's got now. And when he thought she had reached the place he had spoken of, then B began to gather up her cloak of red feathers, and her cloak of dog's skins, and her cloak of ornamented flax, and her carved two-handed sword. And the young fellow said, How well I shall look when all the fine feathers on these cloaks are rustled by the wind. And he brandished the two-handed sword, 
and made cuts at the lizards, and at all the tame animals, and they were soon killed. Then he struck at the perch on which the little pet bird sat, and he killed them all but one, which escaped, and it flew away to fetch back the woman they all belonged to. Her name was Kurangaituku. And as the little bird flew along, these are the words he kept singing, Oh, Kurangaituku, our home is ruined, our things are all destroyed, and so it kept singing until it had flown a very long way. At last Kurangaituku heard it, and said, By whom is all this done? And the little bird answered, By Hatapetu everything is gone. Then Kurangaituku made haste to get home again, and as she went along she kept calling out, Step out, stretch along, step out, stretch along. There you are, O oh Hatapetu, not far from me. Step out, stretch along, step out, stretch along. There you are, O oh Hatapetu, not far from me now. She only made three strides before she had reached her cave, and when she looked about, she could see nothing in it. But the little bird still guided her on, as she kept saying, Step out, stretch along, step out, stretch along, I'll catch you there now, Hatapetu. I'll catch you there now, Hatapetu, and she almost caught Hatapetu. And he thought, I'm done for now. So he repeated his charm, O oh rock, open for me, open. Then the rock opened, and he hid himself in it, and the woman looked and could not find him. And she went on to a distance, and kept calling out, I'll catch you there, Hatapetu, and when her voice had died away at a great distance, Hatapetu came up out of the rock and made off. And thus they went on, and thus they went on, the whole way, until they came to Rotorua, and when they arrived at the sulfur springs, called Te Wakaravareva, Hatapetu jumped over these. But Kurangaituku thinking they were cold, tried to wade through, but sank through the crust, and was burnt to death. Hatapetu proceeded on and sat on the shore of the lake, and when the evening came, he dived into the water, and rose up at the island of Mokoya, and sat in the warm bath there. Just at this time his father and mother wanted some water to drink, and sent their slave to fetch some for them, and he came to the place where he found Hatapetu lying in the warm bath. Hatapetu laid hold of him, and asked him, Whom are you fetching that water for at this time of night? And he answered, For so and so. Then Hatapetu asked him, Where is the house of Hanui and of Haroe? And the slave answered, They live in a house by themselves, but what can your name be? And B answered him, I am Hatapetu. So the old slave said, O oh Hatapetu, are you still alive? And he replied, Yes, indeed. And the old slave said to him, Oh, I'll tell you, I and your father and mother live together in a house by ourselves, and they sent me down here to fetch water for them, and Hatapetu said, Let us go to them together. And they went, and on coming to them, the old people began to weep with a loud voice, and Hatapetu said, Nay, nay, let us cry with a gentle voice, lest my brethren who slew me should hear. And I, moreover, will not sleep here with you, my parents, it is better for me to go and remain in the cave you have dug to keep your sweet potatoes in, that I may overhear each day what they say, and I'll take all my meals there. So he went, and he said, Let my father sleep with me in the cave in the night, and in the daytime let him stop in the house. And his father consented, and thus they did every day and every night, and his brothers noticed that there was a change in their food. That they did not get so much or such good food as whilst their brother had been away, for his mother kept the best of everything for him. They had worse food now, so they beat their mother and their slaves, and this they did continually. At last, they heard the people all calling out, Oh, oh, Hatapet is here, and one of them said, Oh, no, that can't be, why, Hatapetu is dead. But when they saw it was really he, one of them caught hold of his two-handed wooden sword, and so did the others, and Hatapetu also caught hold of his two-handed wooden sword. He had decorated his head in the night, and had stuck it full of the beautiful feathers befitting a chief, and he had placed a bunch of the soft white down from the breast of the albatross in each ear. And when his brothers and the multitude of their followers dared him to come forth from the storehouse and fight them, he caught hold of his girdle and of his apron of red feathers. And girding on his apron he repeated an incantation suited for the occasion. When this was finished his head appeared rising up out of the storehouse, 
and he repeated another incantation, and afterwards a third over his sword. Hadapadu now came out of the storehouse, and as his brothers gazed on him, they saw his looks were most noble. Glared forth on them the eyes of the young man, and glittered forth the mother-of-pearl eyes of the carved face on the handle of his sword, and when the many thousands of their tribe who had gathered round saw the youth. They too were quite astonished at his nobleness. They had no strength left, they could do nothing but admire him, he was only a little boy when they bad seen him before, and now, when they met him again, he was like a noble chief. And they now looked upon his brothers with very different eyes from those with which they looked at him. His three brothers sprang at him, three wooden swords were at the same time leveled at Hadapetu to slay him. Be held the blade of his sword pointed to the ground, till the swords of his brothers almost touched him, when he rapidly warded off the blows, and whirling round his wooden sword, two of the three were felled by the blade of it. And one by a blow from the handle. Then they sprang up, and rushed at him once more, over they go again, two fell by the blade of his sword, and one by the handle, it was enough they gave in. Then their father said to them, Oh! My sons, I would that you were as strong in peace as you are in attacking one another, in seeking revenge for your ancestral canoe, Te Arawa, which was consumed in a fire by the chief Romedy. Long have you been seeking to revenge yourselves upon him, but you have not succeeded, you have gained no advantage, perhaps you are only strong and bold when you attack your young brother, my last-born child. When his sons Hanui, Haroe, and Karika heard these words of their father, they and their many followers felt their hearts grow sad, they began to prepare for a war party, by beating flat pieces of prepared fern root. And they cooked sweet potatoes in ovens, and mashed them, and packed them up in baskets of flax, and again put them in the ovens, that the food might keep for a long time. And they cooked shellfish in baskets, and thus collected food for an expedition to Makitu. Whilst his brothers were making all these preparations for the expedition, their father was secretly teaching how to pay to the tattoo marks and appearance of Romedy, so that he might easily recognize that chief. And when the canoes started with the warriors, he did not embark with them, but remained behind, the canoes had reached the middle of the lake, when Hadapeta rose up, and taking thirty cloaks of red feathers with him, went off to the war. He proceeded by diving under the water that was the path he chose, and when he reached the deepest part of the lake, he stopped to eat a meal of mussels in the water, and then rose up from the bottom and came out. He had got as far as Ngakawakua, when his brothers and the warriors in the canoes arrived there, and found him spreading out the cloaks he had brought with him to dry. And as soon as their canoes reached the shore they asked him, Where is your canoe, that you managed to get here so fast? And he answered, Never mind, I have a canoe of my own. Hadapedu. Threw off here the wreath of leaves he wore round his brow, and it took root, and became a pohutikua tree, which bears such beautiful red flowers. His brother's canoes had by this time got out into Rotoiti. Then he again dived after them, and rose to the surface, and came out of the water at Kuharua, where he threw off his wreath of totara leaves, and it took root and grew, and it is still growing there at this day. When his brothers and the warriors arrived at Kuharua, they found him sitting there, and they were astonished at his doings. They landed at Odoramri, and marching overland, encamped for the night at Kakaroa Tauhu, and the next day they reached Makitu, and when the evening came they ranged their warriors in divisions. 340 warriors were told off for each of the divisions, under the command of each of Hadapetu's three brothers, but no division was placed under his command. Hadapetu knew that the jealousy of his brothers, on account of their former quarrels, was the reason they had not told off any men for him, so he said, Oh, my brothers, I did not refuse to hearken to you, when you asked me to come with you. But I came, upon that occasion when you killed me, and here I am now left in a very bad position, so I pray you, let some of the warriors be placed under my command, let there be fifty of them. But they said to him, Poo, poo. Come now, you be off home again. What can you do? The only thing you are fit to destroy is food. He, the young man, said no more, but at once left his brothers, and on the same night he sought out a rough thicket as his resting place. And when he saw how convenient for his purpose was the place he had selected, 
he turned to and began to tie together in bundles the roots of the creeping plants, and of the bushes, and dressed them up with the cloaks he had with him. And when he had finished, the war band of these figures, which the young man had made, looked just like a band of real warriors. The day had hardly dawned, when the inhabitants of the place they had come to attack saw their enemies, and sent off messengers to tell the warriors, on this side and that side, that they should come and fight with them against the common enemy. In the meantime, all the warriors of the columns of Hattipeda's brothers were exhorting their men, and encouraging them by warlike speeches. First one chief stood up to speak, and then another, and when they had all ended, Hattipeda himself got up, to encourage his mock party. He had been sitting down, and as he gracefully arose, it was beautiful to see his plumes and ornaments of feathers fluttering in the breeze. The long hair of the young man was tied up in four knots, or clubs, in each of which was stuck a bunch of feathers, you would have thought he had just come from the Gannet Island of Kerwa, in the Bay of Plenty, where birds' feathers abound. And when he had done speaking to one party of his column, he unloosened his hair, leaving but one clump of it over the center of his forehead, and now he wore a cloak of red feathers, then he made another speech, encouraging his men to be brave. Then after sitting down again, he ran to the rear, and took all the feathers and knots from his hair, and he this time wore a cloak of flax with a broidered border. Again he addressed his men, and this being finished, he was seen again in the center of the body, standing up to speak, naked, and stripped for the fight. Once more he appeared at the head of the column. This time he had the hair at the back of his head tied up in a knot and ornamented with feathers, he wore a cloak made of the skins of dogs, and the long wooden war axe was the weapon he had in his hands. Having concluded this speech, he appeared again in a different place, with his hair tied in five bunches, each ornamented with feathers, whilst a large rough dogskin formed his cloak. And the weapon in his hand was a mere nineteen made of white whalebone, thus he ended his speeches to his party. When the people of the place they had come to attack saw how numerous were the chiefs in the column of Hattipedu, and what clothes and weapons they had, they dreaded his division much more than those of his brothers. His brothers' divisions had many warriors in them, although the number of chiefs was only equal in number to the divisions, thus there were three divisions, and also three chiefs. Whilst, although Hattipedu had only one division, it appeared to be commanded by a multitude of chiefs, who had superb dresses, thence the enemy burnt with fear of that division, which they accounted to be composed of men, but no. It was only formed of clumps of grass dressed up. Now the people of the place they were attacking drew out to the battle, and as they pressed nearer and nearer, they pushed forth long heavy spears, and sent forth volleys of light spears made of the branches of Manuka trees. At the column of Hanui. Alas! It is broken, they retreat, they fly, they fall back on the division of Haroe, they are here rallied, and ordered to charge, but they do not they only poke forward their heads, as if intending to go. The enemy has reached them, and is on them again, they are again broken and disordered, they run in now upon the third line, that of Karika. They are rallied, and again ordered to charge. But they only press forward the upper part of their bodies, as if intending to advance, when the enemy is already upon them in full charge. It is over, all the divisions of Hattipeda's brothers are broken and flying in confusion. What did it matter whether they were many or few, they were all cowards. Their enemies saw no brave men's faces, only the black backs of heads running away. All this time the division of Hattipeda appears to be sitting quietly upon the ground, and when the men in full retreat came running in upon it, Hattipeda rose up to order them to charge again. He cried out, Turn on them again, turn on them again. For a long time the enemy and Hattipedu were hidden from each other's view, at last they saw him. Then rushes forward Hattipedu from one party, and a chief of the enemy, named also Karika, like his brother, from the other, and the latter aims a fierce blow at Hattipedu with a short spear. He parries it, and strikes down Karika with his two-handed sword, who dies without a struggle, motionless, as food hidden in a bag, he draws forth his whalebone mirror, cuts off Karika's head, and grasps it by the hair. It is enough the enemy break fall back fly, then his brothers and their warriors turn again on the foes, and slay them, many thousands of them fall. Whilst his brothers are thus slaying the enemy, 
he is eagerly seeking for Ramadi, he is found. Hadapeda catches him, his head is cut off, it is concealed. The slaughter being ended, they return to their encampment, they cook the bodies of their enemies, they devour them. They smoke and carefully preserve their heads, and when all is done, each makes speeches boasting of his deeds, and one after the other, vaunting to have slain the great chief Ramadi. But Hadapeda said not a word of his having Ramadi's head. They return to Rotorua, this time he goes in a canoe with them, they draw near to the island of Mokoya, and his brothers, as they are in the canoe, chant songs of triumph to the gods of war, they cease. Their father inquires from the shore, which of you has the head of Ramadi? And one, holding up the head he had taken, said, I have, and another said, I have, at last, their father calls out, Alas, alas! Ramadi has escaped. Then Hadapeda stands up in the canoe, and chants a prayer to the god of war over a basket heaped up with heads, whilst holding up in his hand the head of Karika. Then his hand grasps the head of Ramadi, which he had kept it under his cloak, and he cries, There, there, I have the head of Ramadi. All rejoice. Their father strips off his cloak, rushes into the lake, and repeats a thanksgiving to the gods. When he had ended this, he promoted in honor his last-born child, and debased in rank his eldest sons. Thus at last was revenge obtained for the burning of the Arawa, and the descendants of Tamati'i Kapua emigrated, and came and dwelt in Pakator, and Ranjitahi was born there, and his children, and one of them came to Ranjua Kapua, or Rotorua, and dwelt there. And afterwards one of his daughters went to the Wakatohia tribe, at Apatiki. After that Ranjitahi and all his sons went to Ahuri, to revenge the death of the husband of Rangamai Papa, and she was given up to them as a reward. Then grew up to manhood Wenakukopeko, and began to visit all the people subject to him at Wakamaru, at Maroa, at Tutukau, at Tuata, and he went and afterwards returned to Pakator, and whilst going backwards and forwards, he lost his dog. Named Patakatavidi, at Mokoya. It was killed by Mataaho and Kawarero. He came back from Wakamaru to look for it, and when he found it had been killed, a great war was commenced against Rotorua, and some were slain of each party. After this, Rengi Tierer, the son of Rengi Wakiko, grew up to man's estate. In his time they stormed and took the island of Mokoya, and Rotorua was conquered by the son of Ranjitahi, who kept it still and still, until the multitude of men there increased very greatly, and spread themselves in all parts. And the descendants of Ngatororangi also multiplied there, and some of them still remain at Rotorua. Tumakoha begot Terawai, and Teringi Takororo, was one of his sons, his second son was Terwa, and his third was Taprahitoa. Legend of the Emigration of Turi The Progenitor of the Huanganui Tribes the following narrative shows the cause which led Turi, the ancestor of the Huanganui tribes, to emigrate to New Zealand, and the manner in which he reached these islands. Hoimachua, a near relation of Turi, had a little boy named Patakaroroa. This young fellow was sent one day with a message to Wenaku, who was an Ariki, or chief high priest, to let him know that a burnt offering had been made to the gods, of which Wenaku, as Ariki, was to eat part. And the little fellow accidentally tripped and fell down in the very doorway of Wakura, the house of Wenaku, and this being a most unlucky omen, Wenaku was dreadfully irritated, and he laid hold of the little fellow, and ate him up. Without even having the body cooked, and so the poor boy perished. Turi was determined to have revenge for this barbarous act, and to slay some person as a payment for little Patakaroroa, and, after casting about in his thoughts for some time as to the most effectual mode of doing this, he saw that his best way of revenging himself would be to seize Hapatiki, the little son of Wenaku, and kill him. One day Turi, in order to entice the boy to his house, ordered the children of all the people who dwelt there with him to begin playing together, in a place where Hapatiki could see them. So they began whipping their tops, and whirling their whiz gigs, but it was of no use, the little fellow could not be tempted to come and play with them, and that plan failed. At last summer it came with its heats, scorching men's skins. And Turi, one very hot day, ordered all the little children to run and bathe in the river Waimatuharangi, 
so they all ran to the river and began sporting and playing in the water. When little Hapatiki saw all the other lads swimming and playing in the river, he was thrown off his guard and ran there too, and Turi waylaid him, and killed him in a moment, and thus revenged the death of Patikaroroa. After killing the poor boy, Turi cut the heart out of his body, which was eaten by himself and his friends. But when, shortly afterwards, a chieftainess, named Hotukura, sent up a present of baskets of food to their sacred prince, to Wenaku, carried in the usual way by a long procession of people. Some of Turi's friends pushed into the basket of baked sweet potatoes prepared for Wenaku the heart of Hapatiki, cut up and baked too, and so it was carried up to Wenaku in the basket, and laid before him, that he might eat it. Wenaku, who had missed his little boy, being still unable to ascertain what had become of him, could not help sighing when he saw such an excellent feast, and said, Poor little Hapatiki, how he would have liked this. But he now no longer comes running to sit by my side at mealtime. And then he himself ate the food that was laid before him. He had hardly, however, ended his meal, when one of his friends, who had found what had been done, came and told him, saying, They have made you eat a part of Hapatiki. And he answered, Very well, let it be, he lies in the belly of Toiti Watahi, meaning by this proverb that he would have a fearful revenge. But he showed no other signs of feeling, that he might not gratify his enemies by manifesting his sorrow, or alarm them by loud threats of revenge. At this time Turi was living in a house, the name of which was Rangiadia, and there were born two of his children, Turangamua and Tanaroroa. One evening, Shortly after the death of Hapatiki, Rongorongo, Turi's wife, went out of the house to suckle her little girl, Tanaroroa, and she heard Wenaku in his house, named Werkura, chanting a poem, of which this was the burden. Oh! Let the tribes be summoned from the south. Oh! Let the tribes be summoned from the north. Let Ngadiruanui come in force. Let Ngadirangodia's warriors too be there that we may all our foes destroy, and sweep them utterly away. Oh, they ate one far nobler than themselves. When Rongorongo heard what Wenaku was chanting, she went back to her house, and said to her husband, Turi, I have just heard them chanting this poem in Werkura. And Turi answered, What poem do you say, it was? Then she hummed it gently over to her husband, and Turi at once divined the meaning of it, twenty and said to his wife, that poem is meant for me. And he knew this well, because, as he had killed the child of Wenaku, he guessed that they meant to slay him as a payment for the boy, and that the lament his wife had heard evinced that they were secretly laying their plans of revenge. He, therefore, at once started off to his father-in-law, Toto, to get a canoe from him, in which he might escape from his enemies, and Toto gave him one, the name of which was Aodia. The tree from which it had been made grew upon the banks of the Lake Waiharakeek. Toto had first hewn down the tree, and then split it, breaking it lengthways into two parts. Out of one part of the tree he made a canoe, which he named Matahorua, and out of the other part he made a canoe which he named Aodia. He gave the canoe which he had named Matahorua to Kuramarotini. And the canoe which he had named Aodia he made a present of to Rongorongo, thus giving a canoe to each of his two daughters. Matahorua was the canoe in which a large part of the world was explored, and Reddy was the name of the man who navigated it. One day Kyup and Hoturupa went out upon the sea to fish together, and when they had anchored the canoe at a convenient place, Kyup let down his line into the sea, and he said to his cousin, Hoturupa, Hotu, my line is foul of something. Do you, like a good young fellow, dive down and release it for me, but Hoturupa said, Just give me your line, and let me see if I cannot pull it up for you. But Kyup answered, It's of no use, you cannot do it. You had better give a plunge in at once, and pull it up. This was a mere stratagem upon the part of Kyup, that he might obtain possession of Kuramarotini, who was Hoturupa's wife. However, Hoturupa not suspecting this, good naturedly dived down at once to bring up Kyup's line. And as soon as he had made his plunge, Kyup at once cut the rope which was attached to the anchor, and paddled off for the shore as fast as he could go, to carry off Hoturupa's wife, Kormorotini. When Hoturupa came up to the surface of the water, the canoe was already a long distance from him, 
and he cried out to Kyup, Oh, Kyup, bring the canoe back here to take me in. But Kyup would not listen to him, he brought not back the canoe, and so Hoturapa perished. Kyup then made haste, and carried off Kuramurotini, and to escape from the vengeance of the relations of Hoturapa, he fled away with her, on the ocean, in her canoe Matahorua, and discovered the islands of New Zealand. And coasted entirely round them, without finding any inhabitants. As Kyup was proceeding down the cast coast of New Zealand, and had reached Castle Point, a great cuttlefish, alarmed at the sight of a canoe with men in it, fled away from a large cavern which exists in the south headland of the cove there. It fled before Kyup, in the direction of Raukua, or Cook Straits, when Kyup arrived at those straits, he crossed them in his canoe, to examine the middle islands. Seeing the entrance of Awaiti, now called Tori Channel, running deep up into the land, he turned his canoe in there to explore it, he found a very strong current coming out from between the lands, and named the entrance Karati Eo. Strong as the current was, Kyup stemmed it in his canoe, and ascended it, until he was just surmounting the crown of the rapid. The great cuttlefish or dragon, that had fled from Castle Point, which Kyup named Te Wika Muturangi, or the cuttlefish of Muturangi, had fled to Tori Channel, and was lying hid in this part of the current. The monster heard the canoe of Kyup approaching as they were pulling up the current, and raised its arms above the waters to catch and devour the canoe, men and all. As it thus floated upon the water, Kyup saw it, and pondered how he might destroy the terrible monster. At last he thought of a plan for doing this. He had already found that, although he kept on chopping off portions of its gigantic arms, furnished with suckers, as it tried to fold them about the canoe, in order to pull it down, the monster was too fierce to care for this. So Cube seized an immense hollow calabash he had on board to carry his water in, and threw it overboard, hardly had it touched the water ere the monster flew at it, thinking that it was the canoe of Cube, and that he would destroy it. So it reared its whole body out of the water, to press down the huge calabash under it, and Kyup, as he stood in his canoe, being in a most excellent position to cut it with his axe, seized the opportunity, and, striking it a tremendous blow. He severed it in two, and killed it. 21. The labors of Kyup consisted in this, that he discovered these islands, and examined the different openings which he found running up into the country. He only found two inhabitants in the country, a bird which he named the Kakako, and another bird which he named the Tewaiwaka. He, however, did not ultimately remain in these islands, but returned to his own house, leaving the openings he had examined in the country as signs that he had been here. Thus he left his marks here, but he himself returned to his own country, where he found Turi and all his people still dwelling, although it was now the fourth year from that one in which he had slain little Hopatiki. But Turi was then on the point of flying to escape from the vengeance of Wenaku, and as he heard of the discoveries Kyup had made, he determined to come to these islands. So he bade his canoe, the Aodia, drag down to the shore in the night, and Kyup, who happened to be near the place, and heard the bottom of the canoe grating upon the beach as they hauled it along, went to see what was going on. And when he found what Turi was about to do, he said to him, Now, mind, Turi, keep ever steering to the eastward, where the sun rises, keep the bow of your canoe ever steadily directed towards that point of the sky. Turi answered him, You had better accompany me, Kyup. Come, let us go together. And when Kyup heard this, he said to Turi, Do you think that Kyup will ever return there again? And he then continued, When you arrive at the islands, you had better go at once and examine the river that I discovered, said to be the Pater, its mouth opens direct to the westward. You will find but two inhabitants there, meaning the Kakako and Tewaiwaka, one of them carries its tail erect and sticking out, now do not mistake the voice of one of them for that of a man, for it calls out just like one. And if you stand on one side of the river, and call out to them, you will hear their cries answering you from the other. That will be the very spot that I mentioned to you. 22. Turi's brother-in-law, Tuau, now called out to him, Why, Turi? the paddles you are taking with you are good for nothing, for they are made from the Hyuho tree, Turi replied, wherever can I get other paddles now? And Tuao answered, just wait a little, until I run for the paddles of Taipararoa. And he brought back, and put on board the canoe, two paddles, 
the names of which were Rangiharona and Kautikiti Irengi, and two bailers, the names of which were Tipyohoronuku and Ringi Kawariko. Then Turi said, Tuau, come out a little way to see with me, and then return again, when you have seen me fairly started upon my long voyage. To this Tuau cheerfully consented, and got into the canoe, which was already afloat. Then were carried on board all the articles which the voyagers were to take, and their friends put on board for them seed, sweet potatoes, of the species called te cacao, and dried stones of the berries of the caraca tree. And some five edible rats in boxes, and some tame green parrots, and added some pepukiko, or large water hens, and many other valuable things were put on board the canoe, whence the proverb, Eodia of the valuable cargo. At last away floated the canoe, whilst it was yet night, and Tuau sat at the stem, gently paddling as they dropped out from the harbour. But when they got to its mouth, Turi called out to his brother-in-law, Tuau, you come and sit for a little at the house amidships, on the floor of the double canoe, and let me take the paddle and pull till I warm myself. So Tuau came amidships, and sat down with the people there, whilst Turi went astern and took his paddle. Then Turi and his people pulled as hard as they could, and were soon far outside the harbour, in the wide sea, Tuau, who had intended to land at the heads, at last turned to see what distance they had got. Alas! Alas! They were far out at sea. Then he called out to Turi, Oh, Turi, Turi, pray turn back the canoe and land me. But not the least attention did Turi pay to him. He persisted in carrying off his brother-in-law with him, although there was Tuau weeping and grieving when he thought of his children and wife. And lamenting as he exclaimed, How shall I ever get back to my dear wife and children from the place where you are going to? But what does Turi care for that, he still thinks fit to carry him off with him, and Tuau cannot now help himself. They were now so far out at sea that he could not gain the shore, for he could scarcely have seen where the land was whilst swimming in the water, as it was during the night time that they started. Lo! The dawn breaks. But hardly had the daylight of the first morning of their voyage appeared, than one of the party, named Tapo, became insolent and disobedient to Turi. His chief was therefore very wroth with him, and hove him overboard into the sea. And when Tapo found himself in the water, and saw the canoe shooting ahead, he called out to Turi quite cheerfully and jocosely, I say, old fellow, come now, let me live in the world a little longer. And when they heard him call out in this manner, they knew he must be under the protection of the god Maru, and said, Here is Maru, here is Maru. So they hauled him into the canoe again, and saved his life. At last the seams of Turi's canoe opened in holes in many places, and the water streamed into it, and they rapidly dipped the balers into the water and dashed it out over the sides. Turi, in the meanwhile, reciting aloud an incantation, which was efficacious in preventing a canoe from being swamped, they succeeded at length, by these means, in reaching a small island which lies in mid-ocean, which they named Rangitawa. There they landed, and ripped all the old lashings out of the seams of the canoe, and relashed the top sides onto it, and thoroughly refitted it. Amongst the chiefs who landed there with them was one named Potoru, whose canoe was called Terurino. They were carrying some dogs with them, as these would be very valuable in the islands they were going to, for supplying by their increase a good article of food, and skins for warm cloaks. On this island, they, however, killed two of them, the names of which were Wakapapatuakura and Tangikakariki. The first of these they cooked and shared amongst them, but the second they cut up raw as an offering for the gods, and laid it cut open in every part before them, and built a sacred place, and set up pillars for the spirits. That they might entirely consume the sacrifice. And they took the enchanted apron of the spirits, and spread it open before them, and wearied the spirits by calling on them for some omen, saying, Come, manifest yourselves to us, O gods, make haste and declare the future to us. It may be now, that we shall not succeed in passing to the other side of the ocean, but if you manifest yourselves to us, and are present with us, we shall pass there in safety. Then they rose up from prayer, and roasted with fire the dog which they were offering as a sacrifice, and holding the sacrifice aloft, called over the names of the spirits to whom the offering was made. 
And having thus appeased the wrath of the offended spirits, they again stuck up posts for them, saying as they did so. Tis the post which stands above there. Tis the post which stands in the heavens. Near Achivahimariwa. Thus they removed all ill luck from the canoes, by repeating over them prayers called Quenga, Tikanga, Wakamamamanga, etc., etc. When all these ceremonies were ended, a very angry discussion arose between Potoru and Turi, as to the direction they should now sail in. Turi persisted in wishing to pursue an easterly course, saying, Nay, nay, let us still sail towards the quarter where the sun first flares up. But Potoru answered him, But I say nay, nay, let us proceed towards that quarter of the heavens in which the sun sets. Turi replied, Why, did not Kyup, who had visited these islands, particularly tell us? Now mind, let nothing induce you to turn the prow of the canoe away from that quarter of the heavens in which the sun rises. However, Potoru still persisted in his opinion, and at last Turi gave up the point, and let him have his own way. So they embarked and left the island of Rangitawa, and sailed on a westerly course. After they had pursued this course for some time, the canoe Rurino getting into the surf, near some rocks, was lost on a reef which they named Tapitapuadia, being swept away by a strong current, a rapid current, by a swift running current. Swiftly running on to the realms of death. And the Rurino was dashed to pieces, hence to the present day is preserved this proverb, you are as obstinate as Potoru, who persisted in rushing on to his own destruction. When the Rurino had thus been lost, Turi, in the Aodia, pursued his course towards the quarter of the rising sun, and whilst they were yet in mid-ocean, a child, whom he named Tutua, was born to Turi. They had then but nine sweet potatoes left, and Turi took one of these, leaving now but eight, and he offered the one he took as a sacrifice to the spirits, and touched with it the palate of little Tutua, born in mid-ocean. At the same time repeating the fitting prayers. When they drew near the shore of these islands, one of the crew, named Tuanuyatiare, was very disobedient and insolent to Turi, who, getting exceedingly provoked with him, threw him overboard into the sea. When they had got near enough to the shore to see distinctly, they foolishly threw the red plumes they wore on their heads into the sea, these being old, dirty, and faded, from length of wear, for they thought, although wrongly. The red things they saw in such abundance on the shore were similar ornaments. At length the Aodia is run up on the beach of these islands, and the wearied voyagers spring out of her on to the sands, and the first thing they remark are the footprints of a man. They run to examine them, and find them to be those of Tuanuyatiare, whom Turi had shortly before thrown overboard, there can be no doubt of this, because some of the footprints are crooked, exactly suiting a deformed foot which he had. Turi having rested after his voyage, determined to start and seek for the river Pater, which Cube had described to him, and he left his canoe Aodia in the harbour, which he named after it. He travelled along the coastline from Aodia to Pater, having sent one party before him, under Pungarhu, ordering them to plant the stones of the berries of the Karaka tree, which they had brought with them all along their route. In order that so valuable an article of food might be introduced into these islands. Turi, who followed with another party after Pungarhu, gave names to all the places as they came along, when he reached the harbour of Kawia, he gave it that name or the Awinga of Turi. Then he came to Maricopa, or the place that Turi wound round to another spot, the river Waitera he named from the Terana, or wide steps which he took in fording it at its mouth, Moko, or Moka, he named from his sleeping there. At Mongatiai, they opened and spread out an enchanted garment named Hanakiko, and as all the people gazed at it, Turi named the place Matakitaki. At another place, near the lake at the Grey Institution at Taranaki, Turi took up a handful of earth to smell it, that he might guess whether the soil was good enough, and he named that place Hongihongi. Another place, six miles to the south of Taranaki, he named Tapui, or the footsteps of Turi, another place he named Okura, from the bright redness of the enchanted cloak Hanakiko, another place Kadikara, twelve miles south of Taranaki. Another river he named Reoa, from a piece of food he was eating nearly choking him there, another spot he named Kapokonui, a river thirty-four miles northwest of Pater, or the head of Turi. When they arrived there, 
the enchanted cloak Hanakiko was twice opened and spread out, so he called the spot Marikara, a place that they encamped that he named Kapuni, a river at Waimate, or the encampment of Turi. Another place he called Wangangoro, or the place at which Turi snored, another spot he named Tangaho, after his paddle, Ohingahape, he named after the crooked foot of Tuanuyatiare. A headland where there was a natural bridge running over a cave, he named Whitaka, from the long time he was fording in the water to turn the headland, because he did not like to cross the bridge, this is five miles north of Pater. At length he reached the river which Kyup had described to him. There he built a pa, or fortress, which he named Ranjitahi, and there he erected a post which he named Wakatopia, and he built a house which he named Matanjari, and he laid down a door sill, or threshold, which he named Papihakek. And he built a small elevated storehouse to hold his food, and he named it Payua, the river itself he named Pater, and he dug a well which he named Pararakitiuaryu. The farm he cultivated there he named Hikikaipapa. The wooden spade he made he called Tipuayahoma, then he had his farm dug up, and the chant they sang to encourage themselves, and to keep time as they dug, was. Break up our goddess mother. Break up the ancient goddess earth. We speak of you, O, oh, earth. But do not disturb. The plants we have brought hither from Hawaii the noble. It was Maui who scraped the earth in heaps round the sides. In Karatao. There they planted the farm. They had but eight seed potatoes, but they divided these into small pieces, which they put separately into the ground. And when the shoot sprang up, Turi made the place sacred with prayers and incantations, lest any one should venture there and hurt the plants, the name of the incantation he used was Ahuroa. Then harvest time came, they gathered in the crop of sweet potatoes, and found that they had eight hundred baskets of them. The deeds above related were those which our ancestor Turi performed. Rongo Rongo was the name of his principal wife, and they had several children, from whom sprang the tribes of Huanganui and the Ngadiruanui tribe. Legend of the Emigration of Maniah The progenitor of the Ngadiawa tribe The cause which led Maniah to come here from Hawaii was his being very badly treated by a large party of his friends and neighbors, whom, according to the usual custom when a chief has any heavy work to be done, he had collected to make his spears for him, for they violently ravished his wife Rangatiki. It chanced thus, one day Maniah determined to have his neighbors all warned to come to a great gathering of people for the purpose of making spears for him, so he sent round a messenger to collect them. And the messenger arrived at the place of Tipinu, who listened to his message, and he being chief of the tribe who lived at that place, encouraged his people to go in obedience to the message of Maniah. They went and set to work, and after some time it happened that Maniah felt a wish to go and catch some fish for his workmen, so he went off in his canoe with several of his people. After he had been gone for some time the workmen proposed amongst themselves to assault Rangatiki, the wife of Maniah, and they carried their intentions into execution without any one knowing what they were doing. All this time Maniah, suspecting nothing, was paddling in his canoe out to sea, and when he reached the fishing ground, they lay on their paddles. Maniah's people soon caught plenty of fish, but he had not even a single bite, until at last, as they were on the point of returning, he felt a fish nibbling at his hook, so he gave a jerk to his line to pull it up. And when he got the fish up to the side of the canoe, to his surprise he saw that the hook was not in the mouth of the fish, but fast in its tail. And as this had long been esteemed as a sign that your wife was being insulted by somebody he at once knew how his had been treated by his workmen. Without waiting, therefore, a moment longer, he said to his crew, Heave up the anchor, we will return to the shore, so they hove up the anchor, and shaped a course for the landing place on the main. Whilst they were pulling into the shore, Maniah took the fish he had caught, and with the hook still fast in its tail, tied it on to one of the thwarts of the canoe, and left it there. In order that when Rangatiki saw it she might know without his telling her, that he was aware that she had been badly treated by his workmen. At length his canoe reached the shore, and the crew jumping out, hauled it up on the sandy beach, and Maniah leaving it there, walked home towards his village. When he had got near home, his wife seeing him approach, arose and made the fire ready to roast some fern root for her husband, who she thought would come back hungry. 
And when he reached home the fire was lighted, and she was sitting by the side of it roasting the fern root, and she made signs to him by which he might know what had happened. But he knew it already from the manner in which his hook had caught in the tail of the fish, then he sent his wife to fetch the fish, saying, Mother, go and fetch the fish I have caught from my canoe. So she went, and when she got there, she found that there were no fish but the single one, hanging to the thwart of the canoe, with a hook fast in its tail. Then she took that fish and carried it home with her, and when she got there, Maniah said, That is the fish I meant you to bring, lest you should have said that I did not know what had taken place until you told me. Maniah then turned over in his mind various plans for revenging himself upon the people who had acted in so brutal a manner towards his wife, and he consulted with his own tribe how they might destroy those who had thus injured him. When the tribe of Maniah heard what had taken place, they all arose to seek revenge. But before the fighting which arose from this affair broke out, Maniah went to the people who had wronged his wife, and told them that he hoped they would make the spears large and strong, and not put him off with weak things. But rather make them stout and strong. This was a mere piece of deceit on his part, in order that when he attacked them, their weapons might be too heavy readily to parry their enemies' blows with them. All these preparations having been made, Maniah lay in ambush with some of his people, and when the opportunity of rushing on their enemies presented itself, Maniah nudged with his elbow his son, Tuyernui, who was lying by his side. To encourage him to distinguish himself by rushing in, and killing the first man of the enemy. But being afraid to go he did not move, and whilst Maniah was encouraging him in vain, another young man, the name of whose father had never been told by his mother, rushed forward and slew the first of the enemy. And as with his weapon he struck him down, he cried out, The first slain of the enemy belongs to me, to Kahukakanui, the son of Maniah. Then for the first time Maniah knew that this young man was his son, his last-born son, he had before thought that Tuyurnui had been his only son. But when the other young man called out his name, he knew that he also was his son, and, pleased with his courage, he loved him very much. The people lying in ambush, all followed the youth when he rushed on their enemies, and slaughtered them. But their chief Tupinu fled by the way of the beach of Pico Picoiweti, and Maniah pursued him closely, but was not fleet enough of foot to catch him, then he called out to his wife, Rangatiki, to utter incantations to weaken his enemy. And she did so, repeating an incantation termed Tapui, and when she had finished that, by her enchantment she rendered the flying warrior faint and feeble, so that Maniah rapidly gained on him, caught him, and slew him. Thus perished Tapinu and the party of people whom he had taken with him to work for Maniah, the report of what had occurred soon spread throughout the country, and at last reached the tribe of Tapinu. And when they heard it, they said, Your relatives have perished. Their army collected and started to avenge themselves on Maniah and his tribe, and to destroy them. They slew many of them, and continued from time to time to attack them, so that their numbers dwindled away, till at length Maniah began to reflect within. Himself saying, Ah, ah, my warriors are wasting away, and by and by, perhaps, I also shall be slain. Rather than let this state of things continue, I had better abandon this country, and, removing to a great distance, seek a new one for myself and my people. Having made up his mind to act in this way, he began to repair a canoe and to fit it for sea, the name of the canoe was Tokamaru, it belonged to his brother-in-law. When it was fit for sea, he asked his brother-in-law, Will you not consent to accompany me on this voyage? And the latter asked in reply, Where do you want me to accompany you to? Maniah said, I wish you to bear me company on this voyage which I am about to undertake, to search for a new and distant country for both of us. But his brother-in-law when he understood what Maniah was pressing him to do, replied, No, I will not go with you, Maniah answered, That is right, do you remain here. When the canoe was quite fit for sea, they dragged it down to the water, and hauled it into the sea until it floated. Then they brought down the cargo and stowed it away, and Maniah embarked in it with his wife, his children, and his dependents, and then he said to some of his warriors, Let my brother-in-law now be slain as an offering for the gods. That they may prove propitious to this canoe of ours. So he called to his brother-in-law, who was standing on the shore, bidding him farewell, 
I say, wait out to me for one minute, that I may tell you something, and take my last farewell, for I am going to part forever from you. Leaving you here behind me. When Manaya's brother-in-law heard this, he began to wade out to him. At first the water hardly covered his ankles, next it touches his knees, at last it came up above his loins, and when it had reached so high he said, shove the canoe in a little nearer the shore, I shall be under water directly. But Manaya answered him, wait away, there is no depth of water, and to deceive him better, he kept on pretending to touch the bottom with a stick, and the poor fellow having no suspicion, believed what Manaya said, that the water was not deep. But Manaya had spoken before to his people, saying, Let him come on, out into the deep water, until his feet cannot touch the bottom, then seize him by the head and slay him. At length his feet could no longer touch the bottom, and he found himself swimming close to the canoe, then Manaya seized him by the head, with one blow of his stone battle-axe he clave it, and his brother-in-law perished. Having thus slain his victim, he caught up his dog which had swum out with its master, and lifting it into the canoe, he sailed away, to search for a new country for himself. He sailed on and on, and had proceeded very far from the land they had quitted, when one day the dog Manaya had taken into the canoe scented land, and howled loudly, struggling to get loose and jump overboard into the water. The people in the canoe were much surprised at this, and said, Why, what can be the matter with the dog? And some of them said, We'd better let him go if he wishes it, and see what comes of it. So they let the dog loose, and he jumped overboard, and swam on ahead of the canoe, howling loudly as he went, and this he continued to do, till at last night fell on them, the canoe still followed for a long time the low faint howling of the dog, which they could only indistinctly hear. At last he had got so far off they could no longer distinguish it, but the dog, after swimming for a long time, finally reached land. In the meantime the canoe came following straight on the track which the dog had taken and when at length the night ended, and the day began to break, they again heard the howling of the dog, which had landed close to the stranded carcass of a whale. They pulled eagerly to the shore, and as soon as they reached it, there they saw the whale lying stranded, and the dog by its side, and there they landed on this island on Aodia. They were rejoiced, indeed, when they ascertained this was the country for which they had been seeking, first, they allotted out equally amongst them the whale they had found. But first Manaya addressed his men, saying, We must now build a house to shelter us, and then we will cut up the whale. His people at once obeyed their chief's directions. Some of them began to collect materials for building a shelter, and others to clear spots of ground, and to prepare them for planting. Some few of them called out, here is the best place for our village. Whilst others, on the contrary, cried out, No, no, this is the best place for it, and others still, who had got a little farther along the beach, cried out, Here is still a better place. And others, yet further ahead, said, Here, here, this is the best place we have yet seen. Thus all were led to leave their proper work, and to wander a long way along the shore, exploring the new country, and seeking for a site for their future home. At last they found that little by little they had been drawn a long way from the spot where they had landed, and from the whale which they had found. Now there were some other canoes coming close after the canoe, Tokomaru, which presently made the land, too, and reached the shore just at the point where the Tokomaru had been drawn up upon the beach. And they saw the marks of the Tokomaru upon the sand, and the sheds that had been put up, and the bits of land that had been cleared. And they, without delay, began to claim each one as his own, the sheds, the cleared ground, and the whale, which all belonged to the people of the canoe which had first landed. Then they went to search for the people who had come in that canoe, and when they had found them, each party saluted the other, and when their mutual greetings were over. Those who had come in the first canoe asked those who had come in the second, When did you arrive here? And they answered them by saying, When did you arrive here? Those of the first canoe answered, A long time ago. Then the people of the second canoe answered, And we also arrived a long time ago. Those who had come in the first canoe now replied, Nay, nay, we arrived here before you. Then those of the second canoe answered, Nay, nay, but we arrived here before you, and they continued disputing, arguing each party with the other. 
At last Manaya asked them, What are the proofs you give to show when you arrived here? And they answered, That is all very well, but what proofs have you to show when you arrived here? But Manaya replied, The proof I have to show when I arrived here is a whale of mine which I found upon the beach. Then the people who had come in the second canoe answered, I know, indeed, that whale belongs to us. But Manaya answered quite angrily, No, I say that whale belongs to me, just look you, you will find my shed standing there, and my temporary encampment, and the pieces of land which my people have cleared. But the others answered him, Nay, indeed those are our sheds, and our pieces of cleared land, and as for the whale, it is our whale, now let us go and examine them. So the whole party returned together, until they came to the place where they had landed, and when they saw all these things there, Maniah said, Look you, that whale belongs to me, as well as those sheds and the cleared pieces of land. But the others laughed at him and said, Why, you must have gone mad, all these houses belong to us, and the clearings, and that whale too. And Maniah, who was now quite provoked, replied, I say no. The clearings are mine, the sheds are mine, as well as the whale. The others, however, answered him, Very well, then, if that is the case, where is your sacred place? But Maniah replied, Where is your sacred place also then? And they answered, Come along, and see it. And they all went together to see the sacred place of these newly arrived people, and when they saw it, Maniah believed them. Although he gave credit to the fact of their having arrived first, Maniah was sorely perplexed and troubled, and he abandoned altogether the part of the country he had first reached, and started again to seek for another for himself. For his relations, and his people. They coasted right along the shores of the island from Wangapareoa, and doubled the North Cape, and from thence made a direct course to Taranaki, and made the land at Tongaparutu, between Parawinihai and Moko, and they landed there. And remained for some time, and left the god they worshipped there. The name of their god was Rakaira. They then turned to journey back towards Moko, some of them went by land along the coastline, and others in their canoe, the two parties keeping in sight of one another as they examined the coast. And when they reached the river Moko those in the canoe landed, and they left there the stone anchor of their canoe, it is still lying near the mouth of the river, on its north side, and the present name of the rock is the Pungomatori. Then they pulled back in the Tokamaru, to Tongaparutu, and leaving the canoe there, explored the country unto Pukuru, thence they went on as far as Papatiki, and there descended to the shore to the beach of Kukuriki, and travelling along it. They reached the river of Onero, forded it, and passed the plain of Motunui, and Kaweka, and Urenui. That river had a name before Maniah and his people reached it, but when Maniah arrived there with his son, Tuyurnui, he changed its name, and called it after his son, Tuyurnui. And they forded the river, and travelled on until they reached Rohutu, at the mouth of the river Waitera, and they dwelt there, and there they found people living, the native inhabitants of these islands. But Maniah and his party slew them, and destroyed them, so that the country was left for himself and for his descendants, and for his tribe and their descendants, and Maniah and his followers destroyed the original occupants of the country. In order to obtain possession of it, Maniah was the ancestor of the Ngadiawa tribe, he fought two great battles in Hawaii, the names of which were Kirikariwa and Rotorua, the fame of his weapons resounded there their names were Kihia and Reikia. And there also was known the fame of his son, of Kahukakanuya Maniah, of the youth who was baptized with the baptism of children whose fathers are not known. The Story of Hainmoa The Maiden of Rotorua and the man said to him, Now, O governor, just look round you, and listen to me, for there is something worth seeing here. That very spot that you are sitting upon, is the place on which sat our great ancestress Hainmoa, when she swam over here from the main. But I'll tell you the whole story. Look you now, Rengiuaryu was the name of the mother of a chief called Tatanakai, she was, properly, the wife of Wakaukaipapa, the great ancestor of the Ngadiwakau tribe. But she at one time ran away with a chief named Tuhurtoa, the great ancestor of the Tehuhu and the Ngatatuarita tribe, before this she had three sons by Wakao, their names were Tuwekhaima, Ngararanui, and Tudiedi. It was after the birth of this third son, 
that Rengiyuaryu eloped with Tuhurtoa, who had come to Rotorua as a stranger on a visit. From this affair sprang Titanikai, who was an illegitimate child. But finally, Wakao and Rengiyuaryu were united again, and she had another son whose name was Kapako, and then she had a daughter whom they named Tupa, she was the last child of Wakao. They all resided here on the island of Mokoya. Wakao was very kind indeed to Titanikai, treating him as if he was his own son, so they grew up here, Titanikai and his elder brothers, until they attained to manhood. Now there reached them here a great report of Hainmoa, that she was a maiden of rare beauty, as well as of high rank, for Omukaria, the great ancestor of the Ngadi Omukaria Hapu, or subtribe, was her father, her mother's name was Hainmaru. When such fame attended her beauty and rank, Titanikai and each of his elder brothers desired to have her as a wife. About this time Titanikai built an elevated balcony, on the slope of that hill just above you there, which is called Kaiwika. He had contracted a great friendship for a young man named Tiki, they were both fond of music, Titanikai played on the horn, and Tiki on the pipe, and they used to go up into the balcony and play on their instruments in the night. And in calm evenings the sound of their music was wafted by the gentle land breezes across the lake to the village at Owada, where dwelt the beautiful young Hainmoa, the young sister of Wahyao. Hainmoa could then hear the sweet-sounding music of the instruments of Titanikai and of his dear friend Tiki. Which gladdened her heart within her every night the two friends played on their instruments in this manner and Hainmoa then ever said to herself, Ah! That is the music of Titanikai which I hear. For although Hainmoa was so prized by her family, that they would not betroth her to any chief. Nevertheless, she and Titanikai had met each other on those occasions when all the people of Rotorua come together. In those great assemblies of the people Hainmoa had seen Titanikai, and as they often glanced each at the other, to the heart of each of them the other appeared pleasing, and worthy of love. So that in the breast of each there grew up a secret passion for the other. Nevertheless, Titanikai could not tell whether he might venture to approach Hainmoa to take her hand, to see would she press his in return, because, said he, perhaps I may be by no means agreeable to her. On the other hand, Hainmoa's heart said to her, If you send one of your female friends to tell him of your love, perchance he will not be pleased with you. However, after they had thus met for many, many days, and had long fondly glanced each at the other, Titanikai sent a messenger to Hainmoa, to tell of his love, and when Hainmoa had seen the messenger, she said, Ehu! Have we then each loved alike? Some time after this, and when they had often met, Titanikai and his family returned to their own village. And being together one evening, in the large warm house of General Assembly, the elder brothers of Titanikai said, Which of us has by signs, or by pressure of the hand, received proofs of the love of Hainmoa? And one said, It is I who have. And another said, No, but it is I. Then they also questioned Titanikai, and he said, I have pressed the hand of Hainmoa, and she pressed mine in return, but his elder brother said, No such thing. Do you think she would take any notice of such a low-born fellow as you are? He then told his reputed father, Wakao, to remember what he would then say to him, because he really had received proofs of Hainmoa's love. They had even actually arranged a good while before the time at which Hainmoa should run away to him, and, when the maiden asked, What shall be the sign by which I shall know that I should then run to you? He said to her, A trumpet will be heard sounding every night, it will be I who sound it, beloved paddle then your canoe to that place. So Wakao kept in his mind this confession which Titanikai had made to him. Now always about the middle of the night Titanikai, and his friend Tiki, went up into their balcony and played, the one upon his trumpet, the other upon his flute, and Hainmoa heard them, and desired vastly to paddle in her canoe to Titanikai. But her friend suspecting something, had been careful with the canoes, to leave none afloat, but had hauled them all up upon the shore of the lake, and thus her friends had always done for many days and for many nights. At last she reflected in her heart, saying, How can I then contrive to cross the lake to the island of Mokoya, it can plainly be seen that my friends suspect what I am going to do. So she sat down upon the ground to rest. And then soft measures reached her from the horn of Titanikai, 
and the young and beautiful chieftainess felt as if an earthquake shook her to make her go to the beloved of her heart, but then arose the recollection, that there was no canoe. At last she thought, perhaps I might be able to swim across. So she took six large dry empty gourds, as floats, lest she should sink in the water, three of them for each side, and she went out upon a rock, which is named Irrari Kapua, and from thence to the edge of the water, to the spot called Wearaway. And there she threw off her clothes and cast herself into the water, and she reached the stump of a sunken tree which used to stand in the lake, and was called Hinwada, and she clung to it with her hands, and rested to take breath. And when she had a little eased the weariness of her shoulders, she swam on again, and whenever she was exhausted she floated with the current of the lake, supported by the gourds, and after recovering strength she swam on again. But she could not distinguish in which direction she should proceed, from the darkness of the night, her only guide was, however, the soft measure from the instrument of Titanikai. That was the mark by which she swam straight to Wakemihia, for just above that hot spring was the village of Titanikai, and swimming, at last she reached the island of Mokoya. At the place where she landed on the island, there is a hot spring separated from the lake only by a narrow ledge of rocks, this is it it is called, as I just said, Wakemihia. Hindmoa got into this to warm herself, for she was trembling all over, partly from the cold, after swimming in the night across the wide lake of Rotorua, and partly also, perhaps, from modesty, at the thoughts of meeting Titanikai. Whilst the maiden was thus warming herself in the hot spring, Titanikai happened to feel thirsty, and said to his servant, Bring me a little water. So his servant went to fetch water for him, and drew it from the lake in a calabash, close to the spot where Hindmoa was sitting, the maiden, who was frightened, called out to him in a gruff voice like that of a man, Whom is that water for? He replied, It's for Titanikai. Give it there, then, said Hindmoa. And he gave her the water, and she drank, and having finished drinking, purposely threw down the calabash, and broke it. Then the servant asked her, What business had you to break the calabash of Titanikai? But Hindmoa did not say a word in answer. The servant then went back, and Titanikai said to him, Where is the water I told you to bring me? So he answered, Your calabash was broken. And his master asked him, Who broke it? And he answered, The man who is in the bath. And Titanikai said to him, Go back again then, and fetch me some water. He, therefore, took a second calabash, and went back, and drew water in the calabash from the lake, and Hindmoa again said to him, Whom is that water for? So the slave answered as before, For Titanikai. And the maiden again said, Give it to me, for I am thirsty, and the slave gave it to her, and she drank, and purposely threw down the calabash and broke it, and these occurrences took place repeatedly between those two persons. At last the slave went again to Titanikai, who said to him, Where is the water for me? And his servant answered, It is all gone your calabashes have been broken. By whom? said his master. Didn't I tell you that there is a man in the bath? Answered the servant. Who is the fellow? said Titanikai. How can I tell? replied the slave, Why, he's a stranger. Didn't he know the water was for me? said Titanikai, How did the rascal dare to break my calabashes? Why, I shall die from rage. Then Titanikai threw on some clothes, and caught hold of his dub, and away he went, and came to the bath, and called out, Where's that fellow who broke my calabashes? And Hindmoa knew the voice, that the sound of it was that of the beloved of her heart, and she hid herself under the overhanging rocks of the hot spring. But her hiding was hardly a real hiding, but rather a bashful concealing of herself from Titanikai, that he might not find her at once, but only after trouble and careful searching for her. So he went feeling about along the banks of the hot spring, searching everywhere, whilst she lay coyly hid under the ledges of the rock, peeping out, wondering when she would be found. At last he caught hold of a hand, and cried out, Hollow, who's this? And Hindmoa answered, It's I, Titanikai. And he said, But who are you, who's I? Then she spoke louder, and said, It's I, tis Hindmoa. And he said, Ho! 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 Can such in very truth be the case? 
let us two go then to my house. And she answered, Yes, and she rose up in the water as beautiful as the white heron, and stepped upon the edge of the bath as graceful as the shy white crane. And he threw garments over her and took her, and they proceeded to his house, and reposed there, and thenceforth, according to the ancient laws of the Maori, they were man and wife. When the morning dawned, all the people of the village went forth from their houses to cook their breakfasts, and they all ate, but Tatanakai tarried in his house. So Wakao said, This is the first morning that Tatanakai has slept in this way, perhaps the lad is ill bring him here rouse him up. Then the man who was to fetch him went, and drew back the sliding wooden window of the house, and peeping in, saw four feet. Oh! He was greatly amazed, and said to himself, Who can this companion of his be? However, he had seen quite enough, and turning about, hurried back as fast as he could to Wakao, and said to him, Why, there are four feet, I saw them myself in the house. Wakao answered, Who is his companion then? Hasten back and see. So back he went to the house, and peeped in at them again, and then for the first time he saw it was Heinmoa. Then he shouted out in his amazement, Oh! Here's Heinmoa, here's Heinmoa, in the house of Tatanakai. And all the village heard him, and there arose cries on every side, Oh! Here's Heinmoa, here's Heinmoa with Tatanakai. And his elder brothers heard the shouting, and they said, It is not true. For they were very jealous indeed. Tatanakai then appeared coming from his house, and Heinmoa following him, and his elder brothers saw that it was indeed Heinmoa, and they said, It is true. It is a fact. After these things, Tiki thought within himself, Tatanakai has married Heinmoa, she whom he loved, but as for me, alas! I have no wife, and he became sorrowful, and returned to his own village. And Tatanakai was grieved for Tiki. And he said to Wakao, I am quite ill from grief for my friend Tiki, and Wakao said, What do you mean? And Tatanakai replied, I refer to my young sister Tupa, let her be given as a wife to my beloved friend, to Tiki. And his reputed father Wakao consented to this, so his young sister Tupa was given to Tiki, and she became his wife. The descendants of Hainmoa and of Tatanakai are at this very day dwelling on the lake of Rotorua, and never yet have the lips of the offspring of Hainmoa forgotten to repeat tales of the great beauty of their renowned ancestress Hainmoa. And of her swimming over here. And this too is the burden of a song still current. The story of Marutwahu, the son of Hotunui, and of Kahwari Moa, the daughter of Paka. Hotuanui was one of those chiefs who arrived in New Zealand from a land beyond the ocean. The Tainui was the canoe in which he arrived in these islands. He left Kauia, where he first settled, and came overland to Horaki, and finally took up his residence in a village called Wakadewe. He had, at Kauia, a son called Marutwahu, but Hotunui was not there when this child was born. The cause which made him come from Kawia to Horaki was a false accusation that was brought against him regarding a storehouse of sweet potatoes belonging to another chief, a friend of his. The accusation arose in this way. Hotunui went out of his house one night, almost at the same moment that a thief had gone out to rob this storehouse, it was very unfortunate that they should both have gone out nearly at the same moment, just about midnight. When day dawned, Hotunui came out of his house, and people in the morning had seen his footsteps, right along the path by which the thief had gone, and there were the sweet potatoes dropped all along the path. And as the soles of Hotunui's feet were very large, his footprints had quite erased those of the thief. So presently they brought an accusation against Hotunui, that he had stolen the sweet potatoes. At this time Hotunui's wife had just conceived Marutwahu, but he was so overcome by shame at the accusation brought against him. That the thought came into his mind to run away from wife and all and go to Horaki to seek another residence for himself. His seed was ready, and he had dug his land, and prepared the ground for planting it, but had not yet put in the seed, when he went to his wife and said, Now, remember, when the child is born, if it is a boy call it Marutwahu, and if it is a girl. Call it Pertwahu, either name meaning the field made ready for planting, in remembrance of that cultivation of mine, prepared for planting to no purpose. 
Then Hotunui went off to Horaki, and resided at Wakatewe, and became the chief of the people of that country, and he took another wife, the young sister of a chief named Tewatu, and she bore him a child named Paka. When Marutwahu came to man's estate, he took up his club, and asked his mother, saying, Mother, show me the mountain range that is near my father's abode, and the mother said, Look my child towards the place of sunrise. And her son said, What, there? And he was answered by his mother, Yes, that is it Horaki, and Marutwahu answered, Tis well, I understand. Then Marutwahu started with his slave, and travelled towards Horaki, and they carried with them a spear for killing birds. This they took as a means of procuring food on the journey, as they came by way of the wooded mountains where birds are plentiful. They were a whole month before they arrived at Kohukahunui, and reached the outskirts of the forests there early one morning, at the same time that two young girls, the daughters of Tewatu, the chief of Horaki, were coming along the same path from the opposite direction. Marutwahu was up in a forest tree, spearing toy birds, at the moment when the two girls saw the slave sitting under the tree in which Marutwahu was killing birds, and his master's cloak lying on the ground by him. The two girls came merrily along the path, the youngest sister was very beautiful, but the eldest was plain, and when they saw the slave of Marutwahu, the youngest one, who had seen him first, called out playfully, Ah! There's a man will make a nice slave for me. Where? said the eldest sister, where is he? And the youngest replied, There, there, cannot you see him sitting at the root of that tree? Then up they ran towards him, sportively contesting with one another whose slave he should be, and the youngest got there first, and therefore claimed him as her slave. All this time Marutwahu was peeping down at the two girls from the top of the tree, and they asked the slave, saying, Where is your master? He answered, I have no master but him. Then the girls looked about, and there was the cloak lying on the ground, and a heap of dead birds, and they kept on asking, Where is he? But it was not long before a flock of toys settled on the tree where Marutwahu was sitting. He speared at them, and struck a toy, which made the tree ring with its cries, the girls heard it, and looking up, the youngest saw the young chief sitting in the top boughs of the tree, and she at once called up to him, Ah! You shall be my husband, but the eldest sister exclaimed, you shall be mine, and they began jesting and disputing between themselves which should have him for a husband, for he was a very handsome young man. Then the two girls called up to him to come down from the tree, and down he came, and dropped upon the ground, and pressed his nose against the nose of each of the young girls. They then asked him to come to their village with them. To which he consented, but said, You two go on ahead, and leave me and my slave, and we will follow you presently, and the girls said, very well, do you come after us. Marutwahu then told his slave to make a present to the girls of the food they had collected, and he gave them two bark baskets of pigeons, preserved in their own fat, and they went off to their village with these. Marutwahu stopped behind with his slave, and as soon as the girls had gone, he went to a stream, and washed his hair in the water, and then came back, and combed it very carefully, and after combing it, he tied it up in a knot and stuck fifty red caca feathers in his head, and amongst them he placed the plume of a white heron, and the tail of a huya, as ornaments. He thus looked extremely handsome, and said to his slave, Now, let us go. It was not very long before the two young girls came back from the village to meet their so-called husband, that they might all go in together. And when they came up to him, there he was seated on the ground, looking quite different from what he did before, for he now appeared as handsome as the large crested cormorant. He had on outside, a puera cloak, within that, a cloak called the kaha kaha, and under that again, a garment called the kopu, this in ancient times made up the dress of a great chief. The two young girls felt deeply in love with him when they saw him and they said to Maru, come along to our father's village with us. And he again consented, and told his slave to keep with them, and as they all went along, Maru stopped a little until he was some way behind, for he thought that the girls had not found out who he was, as they proceeded. Seeing that Maru did not follow them fast, they asked his slave, who kept along with them, What is the name of your master? And the slave answered, Is there no chief of the west coast of the island whose fame has reached this place? 
And the young girl said, Yes, the fame of one man has reached this place, the fame of Marutwahu, the son of Hotunui. And the slave answered, This is he, and the girls replied, Dear, dear, we had not the least idea that it was he. By this time Maru was coming up again to join them, for he guessed the girls had asked his slave who he was, and that they had been told, but the girls ran off together to Hotunui, and their father Tewaru, to inform them who was coming. As they had previously left the old men waiting for their return, but presently the two girls changed their plan, and arranged between themselves, that the youngest should run quickly to tell Hotunui that his son was coming. And that the eldest sister should be left to lead Marutwahu to the village, and in this way they proceeded, those who were going slowly to the village loitering along, whilst the younger sister was far ahead, running as fast as she could. And crying out as she came near the village, Are you there, O Hotunui? Here's your son coming here is Marutwahu. Then Hotunui called out with a loud voice, Where is he? And she replied, Here he comes, he is coming along close behind me, make haste and have the floor of the house covered with fine mats for him, so that he may have a fitting reception. Marutwahu soon came in sight, and as he was seen approaching, he looked as handsome as the beautiful crested cormorant. The people got upon the defences of the village, and ran outside the gates, to look at him, and the young girls all waved the corners of their cloaks, crying out, Welcome, 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 make haste. Make haste, and he stepped boldly out, and reached the village. As soon as he had arrived there, they all wept over him, and when they had done weeping, they sat down, and formed a semicircle, with Marutwahu at the open part, and Hotunui stood up to make a speech of welcome to his son. And he spoke thus, Welcome, welcome, oh, my child, welcome to Horaki, welcome. You are very welcome. You have suddenly appeared here, urged by your own affections. You are very welcome. Having said this, Hotunui sat down again. Then Marutwahu jumped up to make a speech in reply, and he said, That is right, that is right, oh, my father, call out to your child, you are welcome. Here I am arrived at Horaki, here I am seeking out my father's village in Horaki, but I, who am the mere slave of my father, can say nothing in answer to his welcome, here I am arrived at your village, it is for you to speak. A young man just arrived from the forests has no fitting word to say in your presence. Thus he ended his speech, and a feast was spread out, and they all fell to eating, for they had killed ten dogs for the feast, and the chiefs all ate, and the two young girls. But, although no one knew it, the two sisters were all the time quarreling with each other as to which of them should have Marutwahu for a husband, the heart of one of them whispered to her, he shall be mine. But the heart of the other young girl said just the same thing to her. The feast being ended, they left the common part of the pa where food was eaten, and moved on one side, to the sacred precincts. When the evening came on a fire was kindled in the house, and the eldest girl, not seeing her younger sister, went to her father to ask for her, and was told that she had been given as a wife to Marutwahu. At this she was exceedingly vexed, and provoked with her sister, for although she was plain, she thought to herself, I am very pretty, and I am sure, there's not the least reason why Marutwahu should be frightened at me. And she went off to quarrel with her younger sister, but Marutwahu did not like her upon account of her plainness, and her pretty sister kept him as her husband. Tepaka, the son of Hotunui, the nephew of Tewaru, and the younger brother of Marutwahu, had grown up to be a young man, so they gave him the elder daughter of Tewatu to be his wife. Thus the elder sister was married, as well as the young one, who was given to Marutwahu for his wife, and Tepaka's wife bore him a daughter, whom they called Te Kahirimoa. The youngest daughter of Tewaru, whom Marutwahu married, bore him three children, Tamatiipa, Tamatiare, and Wananga, from Tamatiipa sprang the Ngadiranga tribe. From Tamatiare sprang the tribe of Ngadi Tamatiare and from Wananga sprang the Ngadi Wananga tribe. Whilst Marutwahu was living at Horaki, his father Hotunui told him how very badly some of the people of that place had treated him. These were the facts of the case, as the old chief related them to him, one day, when the canoes of the tribe came in full of fish, after hauling their nets. He sent down one of his servants from his house to the canoe to bring back some fish for him, 
and when the servant ran down for this purpose, the man who owned the net said to him, Well, what brings you here? Upon which his servant answered, Hotunui sent me down, to bring up some fish for him, he quite longs to taste them. Upon which the owner of the nets cursed Hotunui in the most violent and offensive manner, saying, Is his head the flax that grows in the swamp at Otoi? Or is his top knot flax, that the old fellow cannot go there to get some flax to make a net for himself with, instead of troubling me? When Hotunui's servant heard this, he returned at once to the house, and his master not seeing the fish, said, Well, tell me what is the matter, so he replied, I went as you told me, and I asked the man who had been hauling the net for some fish. And he only looked up at me. Again I asked him for some fish, and then he said, Who sent you here to fetch fish, pray? Then I told him, Hotunui sent me down to bring up some fish for him, be quite longs to taste them. Then the man cursed you, saying to me, Is Hotunui's head the flax that grows in the swamp at Otoi, or is his top knot flax, that the old fellow cannot go there? to get some flax to make a net with for himself. When Hotunui had told this story to Marutwahu, he said, Now, oh, my son, this tribe is a very bad one, they seem bent upon lowering the authority of their chiefs. The heart of Marutwahu felt very gloomy when he heard his father had been treated thus, and Hotunui said to him, You may well look sad, my son, at hearing what I have just said, this tribe is composed of very bad people. And Marutwahu replied, leave them alone, they shall find out what such conduct leads to. Then Marutwahu began to catch and dry great quantities of fish for a feast, and he worked away with his men at making fishing nets, until he had collected a very great number. It was in the winter that he began to make these nets, and the winter, spring, summer, and part of autumn passed, before they were finished. Then he sent a messenger to the tribe who had cursed his father, to ask them to come to a feast, and to help him to stretch these nets, and when the messenger came back, Marutwahu asked him, Where are they? And the messenger answered, The day after tomorrow they will arrive here. Then Marutwahu gave orders, saying, Tomorrow let the feast be ranged in rows, so that when they arrive here they may find it all ready for them. Upon this they all retired to rest, and when the dawn appeared they arranged the food to be given to the strangers in rows, the outside of the rows was composed of fish piled up. But under these was placed nothing but rotten wood and filth, although the exterior made a very goodly show. He intended this feast to be a feast at which those who came as guests should be slaughtered, in revenge for the curse against Otunui, which had exceedingly pained his heart. Soon after daybreak the next morning the guests came, and seeing the piles of provisions which were laid out for them, they were exceedingly rejoiced, and longed for the time of their distribution, and when they might touch this food. Little thinking how dearly they were to pay for it. The guests had all arrived and taken their seats upon the grass, when Marutwahu and his people came together, they were only 140. As they were to stretch the great net made up of all the small ones upon the next morning, on that evening they put all the nets and ropes into the water to soak them, in order to soften the flax of which they were made so that they might be more easily stretched. And when the morning dawned those who had come for the purpose began to draw out the net, stretching the rope and the bottom of the net along the ground, and pegging it tight down from comer to comer. And thus whilst Marutwahu's people were preparing food for them to eat, the others worked away at stretching the net taut, and pegging it fast to the ground to hold it. It was not long before they had finished this and had put on the weights to sink it. Marutwahu sent a man to see whether they had finished stretching the net, and when the man came back, he said, Have they done stretching the net? And the man answered, Yes, they have finished. Then Marutwahu said, Let us go and lift the upper end of the net from the ground, they have finished the lower end of it. Then the 140 men went with him, each one carrying a weapon, carefully concealed under his garments, lest their guests should see them. And when they reached the place where the net was, they found the guests, nearly a thousand in number, had finished stretching the lower end of the net. Then the priest of Marutwahu who was to consecrate the net said, Let the upper end of the net be raised, so that the net may be stretched straight out, and Marutwahu said, Yes, let it be done at once, it is getting late in the day. Then the one hundred and forty men began to lift up the net, with the left hand they seized the ropes to raise it, 
but with the right hand each firmly grasped his weapon, and Marutwahu shouted out, Lift away, lift away, lift it well up. When they had raised it high in the air, they walked on with it, holding it up as if they were spreading it out, until they got it well over the strangers, who were either pegging the lower end down, or were seated on the ground looking on. Then Marutwahu shouted out, Let it fall, and they let it fall, and caught in it their guests, nearly a thousand in number. They caught every one of them in the net, so that they could not move to make any effectual resistance, and whilst some of the one hundred and forty men of Marutwahu held the net down, the rest slew with their weapons the whole thousand. Not one escaped, whilst they lost not a single man themselves. Hence, the Feast of Rotten Wood is a proverb amongst the descendants of Marutwahu to this day. This Feast of Rotten Wood was given at a place which was then named Pukohau, but which was afterwards called Karahitangada, or, men were the weights which were attached to the net to sink it. Upon account of the thousand people who were there slain by treachery in the net of Marutwahu. For men were the weights that were attached to that net to sink it. After the death of all these people, the country they inhabited became the property of Marutwahu, and his heirs dwell there to the present day. About the time that Te Kahirimoa, Paka's daughter, became marriageable, a large party of visitors arrived at Werkawa, the village of Te Paka, they came from Aodia, or the Great Barrier Island. At their head was the principal chief of Aodia, and he brought in his canoes a present of 260 baskets of mackerel for Te Paka, and they became such good friends that they thought they would like to be connected. So it was arranged that Te Paka's daughter, Te Kahirimoa, should be given as a wife to the son of that chief. Part of Te Paka's plan was to get possession of Aodia for his family, for he thought when his daughter had children, and they were grown up, that it was possible they would secure the island for their grandfather, or for their mother's family. When the party of visitors was about to return to Aodia, having formed this connection with Te Paka's tribe through the girl, her father gave her up to them to take to Aodia to her husband, and he told his daughter to go on board the canoe and to accompany them to Aodia. But he told her to no purpose, for she did not obey him, in short, Te Kahirimoa refused to go. So the old chief to whom the canoes belonged said, Never mind, never mind, leave her alone, we shall not be long away, we shall soon return, we shall not be long before we are back. And they left Te Kahirimoa with her father, and paddled off in their canoes. In one month's time they came back again, and brought with them a present of thirty baskets of mackerel, and as soon as they arrived they distributed these amongst their friends. And down ran Te Kahirimoa from the village to the landing place to take a basket of mackerel for herself. As soon as Paka saw this, he gave his daughter a sound scolding for going and taking the fish. This is what Paka said to his daughter, Put that down, you shall not have it, I wanted you to go and become the wife of the young chief of the place where these good fish abound and you refuse to go, therefore you shall not now have any. This was quite enough, poor little Te Kahirimoa felt entirely overcome with shame, she left the basket of fish, dropping it just where she was, and ran back into the house, and began to sob and cry. Then her thoughts suggested to her, that after this, it would be better that she should be no more seen by the eyes of her father, and that her father's face should be no more seen by her, and her heart kept on urging her to run away to Takakapiri and to take him for her lord. She had seen him, and liked him well, he was a great chief, and had abundance of food of the best kind on his estates, plenty of potted birds of all kinds, and kiwis, and kiors, and wakas, and eels, and mackerel, and crayfish. In short, he had abundance of all kinds of food, and was rich in every sort of property. As she thought of all this, the chief's young daughter continued weeping and sobbing in the house, quite overcome with shame, and when evening came she was still crying, but at night, she said to herself, now I'll be off. Whilst all the men are fast asleep. So she got up and ran away, accompanied by her female slave. The next morning when the sun rose they found she was gone, and she had fled so far, that those who were sent to seek her came to the footprints of herself and her slave. Their edges had so sunk down that the pursuers could not tell how long it was since she had passed. Waipuna was the village from which Te Kahirimoa started, and they had left Pukurakoro behind them, and by the time it was full daybreak they had reached Waitakururu, 
and as the full rays of the sun shone on the earth. They were passing above Puerua. Then for a little time they traveled very fast and reached Rewaki, at the mouth of the river Piako, this they crossed and pushed on for Opani, and thence those in pursuit of them returned, they could follow them no farther. The tide also was flowing, which stopped the pursuit. Just then some of the canoes of the upriver country were returning from Ruawea, and when the people in the canoes saw her, they raised loud cries of, Ho, ho! Here's Te Kahirimoa, here's the daughter of Paka, she stepped into one of the canoes with them, and the people kept crying out the whole way from the mouth of the river up its course as they ascended it, Here's Te Kahirimoa. And they rowed very fast, feeling alarmed at having so great a chieftainess on board, and so confused were they at her presence, that throughout the whole day they kept on bending their heads down to their very paddles, as they pulled. They stopped at Raupa, where the Awaitia branches off to Taranga, and there they spent one night, and the next day they went over the range towards Kadi Kadi, the people of Raupa urged her to stop there for a little. She, however, would not, but driven by the fond thoughts of her heart, she pressed onwards, and reached the summit of the ridge of Hikurangi, and looked down upon Kadi Kadi, and saw also Toranga. Then the young girl turned, and looked round at the mountain at Ottawa, and although she knew what it was, she liking to hear his name, and of his greatness, spoke to the people of the country, who, out of respect were accompanying her, and asking. Said, What is the name of yonder mountain? And they answered her, That is Ottawa. And the young girl asked again, Is the country of that mountain rich in food? And they replied, Oh, there are found kiors, and kiwis, and wakas, and pigeons, and tues. Why that mountain is famed for the variety and number of birds that inhabit it. Then the young girl took courage, and asked once more, Whom does all that fruitful country belong to? And they told her, The Waitaha is the name of the tribe that inhabit that country, and Takakapiri is the chief of it. He is the owner of that mountain, and he is the great chief of the Waitaha, and when the people of that tribe collect food from the mountains, they bear everything to him. The food of all those districts, whatever it may be, belongs to that great lord alone. When the young girl heard all this, she said to the people, I and my female slave are going there, to Ottawa. And the people said to her, No. Is that really the case? And she said, Yes, we are going there. Paka sent us there, that we should ask Takakapiri to pay him a visit at Werkawa. She said this to deceive the people, and prevent them from stopping her. And immediately started again upon her journey, and came down upon the seashore at Kadi Kadi. The Waitaha, the tribe of Takakapiri, inhabited that village. And as soon as they saw the young girl coming, there arose joyful cries of, Here is Kahirimoa. Oh, here is the daughter of Paka. And the people collected in crowds to gaze at the young chieftainess. She rested at the village, and they immediately began to prepare food, and when it was cooked, they brought it to her, and she partook of it, and when she had done it was night time. Then they brought plenty of firewood into the house, and made up a clear fire, so that the house might be quite light, and they all stood up to dance, that she might pass a cheerful evening. After they had all danced, they continued soliciting Te Kahirimoa to stand up and dance also, whilst they sat looking on to see how gracefully and beautifully she moved. Upon which she coyly said, Ah, yes, that's all very well. Do you want me to dance indeed? At last, however, the young girl sprang up, and she had hardly stretched forth her lovely arms in the attitude of the dance before the people all cried out with surprise and pleasure at her beauty and grace. Her arms moved with an easy and rapid action like that of swimming, her nimble lissom fingers were reverted till their tips seemed to touch the backs of the palms of her hands. And all her motions were so light, that she appeared to float in the air, then might be seen, indeed, the difference between the dancing of a nobly born girl and a slave, the latter being too often a mere throwing about of the body and of the arms. Thus she danced before them, and when she had finished, all the young men in the place were quite charmed with her, and could think of nothing but of Te Kahirimoa. When night came on, and the people had dispersed to their houses, the chief of the village came to make love to her, and said, that upon account of her great beauty he wished her to become his wife. 
But she at once started up with her female slave, and notwithstanding the darkness, they plunged straight into the river, forded it, and proceeded upon their journey, leaving the chief overwhelmed with shame and confusion. At the manner in which Te Kahirimoa had departed, however, away she went, without any fearful thought, on her road to Toranga, and by daybreak they had reached the Wairoa. When the people of the village saw her coming along in the dawn, they raised joyful cries of, Here is Te Kahirimoa. And some of Takakapiri's people, who were there, would detain the young girl for a time, so she rested, and ate, and was refreshed, thence she proceeded along the base of the mountains of Odua, and at night slept at its foot. And when morning broke, she and her slave continued their journey. There, just at the same time, was Takakapiri coming along the path, to sport in his forests at Odua. His sport was spearing birds, and right in the pathway there stood a tall forest tree covered with berries, upon which large green pigeons had settled in flocks to feed. The two girls came toiling along, with their upper cloaks thrown round their shoulders like plaids, for the convenience of travelling, the slave girl carrying a basket of food on her back for her mistress. As the girls drew near the forest they heard the loud flapping of the wings of a pigeon, for the young chief had struck one with his spear. So they stopped at once, and Te Kahirimoa said to her slave, Somebody is there, just listen how that bird flaps its wings, and her slave answered, Yes, I hear it. And Te Kahirimoa said, That was the flapping of the wings of a bird which somebody has speared, and her slave replied, Yes, we had better go and see who it is. And they had not gone far before they heard a louder flap, as the bird was thrown upon the ground, they at once approached the spot, and seeing a heap of pigeons which had been killed lying at the root of a tree, they sat down by them. Takakapiri had observed them coming along, and as he watched the girls from the tree, he said to himself, These girls are traveling, and they come from a long distance, for their cloaks are rolled over their shoulders like plaids. They are not from near here, had they come from the neighborhood they would have worn their cloaks hanging down in the usual way. Then the young chief came down from the tree, leaving his spear swinging to a bow, as he was descending the girls saw him, and the slave knew him at once at a distance, and said, Oh, my young mistress, that is Takakapiri. And Te Kahirimoa said, No, no, it is not indeed, but the slave said, Yes, it is he, I saw him when he came to Horaki, and the young girl said, You are right, it is Takakapiri. And her slave said, Yes, yes, this is the young chief who has caused us to come all this distance. By this time he had reached the ground, and he and the girls cried out at the same time to each other, Welcome, welcome. And the young man came up to them, and stooped down, and pressed his nose to the nose of each of them. Te Kahirimoa felt and knew whose face touched hers, but Takakapiri did not know whose nose he had pressed. Then he said to them, We had better go to my village, which is on the other side of the forest, and he pressed them to go, and the girls consented to go to the village with him. As they went along the path, he kept urging them to make haste, and Te Kahirimoa thought that he might still not know who she was, or he would never speak so impatiently, and tell her to make haste, so she made an excuse to arrange her dress. And stopped behind on one side of the path, in order that the young chief might have an opportunity of asking her slave who she was as soon as he saw she had left the path. He went on with her slave a little distance until they had got over a rising ground, and then he asked her, saying, Who is your mistress? And the slave answered, Is it my young mistress that you are asking about? And the young chief said, Yes, it is one nobly born person asking after another. And the slave said, Well, if it is my mistress you are asking about, the young lady's name is Te Kahirimoa, and he answered her. What? Is this Te Kahirimoa, the daughter of Paka? And the slave replied, Yes, do you think there are more Pakas than one, or more Te Kahirimoas than one, this is really she? And the young chief said, Well, who would ever have suspected that this was she, or that a young girl from so distant a place could have reached this country? Let us sit down here at once, and wait until she comes up. In a very little time she appeared coming along to them, and the young chief called out to her, You had really better make haste, or you'll suffer from want of food, for it is still a long distance from this place to my village. And when she had reached them he said, 
do you follow me, and pray do not lose time. Then away he ran, and as soon as he got in sight of his own fortress, he began to call loudly to his people as he ran, Te Kahirimoa has arrived. The daughter of Paka is come. Why, said some of them, our master is in love with that girl, and has lost his senses, and thinks she is really here, but he kept calling out as he ran, Here comes Te Kahirimoa, here comes the daughter of Paka. Then some of them said, Why, after all, it must be true, or he would not continue calling it out in that way, and others said, But who could ever believe that a young girl could have traveled to such a distance? The place is strange to her, and we are all strangers to her, perhaps, after all, it is only the wind wafting up from afar this name which we hear called out in our ears. However, they all either climbed up on the defenses, or went outside to see who was coming. And as soon as they saw the young girl approaching, they began to wave their garments, and to sing, in songs of welcome. Welcome, welcome, thou who comest. From afar, from beyond the far horizon. Our dearest child hath brought thee thence. Welcome, oh, welcome here. And each of the many hundreds of persons who had come out to welcome her, as she passed his residence, prayed her to stop there, but Takakapiri continued to say to her, Press on, follow close, quite close, after me. And so he led her through the throng of people, each of whom felt so moved towards the young girl, that, although they were in the very presence of their young lord, they could not help soliciting her to stop at each house as she came by. At length she arrived at Takakapiri's dwelling, and there for the first time she stopped and sat down, and the people came thronging in crowds to gaze upon her. And they spread before the two young girls food in abundance, the birds which the young chief had taken upon the mountains, and a feast was made for the crowd that surrounded them. Thus they remained feasting, and admiring that young girl, and when the sun sank below the horizon, they were still sitting there gazing upon her. The youths of the village thought they could never be weary of looking at her, but none dared to utter one word of love for fear of Takakapiri. Before a month had passed she was married to the young chief, and she bore him a daughter, named Tuprahaki, from whom in eleven generations, or in about two hundred and seventy-five years have sprung all the principal chiefs of the Ngatapeoa tribe who are now alive, in 1853. The Two Sorcerers Kote Maitna O Kiki Kiki was a celebrated sorcerer, and skilled in magical arts, he lived upon the river Waikato. The inhabitants of that river still have this proverb, the offspring of Kiki with her shrubs. This proverb had its origin in the circumstance of Kiki being such a magician, that he could not go abroad in the sunshine. For if his shadow fell upon any place not protected from his magic, it at once became tapu, and all the plants there withered. This Kiki was thoroughly skilled in the practice of sorcery. If any parties coming up the river called at his village in their canoes as they paddled by, he still remained quietly at home, and never troubled himself to come out, but just drew back the sliding door of his house, so that it might stand open. And the strangers stiffened and died. Or even as canoes came paddling down from the upper parts of the river, he drew back the sliding wooden shutter to the window of his house, and the crews on board of them were sure to die. At length, the fame of this sorcerer spread exceedingly, and resounded through every tribe, until Tamir, a chief who dwelt at Kawia, heard with others, reports of the magical powers of Kiki, for his fame extended over the whole country. At length Tamir thought he would go and contend in the arts of sorcery with Kiki, that it might be seen which of them was most skilled in magic, and he arranged in his own mind a fortunate season for his visit. When this time came, he selected two of his people as his companions, and he took his young daughter with him also. And they all crossed over the mountain range from Kawia, and came down upon the river Waipa, which runs into the Waikato, and embarking there in a canoe, paddled down the river towards the village of Kiki. And they managed so well, that before they were seen by anybody, they had arrived at the landing place. Tamir was not only skilled in magic, but he was also a very cautious man. So whilst they were still afloat upon the river, he repeated an incantation of the kind called Matatawido, to preserve him safe from all arts of sorcery. And he repeated other incantations, to ward off spells, to protect him from magic, to collect good genii round him,
to keep off evil spirits, and to shield him from demons. When these preparations were all finished, they landed, and drew up their canoe on the beach, at the landing place of Kiki. As soon as they had landed, the old sorcerer called out to them that they were welcome to his village, and invited them to come up to it, so they went up to the village, and when they reached the square in the center, they seated themselves upon the ground. And some of Kiki's people kindled fire in an enchanted oven, and began to cook food in it for the strangers. Kiki sat in this house, and Tamir on the ground just outside the entrance to it, and he there availed himself of this opportunity to repeat incantations over the threshold of the house. So that Kiki might be enchanted as he stepped over it to come out. When the food in the enchanted oven was cooked, they pulled off the coverings, and spread it out upon clean mats. The old sorcerer now made his appearance out of his house and he invited Tamir to come and eat food with him. But the food was all enchanted, and his object in asking Tamir to eat with him was, that the enchanted food might kill him, therefore Tamir said that his young daughter was very hungry, and would eat of the food offered to them. He in the meantime kept on repeating incantations of the kind called Matatawido, Wakangungu, and Per Per, protections against enchanted food, and as she ate she also continued to repeat them. Even when she stretched out her hand to take a sweet potato, or any other food, she dropped the greater part of it at her feet, and hid it under her clothes, and then only ate a little bit. After she had done, the old sorcerer, Kiki, kept waiting for Tamir to begin to eat also of the enchanted food, that he might soon die. Kiki having gone into his house again, Tamir still sat on the ground outside the door, and as he had enchanted the threshold of the house, he now repeated incantations which might render the door enchanted also. So that Kiki might be certain not to escape when he passed out of it. By this time Tamir's daughter had quite finished her meal, but neither her father nor either of his people had partaken of the enchanted food. Tamir now ordered his people to launch his canoe, and they paddled away, and a little time after they had left the village, Kiki became unwell. In the meanwhile, Tamir and his people were paddling homewards in all haste, and as they passed a village where there were a good many people on the river's bank, Tamir stopped, and said to them, If you should see any canoe pulling after us. And the people in the canoe ask you, Have you seen a canoe pass up the river, would you be good enough to say, Yes, a canoe has passed by here? And then, if they ask you, How far has it got, would you be good enough to say, Oh, by this time it has got very far up the river. And having thus said to the people of that village, Tamir paddled away again in his canoe with all haste. Some time after Tamir's party had left the village of Kiki, the old sorcerer became very ill indeed, and his people then knew that this had been brought about by the magical arts of Tamir, and they sprang into a canoe to follow after him. And puffed up the river as hard as they could. And when they reached the village where the people were on the river's bank, they called out and asked them, How far has the canoe reached, which passed up the river? And the villagers answered, Oh, that canoe must got very far up the river by this time. The people in the canoe that was pursuing Tamir, upon hearing this, returned again to their own village, and Kiki died from the incantations of Tamir. Some of Kiki's descendants are still living one of them, named Mokahi, recently died at Taurangaruru, but Te Mayoha is still living on Dai River Waipa. Yes, some of the descendants of Kiki, whose shadow withered trees, are still living. He was indeed a great sorcerer, he overcame every other sorcerer until he met Tamir, but B was vanquished by him, and had to bend the knee before him. Tamir has also some descendants living, amongst whom are Mahun Kayaki of the Ngadimaria tribe, these men are also skilled in magic, if a father skilled in magic died, he left his incantation to his children. So that if a man was skilled in sorcery, it was known that his children would have a good knowledge of the same arts, as they were certain to have derived it from their parent. The Magical Wooden Head Kanji A Puhi A Purata Rawa Kotadahito This head bewitched all persons who approached the hill where the fortress in which it was kept was situated, so that, from fear of it, no human being dared to approach the place. Which was thence named the Sacred Mount. Upon that mount dwelt Purata and Tadahito with their carved head, and its fame went through all the country, to the river Tamaki, and to Kaipara, and to the tribes of Napuhi, to Aka, 
to Waikato, to Kauia, to Moko, to Horaki, and to Toranga. The exceeding great fame of the powers of that cart had spread to every part of Aotearoa, or the northern island of New Zealand, everywhere reports were heard, that so great were its magical powers, none could escape alive from them. And although many warriors and armies went to the sacred mount to try to destroy the sorcerers to whom the head belonged, and to carry it off as a genius for their own district, that its magical powers might be subservient to them. They all perished in the attempt. In short, no mortal could approach the fortress, and live, even parties of people who were traveling along the forest track, to the northwards towards Mori Fenua, all died by the magical powers of that head. Whether they went in large armed bodies, or simply as quiet travelers, their fate was alike they all perished from its magical influence, somewhere about the place where the beaten track passes over Waimatuku. The deaths of so many persons created a great sensation in the country, and, at last, the report of these things reached a very powerful sorcerer named Hakawao, who, confiding in his magical arts, said he was resolved to go and see this magic head. And the sorcerers who owned it. So, without delay, he called upon all the genii who were subservient to him, in order that he might be thrown into an enchanted sleep, and see what his fate in this undertaking would be. And in his slumber he saw that his genius would triumph in the encounter, for it was so lofty and mighty, that in his dream its head reached the heavens, whilst its feet remained upon earth. Having by his spells ascertained this, he at once started on his journey, and the district through which he travelled was that of Akka. And, confiding in his own enchantments, he went fearlessly to try whether his arts of sorcery would not prevail over the magic head, and enable him to destroy the old sorcerer Porata. He took with him one friend, and went along the sea coast towards the sacred mount, and passed through Wangaroa, and followed the seashore to Ranjikahu and Kahura, and came out upon the coast again at Karoramanui, and arrived at Mariatai. There was a fortified village, the people of which endeavoured to detain Hakuau and his friend until they rested themselves and partook of a little food, but he said, We ate food on the road, a short distance behind us. We are not at all hungry or weary. So they would not remain at Mariatai, but went straight on until they reached Pitataka, and they crossed the river there, and proceeded along the beach to Rukaway. Neither did they stop there, but on they went, and at last reached Waitera. When they got to Waitera, the friend who accompanied Hakuau began to get alarmed, and said, Now we shall perish here, I fear. But they went safely on, and reached Teweda, there the heart of Hakuau's friend began to beat again, and he said, I feel sure that we shall perish here. However they passed by that place too in safety, and on they went, and at length they reached the most fatal place of all Waimatuku. Here they smelt the stench of the carcasses of the numbers who had been previously destroyed. Indeed the stench was so bad that it was quite suffocating, and they both now said, This is a fearful place, we fear we shall perish here. However, Hakuau kept on unceasingly working at his enchantments, and repeating incantations, which might ward off the attacks of evil genii, and which might collect good genii about them, to protect them from the malignant spirits of Porata. Lest these should injure them, Thus they passed over Waimatuku, looking with horror at the many corpses strewed about the beach, and in the dense fern and bushes which bordered the path. And as they pursued their onward journey, they expected death every moment. Nevertheless they died not on the dreadful road, but went straight along the path till they came to the place where it passes over some low hills, from whence they could see the fortress which stood upon Puktapu. Here they sat down and rested, for the first time since they had commenced their journey. They had not yet been seen by the watchmen of the fortress. Then Hakuau, with his incantations, sent forth many genii, to attack the spirits who kept watch over the fortress and magic head of Parada. Some of his good genii were sent by Hakuau in advance, whilst he charged others to follow at some distance. The incantations by the power of which these genii were sent forth by Hakuau was a wangai. The genii he sent in front were ordered immediately to begin the assault. As soon as the spirits who guarded the fortress of Porata saw the others, they all issued out to attack them. The good genii then feigned a retreat the evil ones following them, and whilst they were thus engaged in the pursuit some of the thousands of good genii, who had last been sent forth by Hakuau, 
stormed the fortress now left without defenders. When the evil spirits, who had been led away in the pursuit, turned to protect the fortress, they found that the genii of Hakawao had already got quite close to it, and the good genii of Hakawao without trouble caught them one after the other. And thus all the spirits of the old sorcerer Purata were utterly destroyed. When all the evil spirits who had been subject to the old sorcerer had been thus destroyed, Hakawao walked straight up towards the fortress of this fellow, in whom spirits had dwelt as thick as men stow themselves in a canoe, and whom they had used in like manner to carry them about. When the watchmen of the fortress, to their great surprise, saw strangers coming, Purata hurried to his magic head, to call upon it, his supplication was after this mariner, strangers come here. Strangers come here. Two strangers come. Two strangers come. But it uttered only a low wailing sound. For since the good genii of Hakuau had destroyed the spirits who served Purata, the old sorcerer addressed in vain his supplications to the magic head, it could no longer raise aloud its powerful voice as in former times. But uttered only low moans and wails. Could it have cried out with a loud voice, straightway Hakuau and his friend would both have perished. For thus it was, when armies and travellers had in other times passed the fortress, Purata addressed supplications to his magic head, and when it cried out with a mighty voice, the strangers all perished as they heard it. Hakuau and his friend had, in the meantime, continued to walk straight to the fortress. When they drew near it, Hakuau said to his friend, You go directly along the path that leads by the gateway into the fortress. As for me, I will show my power over the old sorcerer, by climbing right over the parapet and palisades, and when they reached the defences of the place, Hakuau began to climb over the palisades of the gateway. When the people of the place saw this, they were much exasperated, and desired him, in an angry manner, to pass underneath the gateway, along the pathway which was common to all, and not to dare to climb over the gateway of Parada and of Tadahito. But Hakuau went quietly on over the gateway, without paying the least attention to the angry words of those who were calling out to him, for he felt quite sure that the two old sorcerers were not so skillful in magical arts as he was. So Hakuau persisted in going direct to all the most holy places of the fortress, where no person who had not been made sacred might enter. After Hakuau and his friend had been for a short time in the fortress, and had rested themselves a little, the people of the place began to cook food for them. They still continued to sit resting themselves in the fortress for a long time, and at length Hakuau said to his friend, Let us depart. Directly his servant heard what his master said to him, he jumped up at once and was ready enough to be off. Then the people of the place called out to them not to go immediately, but to take some food first, but Hakuau answered, Oh, we ate only a little while ago, not far from here we took some food. So Hakuau would not remain longer in the fortress but departed, and as he started, he smote his hands on the threshold of the house in which they had rested. And they had hardly got well outside of the fortress before every soul and it was dead not a single one of them was left alive. The Art of Netting Learned by Kahukura from the Fairies Kote Carrero Mo Na Pachupiri Once upon a time, a man of the name of Kahukura wished to pay a visit to Rangiohia, a place lying far to the northward near the country of the tribe called Te Rerua. Whilst he lived at his own village, he was continually haunted by a desire to visit that place. At length he started on his journey, and reached Rangiohia, and as he was on his road, be passed a place where some people had been cleaning mackerel, and he saw the inside of the fish lying all about the sand on the seashore, surprised at this. He looked about at the marks, and said to himself, Oh, this must have been done by some of the people of the district. But when he came to look a little more narrowly at the footmarks, he saw that the people who had been fishing had made them in the night time, not that morning, nor in the day. And he said to himself, These are no mortals who have been fishing here spirits must have done this, had they been men, some of the reeds and grass which they sat on in their canoe would have been lying about. He felt quite sure from several circumstances, that spirits or fairies had been there, and after observing everything well, he returned to the house where he was stopping. He, however, held fast in his heart what he had seen, as something very striking to tell all his friends in every direction, 
and is likely to be the means of gaining knowledge which might enable him to find out something new. So that night he returned to the place where he had observed all these things, and just as he reached the spot, back had come the fairies too, to haul their net for mackerel, and some of them were shouting out, The net here! The net here! Then a canoe paddled off to fetch the other in which the net was laid, and as they dropped the net into the water, they began to cry out, Drop the net in the sea at Rangiohia, and haul it at Mamaku. These words were sung out by the fairies, as an encouragement in their work and from the joy of their hearts at their sport in fishing. As the fairies were dragging the net to the shore, Kahukura managed to mix amongst them, and hauled away at the rope. He happened to be a very fair man, so that his skin was almost as white as that of these fairies, and from that cause he was not observed by them. As the net came close into the shore, the fairies began to cheer and shout, Go out into the sea some of you, in front of the rocks, lest the nets should be entangled at Tawatawawia by Tuatuya. For that was the name of a rugged rock standing out from the sandy shore. The main body of the fairies kept hauling at the net, and Kahukura pulled away in the midst of them. When the first fish reached the shore, thrown up in the ripple driven before the net as they hauled it in, the fairies had not yet remarked Kahukura, for he was almost as fair as they were. It was just at the very first peep of dawn that the fish were all landed, and the fairies ran hastily to pick them up from the sand, and to haul the net up on the beach. They did not act with their fish as men do, dividing them into separate loads for each, but every one took up what fish he liked, and ran a twig through their gills, and as they strung the fish, they continued calling out, Make haste, run here. All of you, and finish the work before the sun rises. Kahukura kept on stringing his fish with the rest of them. He had only a very short string, and, making a slip knot at the end of it, when he had covered the string with fish, he lifted them up, but had hardly raised them from the ground when the slip knot gave way from the weight of the fish. And off they fell. Then some of the fairies ran good naturedly to help him to string his fish again, and one of them tied the knot at the end of the string for him, but the fairy had hardly gone after knotting it before Kahukura had unfastened it, and again tied a slip knot at the end. Then he began stringing his fish again, and when he had got a great many on, up he lifted them, and off they slipped as before. This trick he repeated several times, and delayed the fairies in their work by getting them to knot his string for him, and put his fish on it. At last full daylight broke, so that there was light enough to distinguish a man's face, and the fairies saw that Kahukura was a man. Then they dispersed in confusion, leaving their fish and their net, and abandoning their canoes, which were nothing but stems of the flax. In a moment the fairies started for their own abodes. In their hurry, as has just been said, they abandoned their net, which was made of rushes, and off the good people fled as fast as they could go. Now was first discovered the stitch for netting a net, for they left theirs with Kahukura, and it became a pattern for him. He thus taught his children to make nets, and by them the Maori race were made acquainted with that art, which they have now known from very remote times. Take Kanoa's adventure with a troop of fairies. T.E. Kanoa, a chief of Waikato, was the man who fell in with a troop of fairies upon the top of Pukemore, a high hill in the Waikato district. This chief happened one day to go out to catch Kiwi with his dogs, and when night came on he found himself right at the top of Pukemore. So his party made a fire to give them light, for it was very dark. They had chosen a tree to sleep under a very large tree, the only one fit for their purpose that they could find. In fact, it was a very convenient sleeping place, for the tree had immense roots, sticking up high above the ground, they slept between these roots, and made the fire beyond them. As soon as it was dark they heard loud voices, like the voices of people coming that way, there were the voices of men, of women, and of children, as if a very large party of people were coming along. They looked for a long time, but could see nothing, till at last Ekanoa knew that noise must proceed from fairies. His people were all dreadfully frightened, and would have run away if they could, but where could they run to? They were in the midst of a forest, on the top of a lonely mountain, and it was dark night. For long time the voices grew louder and more distinct as the fairies drew nearer and nearer, until they came quite close to the fire. 
Te Kanoa and his party were half dead with fright. At last the fairies approached to look at Te Kanoa, who was a very handsome fellow. To do this, they kept peeping slyly over the large roots of the tree under which the hunters were lying, and kept constantly looking at Te Kanoa, whilst his companions were quite insensible from fear. Whenever the fire blazed up brightly, off went the fairies and hid themselves, peeping out from behind stumps and trees. And when it burnt low, back they came close to it, merrily singing as they moved. Here you come climbing over Mount Tiranji. To visit the handsome chief of Ngapuhi. Whom we have done with. 23. A sudden thought struck Te Kanoa that he might induce them to go away if he gave them all the jewels he had about him. So he took off a beautiful little figure, carved in green jasper, which he wore as a neck ornament, and a precious carved jasper eardrop from his ear. Ah, Te Kanoa was only trying to amuse and please them to save his life, but all the time he was nearly frightened to death. However, the fairies did not rush on the men to attack them, but only came quite close to look at them. As soon as Te Kanoa had taken off his neck ornament, and pulled out his jasper pendant, and his other ornament, made of a tooth of the tiger shark, he spread them out before the fairies. And offered them to the multitude who were sitting all round about the place. And thinking it better the fairies should not touch him, he took a stick, and fixing it into the ground, hung his neck ornament and earrings upon it. As soon as the fairies had ended their song, they took the shadows of the pendants, and handed them about from one to the other, until they had passed through the whole party, which then suddenly disappeared, and nothing more was seen of them. The fairies carried off with them the shadows of all the jewels of Teikanoa, but they left behind them his jasper neck ornament and his pendants, so that he took them back again. The hearts of the fairies being quite contented at getting the shadows alone. They saw, also, that Teikanoa was an honest, well-dispositioned fellow. However, the next morning, as soon as it was light, he got down the mountain as fast as he could without stopping to hunt longer for kiwis. The fairies are a very numerous people, merry, cheerful, and always singing, like the cricket. Their appearance is that of human beings, nearly resembling a European's, their hair being very fair, and so is their skin. They are very different from the Maoris, and do not resemble them at all. Te Kanoa had died before any Europeans arrived in New Zealand. The Loves of Takaranji and Ramahora There was, several generations since, a chief of the Taranaki tribe, named Ranjurunga. His pa was called Wakerwa, it was a large pa, renowned for the strength of its fortifications. This chief had a very beautiful daughter, whose name was Ramahora. She was so celebrated for her beauty that the fame of it had reached all parts of these islands, and had, therefore, come to the ears of Teringi Apatirua, a chief of the Ngadiawa tribes, to whom belonged the Pa of Pukariki. On the hill where the governor's house stood in New Plymouth. This chief had a son named Takaranji, he was the hero of his tribe. He, too, naturally heard of the beauty of Ramahora, and it may be that his heart sometimes dwelt long on the thoughts of such great loveliness. Now in those days long past, there arose a war between the tribes of Teringi Apatirua and of the father of Ramahora. And the army of the Ngadiawa tribes marched to Taranaki, to attack the Pa of Ranjurunga, and the army invested that fortress, and sat before it night and day, yet they could not take it. They continued nevertheless constantly to make assaults upon it, and to attack the garrison of the fortress, so that its inhabitants became worn out from want of provisions and water, and many of them were near dying. At last the old chief of the Pa, Ranjurunga, overcome by thirst, stood on the top of the defences of the Pa, and cried out to the men of the enemy's army, I pray you to give me one drop of water. Some of his enemies, pitying the aged man, said, Yes, and one ran with a calabash to give him water. But the majority being more hard-hearted were angry at this, and broke the calabash in his hands, so that not a drop of water reached the poor old man, and this was done several times, whilst his enemies continued disputing amongst themselves. The old chief still stood on the top of the earthen wall of the fortress, and he saw the leader of the hostile force, with the symbols of his rank fastened on his head, he wore a long white comb, made from the bone of a whale. And a plume of the long downy feathers of the white heron, 
the emblems of his chieftainship. Then was heard by all, the voice of the aged man as he shouted to him from the top of the wall, Who art thou? And the other cried out to him, Lo, he who stands here before you is Takaranji. And the aged chief of the Pa called down to him. Young warrior, art thou able to still the wrathful surge which foams on the hidden rocks of the shoal of Orangomitakyup? Meaning, hast thou, although a chief, power to calm the wrath of these fierce men? Then proudly replied to him the young chief, The wrathful surge shall be stilled. This arm of mine is one which no dog dares to bite, meaning that no plebeian hand dared touch his arm, made sacred by his deed and rank, or to dispute his will. But what Takaranji was really thinking in his heart was, that dying old man is the father of Ramahora, of that so lovely maid. Ah, how I should grieve if one so young and innocent should die tormented with the want of water. Then he arose, and slowly went to bring water for that aged man, and for his youthful daughter, and he filled a calabash, dipping it up from the cool spring which gushes up from the earth, and is named Orinji. No word was spoken, or movement made, by the crowd of fierce and angry men, but all, resting upon their arms, looked on in wonder and in silence. Calm lay the sea, that was before so troubled, all timid and respectful in the lowly hero's presence. And the water was taken by Takaranji, and by him was held up to the aged chief, then was heard by all, the voice of Takaranji, as he cried aloud to him, There, said I not to you, no dog would dare to bite this hand of mine. Behold the water for you for you and for that young girl. Then they drank, both of them, and Takaranji gazed eagerly at the young girl, and she too looked eagerly at Takaranji, long time gazed they, each one at the other. And as the warriors of the army of Takaranji looked on, lo, he had climbed up and was sitting at the young maiden's side. And they said amongst themselves, O oh comrades, our lord Takaranji loves war, but one would think he likes Ramahora almost as well. At last a sudden thought struck the heart of the aged chief, of the father of Ramahora. So he said to his daughter, O oh my child, would it be pleasing to you to have this young chief for a husband? And the young girl said, I like him. Then the old man consented that his daughter should be given as a bride to Takaranji, and he took her as his wife. Thence was that war brought to an end, and the army of Takaranji dispersed, and they returned each man to his own village, and they came back no more to make war against the tribes of Taranaki for ever were ended their wars against them. And the descendants of Ramahora dwell here in Wellington. They are Tepuni, and all his children, and his relatives. For Takaranji and Ramahora had a daughter named Ranguaroa, who was married to Tewaiti. And they had a son named Anuanua, who married Taharakura, and they had a son named Rirwai Tiirangi, and he married Puku, who was the mother of Tepuni. Stratagem of Puhiwia's elopement with Tepanga There was formerly a large fortified town upon Mount Eden, its defenses were massive and strong, and a great number of persons inhabited the town. In the days of olden time a war was commenced by the tribes of Awidu and of Waikato, against the people who inhabited the town at Mount Eden or Mount Gawa. There they engaged in a fierce war, one side first persisted in their efforts for victory, until they were successful in beating the other party. Then the other side in their turn succeeded in resisting their enemies, and gained a victory in their turn, thus the tribes of Waikato did not succeed in destroying their enemies as they desired. After this the people of Waikato thought, for a long time, well, what had we better do now to destroy these enemies of ours? And seeing no way to accomplish this, they determined to make peace with them. So, at last, they arranged a peace, and it appeared to be a sure one. When this peace had been made, Teponga, a chief from Awidu, and one of the fiercest enemies of the people of that town, went, attended by a large company, to Maungawa, and whilst he was yet a long way off. He and his party were seen coming along by the people of the fortified town, and they ran to the gates of the fortress, calling out, Welcome, oh, welcome, strangers from afar. And they waved their garments to them. And the strangers, encouraged by these cries, came straight on to the town until they reached it, and then walked direct to the large courtyard in front of the house of the chief of the town, and there they all seated themselves. 
The inhabitants being all now assembled in the town as well as the strangers, the chiefs of each party stood up and made speeches, and when they had concluded this part of the ceremony, the women lighted fires to cook food for the strangers. And when the ovens were heated, they put the food in and covered them up. In a very short time the food was all cooked, when they opened the ovens, placed the food in baskets, and ranged it in a long pile before the visitors. Then, separating it into shares, one of their chiefs called aloud the name of each of the visitors to whom a share was intended, and when this allotment was completed they fell to at the feast. The strangers, however, ate very slowly, knowing they had better take but little food, in order not to surfeit themselves, and so that their waists might be slim when they stood up in the ranks of the dancers. And that they might look as slight as if their waists were almost severed in two. And as the strangers sat they kept on thinking, when will night come and the dance begin, and the thoughts of the others were of the same kind. As soon as it began to get dark, the inhabitants of the village rapidly assembled, and when they had all collected in the courtyard of the house, which was occupied by the strangers, they stood up for the dance. And rank after rank of dancers was duly ranged in order, until at length all was in readiness. Then the dancers began, and whilst they sprang nimbly about, Puhiwia, the young daughter of the chief of the village stood watching a good opportunity to bound forward before the assembly, and made the gestures usual with dancers. Since she knew that she could not dance so well, or so becomingly, if she pressed on before the measure was completed, but that when the beating time by the assembly with their feet and hands, and the deep voices of the men, were all in exact unison, was the fitting moment for her to bound forward into the dance, with the becoming gestures. Then, just as they were all beating time together, Puhiwia perceived the proper moment had come, and forth she sprang before the assembled dancers. First she bends her head with many gestures towards the people upon the one side, and then towards those upon the other, as she performed her part beautifully. Her full-orbed eyes seemed clear and brilliant as the full moon rising in the horizon, and whilst the strangers looked at the young girl, they all were quite overpowered with her beauty. And Teponga, their young chief, felt his heart grow wild with emotion, when he saw so much loveliness before him. In the meanwhile the people of the village went on dancing, until all the evolutions of the dance were duly completed, when they paused. Then up sprang the strangers to dance in their turn, and they duly ranged themselves in order, rank behind rank of the dancers, and began with their hands to beat time, and whilst they thus gave the time of the measure, the young chief, Teponga, stood peeping over them and waiting a good opportunity for him to spring forward, and in his turn make gestures. At last forth he bounded, then he, too, bent his head with many gestures, first upon the one side and then upon the other, indeed, he performed beautifully. The people of the village were so surprised at his agility and grace, that they could do nothing but admire him, and as for the young girl Puhiwia, her heart conceived a warm passion for Teponga. At length the dance concluded, and all dispersed, each to the place where he was to rest. Then, overcome with weariness, they all reclined in slumber, except Teponga, who lay tossing from side to side, unable to sleep, from his great love for the maiden and devising scheme after scheme by which he might have an opportunity of conversing alone with her. At last he formed a project, or rather it originated in the suggestions of his slave, who said to his master, Sir, I have found out a plan by which you may accomplish your wishes, listen to me whilst I detail it to you. Tomorrow evening, just at nightfall, as you sit in the courtyard of the chief of the village, feign to be very thirsty, and call to me to bring you a draught of water. On my part, I will take care to be at a distance from the place, but do you continue to shout loudly and angrily to me, Sirrah, I want water, fetch me some, call loudly, so that the father of the young girl may hear. Then he will probably say to his daughter, My child, my child, why do you let our guest call in that way for water, without running to fetch some for him? Then, when the young girl, in obedience to her father's orders, runs down the hill to fetch water from the fountain for you, do you follow her to the spring, there you can uninterruptedly converse together. But when you rise to follow the young girl, in order to prevent them from suspecting your intentions, do you pretend to be in a great passion with me, and speak thus, where's that deaf slave of mine? I'll go and find the fellow. Ah! 
You will not hear when you do not like, but I'll break your head for you, my fine fellow. Thus the slave advised his master, and they arranged fully the plan of their proceedings. The next day Teponga went to visit the chief of the village, and sat in his house watching the young girl, and before long evening closed in, and they retired to rest, and some time afterwards Teponga, pretending to be thirsty, called out loudly to his slave, Haloa. Sir, fetch me some water, but not a word did the slave answer him, and Teponga continued to call out to him louder and louder, until at last he seemed to become weary of shouting. When the chief of the village heard him calling out in this way for water, he at length said to his young daughter, My child, run and fetch some water for our guest. Why do you allow him to ao on calling for water in that way, without fetching some for him? Then the maiden arose, and, taking a calabash went off to fetch water. And no sooner did Teponga see her starting off than he too arose, and went out of the house, feigning by his voice and words to be very angry with his slave, so that all might think he was going to give him a beating. But as soon as B was out of the house, he went straight off after the young girl. He did not, indeed, well know the path which led to the fountain, but led by the voice of the maiden, who tripped along the path singing blithely and merrily as she went, Teponga followed the guidance of her tones. When the maiden arrived at the brink of the fountain and was about to dip her calabash into it, she heard someone behind her, and, turning suddenly round, ah! There stood a man close behind her, yes, there was Teponga himself. She stood quite astonished for some time, and at length asked, What can have brought you here? He answered, I came here for a draught of water. But the girl replied, Ha, indeed. Did not I come here to draw water for you? Why, then, did you come? Could not you have remained at my father's house until I brought the water for you? Then Teponga answered, You are the water that I thirsted for. And as the maiden listened to his words, she thought within herself, He, then, has fallen in love with me. And she sat down, and he placed himself by her side, and they conversed together, and to each of them the words of the other seemed most pleasant and engaging. Why need more be said? Before they separated they arranged a time when they might escape together, and then each of them returned to the village to wait for the occasion they had agreed upon. When the appointed time had arrived, he desired some chosen men of his followers to go to the landing place on Manuka Harbor, where the canoes were all hauled on shore, there to wait for him. And Puhiwia and he directed them when they got there to prepare one canoe in which he and all his followers might escape. He desired that this canoe should be launched and kept afloat in the water with every paddle in its place, so that the moment they embarked it might put off from the shore. He further directed them to go round every one of the other canoes, to cut the lashings which made the top sides fast to the hulls, and to pull out all the plugs so that those following them might be checked and thrown into confusion at finding they had no canoes in which to continue the pursuit. Those of his people to whom Teponga gave these orders immediately departed, and did exactly as their chief had directed Diem. The next morning Teponga having told his host that he must return to his own country, all the people of the place assembled to bid him farewell. And when they had all collected, the chief of the fortress stood up, and, after a suitable speech, presented his jade mirror to Teponga as a parting gift, which might establish and make sure the peace which they had concluded. Teponga in his turn presented with the same ceremonies his jade mirror to the chief of the fortress. And when all the rites observed at a formal parting were completed, Teponga and his followers arose, and went upon their way, then the people of the place all arose too, and accompanied them to the gates of the fortress to bid them farewell. And as the strangers quitted the gates, the people of the place cried aloud after them, Depart in peace. Depart in peace. May you return in safety to your homes. Just before the strangers had started, Puhiwia and some of the young girls of the village stole a little way along the road, so as to accompany the strangers some way on their path. And when they joined them, the girls stepped proudly along by the side of the band of strange warriors, laughing and joking with them. At last they got some distance from the village, and Puhiwia's father, the chief of the place, seeing his daughter was going so far, called out, Children, children, come back here. Then the other girls stopped and began to return towards the village, but as to Puhiwia, 
her heart beat but to the one thought of escaping with her beloved Taeponga. So she began to run. She drew near to some large scoria rocks, and glided behind them, and, when thus hidden from the view of those in the village, she redoubled her speed, well done, well done, young girl. She runs so fast that her body bends low as she speeds forward. When Teponga saw Puhiwia running in this hurried manner, he called aloud to his men, What is the meaning of this? Let us be off as fast as we can too. Then began a swift flight, indeed, of Teponga, and his followers, and of the young girl. Rapidly they flew, like a feather drifting before the gale, or as runs the waka which has broken loose from a fowler's snare. When the people of the village saw that their young chieftainess was gone, there was a wild rushing to and fro in the village for weapons, and whilst they thus lost their time, Teponga and his followers, and the young girl, went unmolestedly upon their way. And when the people of the fortress at last came out ready for the pursuit, Teponga and his followers, and Puhiwia, had got far enough away, and before their pursuers had gained any distance from the fortress. Teponga and his people had almost reached the landing place at Manuka Harbor, and by the time the pursuing party had arrived near the landing place, they had embarked in their canoe, had grasped their paddles, and being all ready. They dashed their paddles into the water, and shot away, swift as a dart from a string, whilst they felt the sides of the canoe shake from the force with which they drove it through the water. When the pursuers saw that the canoe had dashed off into Manuka Harbor, they laid hold of another canoe, and began to haul it down towards the water, but as the lashings of the top sides were cut. What was the use of their trying to haul it to the sea? They dragged nothing but the top sides there lay the bottom of the canoe unmoved. Pursuit was impossible. The party that had come to make peace escaped, and returned uninjured and joyful to their own country, and went cheerfully upon their way, carrying off with them the young chieftainess from their enemies. Who could only stand like fools upon the shore, stamping with rage and threatening them in vain. Appendix on the Native Songs of New Zealand And a comparison of the intervals discernible in them with the intervals stated to have been performed by the ancient Greeks in some of their divisions of the musical scale. Called Gamma Nu Omicron Sigma Nu Alpha Romeo Omicron Nu Iota Kappa Nu, Greek Genos E. Narmonicon, on by others Romeo Omicron Nu Alpha, Greek Romonia. All nations, perhaps, without accepting any, have some method of expressing the more energetic emotions beyond mere speaking or acting. A sense of joy or pain, naturally calling forth ejaculations and vociferations exceeding in limit the tone of voice used in ordinary discourse. The cry of war, the encouraging to battle, the shout of victory, or the lament of the vanquished, the wailing over a deceased friend, grief at the departure of a lover. Each in its turn has prompted or suggested some modification of sound beyond the ordinary range of mere tame everyday discourse. And this modification of voice we may call, in a wide sense, natural music. But as the highest art is to conceal the art, and to imitate nature, that mighty nation, the Greeks, with an art almost peculiarly their own, having observed these expressions of sentiment, thence deduced certain laws of interval, by which, while they kept within the limits of art, they took care not to transgress those of nature, but judiciously to adopt, and as nearly as possible to define, with mathematical exactness. Those intervals which the uncultured only approach by the irregular modulation of natural impulses. So their art was the schooling of nature by the more exact observance of her laws, and by training nature by perfect art, they made art like nature, and corrected nature by art. As the sculptor or painter gives the classic embodiment or personification, not the commonplace, and often defective representation of an object. This I opine to have been the real nature of the enharmonic scale of the Greeks. And hence I conceive the reason of the remnant of that scale being found among most of those nations who have been left to the impulses of a nature-taught song rather than been cramped by the trammels of a conventional system the result of education and civilization. It may not he amiss, before going farther into this analogy of nature, and of an art reciprocally reflecting back that nature, to endeavor to give the uninitiated an idea of what is meant by the enharmonic genus of the Greeks. I must first remark that while we have, properly speaking, only one scale of musical notes and two genera, 
the Greeks had three scales and five genera. For we have only the diatonic scale, but by a certain introduction of one or more semitones, we make what is called the chromatic. Whereas, the Greeks had three scales, comprising five genera, or, according to some, nine, all differing not only, as ours do, in the position of intervals, but in the intervals themselves. This difference of interval, rather than position of interval, gave rise to the expression, genera of a system, and depended on the distribution of two intermediate sounds in the tetrachord or fourth. The principal scales and genera were three. The diatonic, the chromatic, and the enharmonic. The diatonic, genus, consisted of a lima or minor half-tone, a major tone, and a major tone ascending, this had another modification, by which, while it retained the same semitone, it contracted the next tone, and extended the last. The latter was called soft diatonic. The chromatic, which consisted of semitone, semitone, one tone and a half interval, or nearly our minor third, was called tonean, and had two modifications, one called hemiolian, and the other malacon. These shades or modifications seem of later invention, and soon to have fallen into disuse. The enharmonic consisted of a quarter tone, a quarter tone and an interval of two tones, an interval somewhat greater than our third major. Wallace says that we have no idea of these intervals at the present day, as in any way connected with a scale. Since they amount to little more than an imperfect elevation or depression of the voice within the limits of what we call a sound or harmonic note. Though a certain use is made of the term enharmonic, and the existence of the interval is admitted in the higher researches on music, and said to be apparent in the so-called tierce wolf of the organ, in untempered instruments, and in the systems of equal temperament. Writers of the present day, greatly differ as to the existence or use of these Cairo Alpha Iota, Greeks Roi, or shades of distinction, some wishing to modify them by a modern application of the term, amounting to those shades, nuances, or slurs which the best vocalists or performers are sometimes heard to introduce. Others again declaring them to be in practice impossible, and all for the most part alleging that, whatever might have been the case in former times, no such modifications do exist in practice at the present day. Now, with regard to the existence of them in ancient times, innumerable authorities might be quoted, but, not to exceed a reasonable limit, I shall only cite one or two testimonies, and shall confine myself to those referring to the enharmonic. Vitruvius, Lib. V, C. V, says, Diatonic vero quat naturalis est facilior est intervalorum distantia, of the enharmonic he says, est autumn harmonia, modulatio of arte concepta et ea recantio aegis maxim gravum et egregium habit auctoritatum. The graveness and seriousness are given as the striking characteristics of this genus. We may here incidentally remark that. Though he says, abarte concepta, it does not prove that it might not have been art imitating nature. And more, it is not impossible that these, at present so called uncivilized and savage nations, might have retained this character of song from a period of the highest state of civilization, at an epoch of great antiquity. Plutarch, Pi epsilon rho mu omicron upsilon sigma iota kappa sigma, Greek peri mausic carat s, remarks, that the most beautiful of the musical genera is the enharmonic, on account of its grave and solemn character, and that it was formerly most in esteem. Aristides Quintilian tells us it was the most difficult of all, and required a most excellent ear. Aristoxenus observes that it was so difficult, that no one could sing more than two dioceses consecutively, and yet the perceptions of a Greek audience were fully awake to, and their judgment could appreciate, a want of exactness in execution. For Dionysius of Halicarnassus says, he himself has been in the most crowded theater, where, if a singer or Cytherotist mistook the smallest interval, presumed to be the enharmonic diocese, he was hissed off the stage. Isaac Vossius, from a multitude of authorities, has established, that transitions were made by ancient singers and performers, from the diatonic to the chromatic and enharmonic, with the greatest facility. And he adds, which, because the moderns cannot do, they even positively and seriously assert that the ancients could not sing the enharmonic. Whereas, continues he, not only did they sing it, but accompanied it with instruments. So Plutarch, 
pi epsilon rho mu omicron epsilon sigma iota kappa sigma, Greek peri mausic carat s, who adds a remark, the purport of which is. Such persons, who affirm that the ancients could not accompany the enharmonic, forget that if they can accompany greater intervals which were composed of less. There can be no reason why the scale of an instrument might not be so adjusted as to accompany the less intervals which compose those greater. The doubt of the possibility of using the enharmonic as a scale is not confined to our own day, for Plutarch, as we have seen, and in other places also, speaks of the decline of it. And Athenius speaks of certain Greeks who, from time to time, retired by themselves to keep up the recollection of the good old music, since the art had become so corrupted. In Plutarch's time, De Musica, he bitterly complains that certain people affirmed the enharmonic diocese to be absolutely undistinguishable, and that, therefore, it had no place in the scales of nature. And that those who attempted to prove it were mere triflers, Pefluarch. Nigh. He then makes the remark about the possibility of accompanying the enharmonic intervals with instruments, and adds, and these very people who talk about the enharmonic having no foundation in nature have an extraordinary attachment to dissonances and irrational intervals, pi epsilon rho iota tau tau lambda omicron gamma alpha, Greek parita. H carat a, loga, which have no existence in the real science of the proportions of natural intervals, and may be compared to certain irregular tenuities or awkward excrescences on what should be a beautiful tree or other object. For whatever reason, it appears it was wholly laid aside in Plutarch's time, which he attributes to the dullness of the ears of those of his day. Wallace supposes the genera of the chromatic and enharmonic to have fallen into disuse for many ages. Scaliger, not till Domitian, the enharmonic, because of the extreme difficulty, the chromatic, on account of its softness and effeminacy. Dr. Wallace adds, modern music never affected to appreciate such subtlety in delicate nicety, for neither voice could execute, nor ear easily distinguish so many differences, at least so we suppose nowadays. Dr. Burney, in his History of Music, I. For 33, from various authorities, concludes, that this genus, the close enharmonic, was almost exclusively in use before Aristoxenus, about the time of Alexander the Great, and we gather from Aristoxenus that there were exercises in it for practice. And this observation is corroborated in the notices of extraits to MSS. T. 16, in a most elaborate and clever paper, by Mr. Vincent, from certain misses in the King of France's library. Dr. Burney, in common with most other modern writers on the subject, says. Intervals of the close enharmonic tetrachord appear wholly strange and unmanageable, and hence it has been concluded that the enharmonic was impossible in practice. Dr. Burney, however, one day received a letter from his friend Dr. Russell, regarding the state of music in Arabia, and to the doctor's utter astonishment, he learned from that letter that the Arabian scale of music was divided into quarter tones. And that an octave, which, upon our keyed instruments is only divided into twelve semitones, in the Arabian scale contained twenty-four, for all of which they had particular denominations. This latter observation would seem to tally very well with what Mr. Lane says of the Kanun, Kapanu Omega Nu, Greek Can, of the present Arabs, which, he says, has twenty-four treble notes. Only, that he adds, each note has three strings to it, which, later, as we shall see, he affirms to have been thirds of tones. If so, the system is a shade of the chromatic. And if Mr. Lane is right, and he gives a drawing of the instrument, Dr. Russell must err, or speak of another instrument. I should be inclined to give preference to Lane, because of the great pains he has taken in describing the instrument. Mr. Lay Tradescant, speaking of the Chinese intervals, says that, it is impossible to obtain the intervals of their scale on our keyed instruments, but they may be perfectly affected on the violin. Mr. Vincent gives a most scientific description of an elaborate instrument made at Paris, exhibited at the Institute, on which the quarter tones were most correctly illustrated, and observes, that a much less interval than the quarter tone, perhaps eight or ten times less, is discernible, as proved by A. M. Delazen, 1827. And our own ears attest that universally in the modulations of the voice of the so-called savage tribes, 
and in the refined and anomalously studied Chinese, there are intervals which do not correspond to any notes on our keyed instruments. And which to an untrained ear appear almost monotonous. There is another matter with which incidentally we have to do, namely, an apparent difference of opinion between ancient authors themselves about the enharmonic. Plutarch says that Aristoxenus, in a book not now extant, informs us that Olympus was the inventor of an enharmonic, but of a kind consisting of a scale in which certain notes, the lacani or indicatrices, were omitted. And that the airs of Olympus were so simple and beautiful, that there was nothing like them. This scale would approximate to the Scotch, or rather to that given as Chinese by Dr. Russell. But there is nothing repugnant in this, to the division of the intermediate half note between this saltus. And, as here, it is the division of the half note interval with which we have to do. The discussion as to the variety or difference introduced by Olympus, as to whether he made use of this design or not, is not of any importance to our subject, our object being merely to show that the smaller interval, called a quarter tone, has its representative in modern times. Suffice it to say, that many Chinese airs, of which I have two, show the Dysic modulations and the Saltus combined. But the majority of the New Zealand airs which I have heard are softer and more ligate, and have a great predominance of the Dysic element. It may not be amiss to define in what sense we wish diocese to be understood, for sometimes, by modern writers especially, it is used for the simple minor half-tone of 2425 in contradistinction to the major of 1516. In Dr. Smith's harmonies it is the lima of equal temperament. Sometimes the moderns use the term for the double sharp. It was Rameau's these major, Henfling's harmonia, Boyce's quarter note, the Earl of Stamford's Tierce Wolf. Observed in the tuning of an organ. Dr. Maxwell makes 2025-2048 the Maj, diocese, and 32768-32805 the Min. But the sense in which I shall use it is that of the ancient quarter tone, being an approach to the quarter of a tone major, or rather the division of the lima 243-256 into two unequal parts, this is called the Aristoxenian diocese quadrantalis. Which is represented nearly by 120 being the lowest note, then 116.60, 113.39. I shall not trouble the reader with chronological or scholastic differences, the diocese of Archytas. That of being given by Vincent as 115 and 5 sevenths, 112 and a half, Eratosthenes as 117, 114, for keen indeed must be the ear that could discern between 1516 and 2425, except in harmony much more difficult still would it be to discover a difference between 116.60, 113.39 and 115 and 5 sevenths slash 112 and a half or 117 slash 114. If any wish to examine this matter more closely, they can consult the treatises on harmonies. Mr. Vincent has calculated these differences by logarithms to the 60 root of 2. My point is, to prove that the ancients did possess and practice a modulation which contained much less intervals than ours, and that such, or an approach to such, modulation, though probably but imperfect, is still retained among some people. And that the principles on which the Greeks founded their enharmonic genus, still survive in natural song, though I will not be bold enough to assert that sometimes these songs may not change into one of the chromatic Cairo Alpha Iota, Greeks Roi, which for want of practice, I might not be able to decide. One thing, however, is certain, that, as Aristoxenus tells us, no perfect ear could modulate more than two dioceses at a time, and then there was a saltus or interval of two tones. And as the New Zealand songs frequently exhibit more than two close intervals together, it is more than probable that many of these songs are achromatic, represented by 120, 114 or 108, or 120, 112 and a half, 108. But it will not be worth while for the present purpose to discuss this nicety, as all we want is a practical approximation. In proof that a system of modulation like the above still survives, I shall produce, as nearly as my ear could discern, the modulation of some of the New Zealand melodies.
and shall show a still nearer approach to the system of the real Greek enharmonic, in a Chinese air which I heard and noted. A few remarks on the system itself, the intervals, and the notation. System. First, that an enharmonic modulation might exist is admitted by many modern writers. Mr. Duncan, for instance, author of the able article on ancient music in Drive W. Smith's Dictionary of Greek and Roman Antiquities, observes, under the title of music, of the different genera less frequently named, that it would be wrong to conclude hastily, that the others would be impossible in practice. Or necessarily unpleasing. And of the enharmonic he says, but it is impossible to form a judgment of its merits without a much greater knowledge of the rules of composition than seems now attainable. Mr. Lay Tradescant having shown the differences of interval of the Chinese instruments from the intervals generally in use in Europe, adds, it will therefore very readily appear from the respective rules, that the character of the music, or, if you please, the mood, he should have said genus, must be very different from our own, and that none of our instruments, he should have said keyed or bored, are capable of doing justice to any air that is played on the kin, or scholar's lute. He subjoins, In my travels I sometimes wrote down the airs that I had heard among the natives, but though I took much pains to learn them accurately, I always found they had lost something of their peculiarity when played upon the violin. The reason of this defect seems to have been that the intervals of the Indian music did not agree with those of Europe. Mr. Tradescant might have added, that there will always be some difference in an air played on the guitar and on the violin, though the intervals used acts esteemed the same. And, again, perhaps the learned traveller did not take care to divide the scale of his violin mathematically, like that of the kin, before he tried the effect, he might also riot have noted the right interval. He concludes, there is, however, a connection between the Chinese and old Scotch music, so that when any highly admired airs of Scotland happen to fall within the compass of the kin, they seem at home when played upon this instrument. Mr. Lane says the kanun of the Arabians had 24 notes. Dr. Russell to Burney says that the Arab scale of 24 notes was equal to one octave. But Mr. Lane adds that, the most remarkable peculiarity in the Arab system of music is the division of tones into thirds. Hence, from the system of thirds of tones, I have heard the Egyptian musicians urge against the European systems of music that they are deficient in the number of sounds. The same remark was made to me by Salim Agar, a Nubian, when singing some Amharic songs, your instrument, piano, said he, is very much out of tune, and jumps very much. Mr. Lane adds, these small and delicate gradations of sound give a peculiar softness to the performances of the Arab musicians, which are generally of a plaintive character. But they are difficult to discriminate with exactness, and therefore seldom observed in the vocal and instrumental music of those persons who have not made a regular study of the art. Had Mr. Lane been describing the character and difficulties of the ancient Greek enharmonic or chromatic, he could not have used other terms, they are almost the words of Aristoxenus, Vitruvius, Plutarch, and other ancient writers on these genera. And yet, he adds, he took great delight in the more refined kind of music, and found the more he became habituated to the style the more he was pleased with it. He continues, he was perfectly charmed with the performance of some female singers, and that the natives are so fascinated as to lavish considerable sums on them. Precisely so the Greeks of old. Intervals. We must not suppose that the Greek enharmonic was a consecutive gamut of quarter tones no. We are told distinctly by all authors, except, perhaps, Salinas, that there was a quarter tone, then another quarter tone, then a great interval completing the fourth. Or reversely, a great interval of two major tones, or about our third major, the quarter tone, mother quarter tone, thus completing the fourth. So with these nations, and especially in the Chinese airs I have heard, there is either the two quarter tones, then an interval of about a third, or, the interval of the third, and then the two dioceses or quarter tones, or it is a mixed genus. And adds a tone or half tone at either extreme. I here beg to state that, though with great care and the assistance of a graduated monochord, and an instrument divided like the intervals of the Chinese kin, I have endeavoured to give an idea of those airs of New Zealand which I heard. Yet so difficult is it to discover the exact interval, 
that I will not vouch for the mathematical exactness, neither will I pledge myself not to have written a chromatic for an enharmonic interval, or vice versa. I must also, in justice to myself, add, that the singer did not always repeat the musical phrase with precisely the same modulation, though, without a very severe test, this would not have been discernible, nor then to many ears. The general effect being to an European ear very monotonous. But I may say that, when I sang them from my notation, they were recognized and approved of by competent judges. And that the New Zealander himself said he should soon make a singer of me. I may also add that I have studied the subject for more than twenty years, and have read something out of almost every book of note that has been written on it. But yet I only offer these airs as an approximation, and if anyone shall be found who may do more justice to them, I shall be delighted to hear of the result. Notation The notation that I have adopted is, for the enharmonic diocese, the St. Andrew's cross or psalter, quarter tone or half sharp, the usual for the sharp, and for three-quarter sharp. In like manner, the for quarter tone or half flat. For the flat, and, or I might have said for the three-quarter flat. In the Arab ternal division I should use one-third sharp, two-third sharp, one-third flat, two-third flat. In my notation, also, it must be observed, that a sign or never conveys its influence beyond the note to which it is attached, thus would read E half flat, E natural, E half sharp, E natural. And is a delicate expression of the chromatic or of the diatonic. I now give the airs as best I can. One word as to time. Though I have timed the airs I have given, I am free to confess there was neither meter nor rhythm of any marked character discernible in them. And even in the divisions of the lines or verses, the singer seemed to stop indifferently now at one, now at another word. I have, however, followed in my divisions those given in the book, taking it for granted that the learned author, who has given himself so much pains about the matter, will have chosen the most authentic. James A. Davies Formerly of Trin Call Cam Late Private C to H. R. H. Prince Leopold. Count of Syracuse, Naples. 17, Great Ormond Street, Queen Square. September, 1854.